Hello? What's up? What's up? Hey, Carl, what's up? Welcome to Bombhole Group Chat, presented by Run Through Wall Smelling Salts and, of course, GoPro. Now, this show is a hub of discussion for current snowboarding topics. We talk videos, contests, industry stuff, Polaris versus Ski Do. Most of the topics are submitted by you guys, our Patreon members, and also via Instagram. Thanks to our sponsors Woodward, Blackstrap, Nitro, Autumn, GoPro, Icon, Pub Beer. Master Plans Communication, Bubs, and of course, ski Do. Now, on today's show, we're going to be taking calls from Eric Blem, the author of the new Craig Kelly book, The Darkest White. Also, a call from Mike Cox over at Burton. And we're going to break down the Natty Select duels. We're going to talk about the Curtis Cizik Polaris situation and much, much more. Uh, today in studio, we got Austin Smith, Alex Pashley, Stan Levier, and Melissa Rotano. What's happening, guys? How we doing? Who wants to feel this one? Stan? Good to be here, Chris. You know, <laughs> really lovely, really excited to get into a hearty snowmobile debate today <laughs> ad nausea, you know, <laughs> by the end of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm hoping to walk away with a snowmobile sponsor, actually. Okay, perfect. Yeah. I love that. Uh, big news, breaking news. Uh, Silk D, our producer, got engaged last night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Silk, how you feeling? Talk to us. Um, on top of the world, feeling pretty good. Yeah, yeah, it's a high. It's Can a you? high. We're riding this baby. Did she say yes? Walk Can you give us, us a play by play. Yeah, she said yes. Yep. So we're good. Um, yeah. Where'd I'll, you do it? I don't even know the details. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll tell you the story. Um, very touching story. We went ring shopping together, so there were no surprises. She knew it was coming. Picked up the rings yesterday, and I just moved into her place. I have a cat. She has a cat. The cats don't get along. They're just screaming at each other. And last night, after I got back with the rings, the cats were friendly. They were sitting on my lap, one on her lap, just vibing. And then they jumped off. We got we had them there for maybe 30 seconds, but it was enough to know that it was a sign. Mm. <laughs> a kumbaya moment. Wow. And, there, and, then, and then we did it. Where, where at? The couch. <laughs> and and just, on the couch. just on the couch. What you did? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Excuse me? You did it on the couch? <laughs> did, did it on the bed first and then You consummated? On the couch. Ah, wow. Nice. Mm. Immediate Congrats. consummation. That's yeah, cool. Yeah, that's great. I love that. Big and news. then? <laughs> Congrats, Silk D. Uh, and then um, you guys have been spending some time in Logan, right? From Logan and up to Jackson. But yeah, I've been out here in Utah for a few weeks now. It's yeah. lovely. Heavy little session, Logan. We were really trying to go uh, get our little massive mansion on in uh, Garden City. We let uh, Blake Paul book the lodging, and it, we ended up in some uh, shit condo. Mm, classic mm. B-Prod. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Actually, I almost got a gun pulled on me at the condo. Really? Which was quite Do you want to elaborate on that? Sure. Um, at, there was, like, the recent gun pulling up at Brighton, and I was, like, reading the news about that, so I just had kind of guns in the, on the mind, and, like, go to check into the condo, the Airbnb. Blake sent me the link the address and pull up to the house. I have my noise canceling headphones on because I was just driving my truck and uh, obviously you have to wear noise canceling headphones while you drive that thing and go to the door, type in the code, try to open it. It's not opening. Type in the code again. It's not opening. And I'm like, maybe I'll take my headphones off so I can like hear the beeps and take my headphones off and I just hear like screaming behind the door. Who the fuck is at the door? And I was like, I'm just checking into an Airbnb. I don't know. He's like, this is not your fucking Airbnb. I'm like, okay, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I'm sorry. And then he, like, opens his door. He's in his underwear. And he's like, what's the address you're looking for? I'm like, 253. He's like, this is 235. He's like, I was just about to get my gun. I was like, that's how people die. Oh, my God, that's, dude. And I was like, Blake, I hate you. <laughs> you almost just killed me. So wow. Almost got peppered. Mm. Glad, you're, glad you're still with us. Glad you're here to do the show. Um, and Melissa, you were just in Logan as well, right? I was, yeah. A lot of, a lot of action happening over there. Yeah, it's been fun. Um, saw you guys out there <laughs> at a moment right mm-hmm. when I saw you. It, the biggest jump of my life so far. I didn't do anything successful or cool, so whatever. Untrue, but continue. But I was really just proud of myself, and I was, like, having a moment. I hadn't seen these guys yet. I'm, like, having shedding a few tears, and then I'm, like, oh, these – Two snow wheelers are rolling up. I'm like, okay, bring it together. Get it together. And then I'm like, oh, hi. <laughs> like, how are you guys? And I'm like trying to not cry still. But, 
you know, I cried. It was great to share that moment. It was a great time. Yeah, getting over the first go heebie-jeebies is, uh, is a real thing. So yeah. congrats on hitting that big-ass kicker. Thank you. Yeah, me and Austin rolled up right as she had just landed on a big-ass jump, so it was cool. Uh, you got to put that in there. Like, uh, I've heard it here on the show a couple times. You've been calling that jump one thing, but I think we got to put it to rest of what that jump is called. Um, it's been called perfect jump by some people. The Austin 900 jump. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was getting to. Yeah. No, it's a Jason Murphy jump. Oh, is that where he did the back three dumper? I don't remember, but it's just like I feel like it's uh, a little disrespectful to mm. lose the heritage of the Jason Murphy jump. Jason would, Murphy jump. It's also the Curtis Cizik, um grenaded on his snowmobile jump. On a ski do. Yeah, on a ski do. Mm. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's a typical scenario. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, well, the Jason I think Murphy jump. <laughs> uh, Let's that, get that back into rotation rather Jason. than the perfect I'll, I'll jump. I'll get that back in there. Because the perfect jump's in Canada. Hompus mm. also uh, captained it, I believe. Fun fact. All right, also big news. Uh, let's just open with this, Stan. Uh, Last Resort is back. Yeah. Last Resort is back. Uh, I think uh, we needed it. You know, I was really missing making them. And... Uh, I definitely don't talk about everything that happened in the last year. That would be impossible. I really focused on some of the important, really big stuff, mostly Sean White blender flip, Mm. big topic. Um, I really just cover more recent events. Um, I hope that the people like it, but this one podcast that I listen to, they say this one thing over and over again, which is like, I don't know the key to being happy, but the key to, I don't know what it is. You can't please everybody is. What is the quote? So uh, I think I have it back here. It says, I don't know the key to success, but the key to failure is trying to please everybody. Yes. Is that what you're looking for? That's what I was. Thank you. It's this podcast, right? Okay. Um, yep. So, yeah, I'm excited. I'm, we're looking at like an eight, nine minute recap. We got a spicy little intro. Um, I did film some street uh, snowboarding here in Salt Lake uh, just to try and up my cred a little bit. So. Oh, you got it in the streets. You got yeah. clipped up. Oh yeah, and wow. that's how we're that's how we're starting this thing. Oh, is the kid looking for a contract right now? The kid looking for a three year docu sign coming yeah. through. I'm looking for like, you know, right now it's slash Katie Kennedy is kind of balancing this like, is she a pro? Is she a media person? And I'm just trying to catch up to her. Maybe media get double a, threat. Yeah, get a couple contracts going. Mm-hmm. You ever thought about exploring? Just asking. Yeah, I never stop exploring, Ashley. <laughs> um, I could live by that. You know what our motto is over here at the bomb is never start exploring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm more into that that thing, you know. When was the last when was the last uh last call? When was the last last call in Loon? Oh, um, <laughs> <not> last call. <laughs> last resort. Last last resort. last resort was about a year ago. Okay, that's why I can't remember. <laughs> yeah. It's a long time ago. Yeah. It was a year ago. In snowboard years, like okay, that was okay. I'm 1260s were still probably That's like true. Yep. the biggest trick you could do. Yeah. So I've never even heard of this blender flip. That was actually, I think they <laughs> just switched from like hard <laughs> boot out. bindings. To, this is when the high back was invented. Yeah, about right, around that time. right after that. So like that book, the Craig Kelly book, and like my last episode take place at about the same time. Yes, yeah. that's true. That makes sense. And also, Pashley, uh, for the listeners that aren't familiar, works for North Face, um, which their motto is never stop exploring. That was where that reference came from. So he's a uh, he's filling the marketing guru void in the show. Would that you be say a bit of a stretch? But um, yeah, okay. Yeah. You hear how stressful it is to be on the show with your boss sitting next to you. It you is. know, <laughs> yeah. he's, just, he's got his notepad out, just uh, critiquing how many times I mentioned just the brand. A, yeah, he's got a bunch of little gold stars North in face. each thing. I'm just like mm, North mm. Face. He's got, yeah, I'm looking at the logo count. Actually, Pashley's got more logos than you do, Austin. Oh, no. so. He's got some hidden over here. No, he does. Okay, we're Good. working on Team nice Mini Bike over here. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, let's let's just get right to it. Um, huge news. Um, by the time this comes out, it might have art. The story might already be dead. But right as we're recording this, the Friday before the Wednesday that this airs, uh, Curtis is on day one of switching from ski do to Polaris. And for us ski do guys, uh, absolutely heartbreaking. You know, I haven't felt this way since Tom Brady left the Patriots. To be honest with you, I haven't felt anything similar. Um, still processing, I'd say. Um, you know, we lost a lot of good men out there, and and Curtis, as far as snowboarders on a snowmobile, is kind of, it's kind of like getting a Tom Brady. You know what I mean? So it's, I think it's a tough pill to swallow. Uh, Austin, do you have anything you want to weigh in on this? 
I mean, it's what the internet lives for. Today's a good day for the internet. We mm-hmm. were uh, dying watching memes last night. I mean, it was a great day. I mean, first, Silk gets engaged. Then, Curtis does the switch. I mean, is there anything I don't know better? I you need to throw me in with that one. <laughs> <laughs> Those could be separate. I feel like tears are, at, yeah, it's like, uh, who did Tom Brady go play for? I feel like, what, was, what was the biggest, like, rivalry that Tom Brady could have? Yeah, like if you went to the, the Giants, Giants or something, maybe, yeah. probably, mm. yeah. Basically, same, same. Yeah, that's a, it's even worse. You're right, it actually might be worse. Yeah, you're feeling pretty close to him. I mean, you got the ski rail right next to you that we uh, delivered to you last time we were here, so. All right, huge announcement coming at you guys from the bomb hole. Now, Bombhole Cup registration is now officially live on our website. It's April 6th and 7th at Brighton Resort. It's always a good time. And be sure to sign up before it fills up because it fills up really fast. So get your spot locked in. I'll break down the event for you. So day one is a bank slalom. Day two is a park showdown. Now, the bank slalom is really fun because we got all different types of classes. We do vintage boards with boards pre-year 2000. If you want to come race that old board off the wall, we do a split board race. If you want to split board up, switch over and then race down. That one's always fun to watch for the spectators. We do a beginner class. So if you're just learning how to ride and you can barely make it down the hill, come sign up for beginner class. It's a new one for this year. We're also doing a legends class, which is pros over 40 years old or ex-pros. We have an industry class if you work in the industry. And then, of course, all different age groups from Grom all the way up to 50 plus. So it's a community building event. We like the whole community to come out, have fun in the lift line meet your homies, meet some heroes, and have a good time. Now, day two, we're doing a park showdown. Always a good time. We're doing a Grom class, an open class, a Legends class, which is the pros over 40, and then, of course, the pro class. Now, let me break down the pro class for you. We started off with mandatory 900s. So the first five minutes of the pro final is mandatory 900s. You can't do a 900, just don't drop in. And right before we do the mandatory 900s, this year... It's a real sporting event. It's like the Super Bowl. We're doing a national anthem. So if you've got somebody with some pipes that can absolutely nail a national anthem, send them our way. We're still looking for our singer. We're also looking into military flyovers. We actually had some paperwork submitted for military flyover after the national anthem. If that happens, that would be amazing. Kind of said it as a joke, but it might come to fruition. So be sure to come check out uh, Bombhole Cup April 6th and 7th. We're also doing live music this year with some of your favorite pro snowboarders performing with their bands. We're going to have DJ Matty Moe. We're going to have Todd Richards on the mic and Joey B. How you doing? Those two are a combo, a match made in heaven. So it'll be some great entertainment on the microphone. So again, be sure to sign up April 6th and 7th at bombhole.com. Registration will fill up quick, so reserve your spot, and we'll see you guys there. All right, we're going to get into the Bombhole product of the week. So this week, we got the Smith Imprint 3D goggle. I thought this was really cool because you upload a photo of your face on their website, and they 3D print goggles to match your face profile. Never seen that before. I thought we'd highlight it this week as the Bombhole product of the week. Now let's get back to the show. Um, okay, right back in. Curtis Cizek on Polaris. No one saw it coming. Mm-hmm. End of an era. Yeah. Some what of do you us think, saw it coming. What happened? Like, what, what, why? Why the switch? Why now? I mean, why not? What's the background here? Help me, help me understand. Help the listeners understand. I mean, do you want the real story or a fabricated one? <laughs> <laughs> I, want the, I want the real story. I mean, I think he could, he could be a <laughs> victim. Want the real story. <laughs> he, he, he could be a victim of, you know, he's been getting bullied a lot. Uh, for those, let's just fill people in. He had a Skidoo Turbo for sale that caught on fire. Uh, and then he was trying to sell it on Facebook Marketplace, which Austin and Pashley, to my right here, were trolling him with fake accounts. Do you think it's a it's a skidoo? My mom, my mom is a big fan of the show. She yep. like listened to that episode. She's like, Curtis is never gonna forgive you. I can't be- <laughs> I can't be- I didn't know you were so mean. I can't believe you would do that to him. <laughs> my wife got pretty bummed on me too, actually. She's like, What are you guys doing? <laughs> this is not funny. He is actually trying to sell this. 
Is it common to sell a sled after it's caught on fire? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is that normal? Did he disclose this information? I don't really disclose it. It's kind of like when he sold his truck after he parked it in the ocean for a while. You don't really, <laughs> some things you don't really tell people. Okay. The problem is they should have just let it burn down because he had insurance on it, but it was with his sister and they just were panicked and they're like, get it out, get it out. So they got it out and he's like, why did you put it out? <laughs> he's like, you should have just let it go. Yeah. So, so if you're watching this and you bought a sled from Curtis Caesar, don't buy anything. From and him. It's not working. Suspect. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna want to maybe just bring that thing to an auction so you don't know who it's going to, kind of thing. Yeah. So he has actually on his sled deck. I think he has the the old turbo next to the Polaris. Before we call Curtis, though, we should maybe uh, talk about some of the the best memes that we've seen come through. Um, his brother. Come on, ready? Virginity is cool. Come on, come on. Virginity is cool. What up? What up? Virginity is cool. He's got it. He's got it. Virginity is cool. Come on, come on. Virginity is cool. What up? What up? Virginity is cool. Yeah, Martin has been putting up some gems. Virginity rocks. Check out Martin, um, which he's never been a meme guy before. This is like this is bringing out a whole new persona in him, which is incredible. Justin Eels, I think, has actually been... He's shed a few tears. He's uh, He's mm-hmm. been taking it pretty personally. Um, yeah, the snowboard industry is rocked right now. Yep. I was pretty proud of, I posted one of a little girl um, basically like throwing up, like dr- almost throwing up while eating her food. <laughs> and I was, I likened it to his first experience riding a Polaris. Um, so I was, that was some of my better work. And also uh, on the show, he said, dream sponsor, ski do. And then I cut to the photo of him wearing a Polaris hat with <laughs> REM. Everybody hurts sometimes. So let's uh, let's give him a quick ring. Let's see if he picks up. He says he's got one bar of service. All right, here we go. Good, good, good. Phone might die, by the way. Okay, perfect. We got you. You're on group chat right now, Kurt. Uh, we were just talking about the recent switch to Polaris. Uh, how many times you buried that thing so far today? Um, how's that train wreck going? Derailed? You putting on a clinic? Fill us in here. Um, Skidoo's are at probably six stuff. Polaris zero so far. That is what we like to hear, Kurt. And Kurt, if you uh, need, you can plug your phone into the Polaris. There's a charger there. Just saying. I was watching movies on it on the way out. The screen's huge on this thing. It's crazy how much fucking power this thing has. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, you know what I love? How you you buy there's a you know these ex- machines are very expensive. They still haven't figured out the the scratchers on those things too. Huh? You throw them in reverse once, the scratchers are focused. Oh, those things are as good as gone. <laughs> they're, they're they're not gone yet, but I haven't put them down yet. But it's like straight handlebar deep here today in Idaho, and it is a, a great break in day on the new machine. She's just been held to the bar for like the last twenty minutes. Mm. Now, I'll tell you what, Kurt, a lot of disappointed fans out there, uh, industry is having a tough time processing this information. Anything you want to say to your fans that you feel like you turned your back on? Uh, you know, keep an open mind. The other side's pretty bright. Really? Maybe other... you'd like to apologize to anyone? I don't know. Anyone in particular you'd like to uh, say I'm sorry to? No, 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 one, no one's coming to mind. The apologies. I'll get on that. <laughs> well, one thing I'd like to share with you, um, I think this is kind of important uh, information here. So, um, you know, on, on the show, you mentioned dream sponsor Skidoo. Um, I got a text from Luke D over at Skidoo, works in the marketing department, and he said, uh, so much for a dream sponsor. Him and Pashley can ride off together into the sunset <laughs> and get stuck. So I uh, just wanted to let you know, uh, any... Okay, okay. Yeah, any dreams of Skidoo, um, you know, type of relationship, they're shattered. So... I think I'm a player spoose guy. Yeah, you can only slum it for so long, Chris. Wow. <laughs> how's, uh, how's your back doing from that pole start? <laughs> easy, uh, easy. Oh yeah, they don't got the shot that's start. That's one of my favorite features, but <laughs> it's been uh, very surprised with the machine, to say the least. So, uh, so let's just t- talk us through the pull start. How are we feeling <laughs> on a zero to ten scale when you had the just the push start electric start? Now you got to just yoink that thing. Um, uh, this morning, brand new machine, when I had to pull it four times, I wasn't super excited about that. <laughs> But once she's warmed up, the thing is unstoppable. (laughs) 
It's like a train, you know, it takes a while to get going. Once it gets going, it gets going pretty good. It's probably a lot like your uh, Yamaha you had back in the day. Pretty, pretty similar feel. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's not bring that into this. <laughs> Which always felt a little targeted. Not, not, you always blame me on the Yamaha. Who are you going to blame for the Polaris? The, the Polaris was, uh, was Pash. He sent over the discount code. I went and got it. Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> But, oh, so uh, uh, we'll be it. editing that part out. out. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be real. Nobody in their right mind would ever pay full retail for a Polaris. That is a fact. Oh I'm not going to lie. It's pretty sick. Kurt, your service is kind of cutting out. It's getting a little shoddy. <laughs> Cuts out of the bag. I'm out in the sticks. We're, we're building a feature right now. Okay, thanks for the check-in, guys. I'll send you some PD photos later. <laughs> Uh, hey, one last thing. Now. Who are you with? Okay, is, okay. Does any of, your, any of your boys want to try? I'd like to get a perspective of somebody else you're with. Is Are you with Ben Ferguson? Uh, Who are you with? Uh, I am, but they're, but they're kind of far away now. They're, they just dropped. Are you stuck at the bottom they, of the hill? Be honest. No, I'm not. No, we're all at the top. We're, we're riding into our features right now. Okay. All right, Kurt. Well, um, I'm glad that we, we got to the bottom of this. Um, still processing. Um, Dude, the internet takeover. I did not see that coming. That was crazy. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> kind of more hype about this snowmobile thing than when you got a pro model. I don't, exactly. I don't know it's if you want to address that with anyone, but uh, Pla- Polaris and I are talking about a signature model now. Something's <laughs> <laughs> in the works. I'd say your, your brother's meme of the virginity rocks. <laughs> Have you seen that one? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, can you can you rate some of your favorite memes that you've been roasted on so far? I'd like oh, you to just kind of um, go through those. You're, you've been up there. Uh, I've been a little past least because he comes in on the defense, which is kind of nice. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, the Field of Dreams one, I think, was my favorite so far. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. If you build it, they will come. If you ride it, they will come. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Adam Weitzel's was quite nice. Oh, yeah, Weitzel's got a couple good yeah. ones. Yeah. Yeah, good stuff. All right. All right. Well, thanks for the check-in, guys. All right. Uh, Godspeed. Uh, hope your back heals up. Maybe uh, try some ice baths, um, icy hot, and some ibuprofen, and you should be able to ride that thing continuously. I'll let you know if we tow it out today. Okay. <laughs> All right. Later, Kirk. Good talk. Bye. Oh, what a gem. What a gem that guy is. So how many more discount codes? <laughs> Can I get one? Fucking Kurt. What are we talking about? <laughs> What's the percentage? Great is that, stuff. Is this a BOGO? or <laughs> You got a Groupon at Polaris right now? What's happening? There's a reason there's two on the deck outside. Of it. <laughs> All right, we got a big topic that hit the internet. Uh, Lauren Richardson uh, was on a snowboard trip riding around Brighton backcountry, and he came out of his zone and had a shotgun pulled on him. Yeah. Um, you guys have some takes on this? I mean, I, I'd like to start by saying how on trend his pants were. Oh, yeah, he's 2023, <laughs> yeah. 2024 locked in. That kid, that guy's watching Dust Box. You know what I'm saying? He's got the baggy <laughs> fit. He's got the flannel on. Um, he's got his lawn chair posted up, just chilling, waiting. just shotgun in hand, waiting for anyone. <laughs> if they do ever make a live-action Elmer Fudd movie... He would be a good yeah. <laughs> character. What was his quote? Uh, what are what are you an icon user? <laughs> Get out of here, you fuck! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't That's fucking care. Anger. That's what he kept saying. Like, <laughs> what? Ask him a question and then immediately not let him answer. I don't fucking care. <laughs> 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 That's so sick. Maybe we should get the shotgun, the, the puller on the next episode of The Ball. Well, it could, oh it could be a good interview. It's just kind of crazy. Though. I feel like it's like uh, if you live on a golf course, you expect that, like, I don't know, someone's going to hit a golf ball and someone's going to come find it in your front yard or whatever. If you live on a ski resort, someone might be cruising down the street that you live imagine. on on a snowboard. But uh, he did not feel that way. Yeah, absolutely. I got to give a shout out to Lauren Richardson, the, the guy who filmed it. He's like, I just got my ender. <laughs> and he's like in really good spirits about how he almost got blown to smithereens. Yeah, that guy's a legend. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it seems like you said, it, the guy was literally just sitting there waiting for people to come through his property, just like, oh, these fuckers, right? Yeah. But also, maybe I know you guys have had some troublesome lift lines at Brighton. So maybe it's a little PR stunt to kind of keep people away, kind of a. Uh... Kill yeah. the crowds? Conspiracy theory? What? Oh, wow. Yeah. Could be a conspiracy, yeah. Pash? <laughs> I do love how quickly you will jump to a conspiracy theory. <laughs> I, I, must, I must say. <laughs> I do enjoy 
how quickly you're like, this is set up. Um, it's got to be set up. Who's he like, working for? Who's yeah. he working for? Yeah. It's like an out cold story. He's like, this is my amount. I'm going to save it. And it's just in a really weird way. I want to see his kit when he's on hill, when he's oh shredding. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it looked like he might have ski boots on. Because yeah, there's the skis leaned up in the background. Oh, like he, maybe okay, he okay. had done a run in those pants. Ah. Maybe he's a bi- maybe he's a biathlon uh, athlete, you know, sure. and he had the gun on him already. That's a good point. He could have been training for a biathlon, something <laughs> we didn't consider. You know, I want, I wonder if he's got a video part coming out with those pants. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because he looks like he could be with like the kid again in T Hall. Like he fit right in. Yeah, most people are concerned about getting the shot. That guy's concerned about getting the shotgun. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> saw that one line it up nicely. <laughs> I, was, I was building. Saw the wheels turning. Yeah. He's like, here it comes. The comedian over here is working on some stand-up, just yeah. kind of Austin's testing putting some... on his noise-canceling headphones. <laughs> 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 Shut the fuck up, Stan. <laughs> yeah, quality entertainment. Glad everybody's okay. Bit of a bummer for Brighton. Yeah, it doesn't help the icon... <laughs> It's great. I know that I, the icon, like epic, big past drama is like really a thing, you know, I think, um, I mean, I, I guess that guy was on a trip though. <laughs> That's what he yeah. said. He was like, this is the last clip of my trip. It's like, he was for sure. An icon. <laughs> 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 Shit. <laughs> but you know, you I answer the question. Yeah, you, you kind of want to know if he was an icon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, like what my take is on all this stuff and fucking I'm ready to take, I'll put the, grab me an army helmet, uh, throw some grenades at me in the comments. Let's go. But it, like complaining about people on the mountain it's like when people complain when they're in traffic and they're like, oh, there's traffic. And you're like, well, you're you're part of the traffic. Yeah. You're part of the problem. You you're yeah. there. Like it's like we're all going to the mountains. And yeah, it, it, they are crowded. It's unfortunate. And there's and we want to point the finger at someone because they were. It's not like it used to be, man. But like if we're you're this, there, yeah. you're part of the problem. Yeah. My only argument for the epic uh, epic icon super passes though is just like is it benefiting the resorts or is it just epic icon benefiting like I don't know what the breakdown is of how much money Brighton gets when someone goes there right. with an icon pass and yada 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 because obviously it is like taking away from the experience for a lot of people that are at the resorts when there's like crazy lift lines and it's a bummer if they're like giving up that quality of experience for. They're just getting ten bucks. They're getting fifty bucks of that two hundred dollar pa- uh, daily lift ticket or whatever it is. So, I'd be interested for the the biz side of it. I mean, it has to be beneficial. That's the only reason they're doing it. You got to imagine. But is it beneficial enough for what they're like giving yeah, up, yeah, yeah. or would they be better off of like taking full daily lift ticket prices and you know? I mean, I there. I'm not a businessman. The uh, yeah. devil's advocate point being, it definitely. I think my gut reaction is that it must help participation in winter sports like the fact that you have the ability to go to i i would think i I wonder like do you think people go skiing and snowboarding more because they have more options or would they go the same amount of days at their home they certainly travel travel more more. yeah Yeah. for sure that's for sure a fact i know that but it's an interesting one too because you're always like oh how do we get participation up how do we get participation up? but you're like can we actually like have more participation like the resorts are packed it's kind of a weird one that's, you know, and that's when you want to go skidoo sometimes, you know, and take the old <laughs> rooster out to pasture and let it eat. You or know. you go to the, you know, the non-icon, the mon pa resorts. Right. Like, I'm sure there's so many resorts that are just so confused. They, like, look at the, whatever, the Whistler Instagram or the Vail, and it's, like, these psycho lines and lift tickets are $300. And then they're, like, you know, there's Willamette Pass that's in Oregon. There's so many small yeah, little, ones. little resorts, and the lift tickets are 40 bucks, and no one's there. Yeah, a little troll hogging on them, just... Yeah, I've seen troll hogging. That thing looks pretty. That is the most hectic looking rope toe situation no, Highland, ever. No Highlands. Highlands even more like after school. The Highland is the most hectic. Those rope toes are running at like buck twenty. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> they're fast. Mm-hmm. Get those reps up. It's one of my last bucket list things in snowboarding is to go to troll hogging. Oh yeah, never been. Never been. You gotta go when it, they have like the. 2 a.m. What are, what are those called when they have like the really late nights? Yeah, like some Fridays go till 3 a.m. or something. And, and you can <laughs> it's see some. Sick. I mean, Wisconsin knows how to drink. <laughs> and so I actually saw somewhere that like of the top 
50 counties where like alcoholism is like a problem or whatever, like 48 of them are in Wisconsin. <laughs> like, oh my God. Like, like They're all surrounding troll hogs. Yeah, <laughs> the drunkest state that there is. You know, it's great. Uh, you know, everybody talks about like Craig Kelly, be the ball, you know, like, you know, if you're to like when you're riding the rope toes, there's, there's just like af- at the end of the day, there's just these monumental ruts oh, yeah. that, and it, it's not like you have an option for a line to take onto the rail. You have to have the Craig Kelly approach when you're jibbing. Like you just got to be the ball in the rut. It's more like bowling with the gutters up. <laughs> You're more of the bowling ball with yeah, the gutters yeah. just kind of pinballing your way. It's still a be the ball situation. Okay. Yeah. It's still be the, You're still yeah. being the ball, however you split it. All right, before we get into trivia, do you guys want to hit some smelling salts? Kind of kick the show off? I would love nothing more than that. I could okay. use a brain blast right about yeah. now. Let's get it going. Is there, any, like, the jug. Is there any like general uh, category of the trivia? Is this just... It's, cool. uh, it's snowboarding trivia, so it's basically general snowboarding questions. Any, any like, uh, eras or kind of start to finish? No, just kind of a general genre of snowboarding. Uh, no no real, I just kind of... Anything for my age group? Um, I, Pashley, I'm thinking you're going to go 0 for, 0 for 12, <laughs> I'm pretty sure, knowing your snowboard knowledge. <laughs> um, so... I mean, this is Stan's job to know yeah. That's why one of I'm answers. fucking yeah, stressed better, about this shit. Better perform, Stan. We're setting the bar low. <laughs> Stan's got a lot to lose on this one. I know. Here we go. All right. Okay. Here we go. All right. Let's hit trivia again uh, for the listeners. We have buzzers. So the way the way we're gonna do this, uh, silk. <laughs> Austin just went big on a smelling salt. Oh. He loves it. Silk, you gotta go. Uh, you you're gonna be the mediator here. You gotta be able to call who who buzzes in first here. Yeah, I got my eyes on the field. I'm, I'll be calling fair calls. So you gotta. Oh my God. We, It's gotta be a clean buzz, and then you select, and then we go to second after that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So this is kind of like. Should gym. there be a punishment if you buzz and you're wrong? That's a good. Yeah. Is that a salt? Smelling salt. Yeah, I like that. Okay. That's a good oh, idea. Jesus, oh. really? I'm not buzzing. We Hell just came yeah. up with that. <laughs> okay. First question. Everybody ready? Should our hands be anywhere particular? What's I mean, close uh, to the buzzer. What snowboarder did a backside rodeo 720 over Chad's gap? Pashley Rice. Full name? Travis Rice. That's correct. Nice oh, work. What were you saying? One About for the old head? Yeah. Yep. All right. This guy's actually pretty sharp. I thought he was a little bit more senile and uh, <laughs> kind of uh, gray. Don't but gray uh, I guess he's you. still I'm going. Almost okay. Went for sheer. That would have been a major power. <laughs> <laughs> oh Question number two Chloe Kim is tied with oh. what female half pipe rider from Oast X Games medals? Kelly Clark. That's correct. Fuck. What? How do we feel does. about the buzz before the question's done? Pre, Is that? Pre-buzz. Are we just gonna? I'm down with I, it. I think. I think it's good. I think, I think it's good I, in my book. That I'm, plays. I yeah, think. Yeah, that that I think plays. Let yeah. it run. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like it. So, all right. This is a. Okay. Who won Men's Rookie of the Year in 2007? Pashley. Austin. That's correct. Full name. Smith. Austin Smith. A patch was doing pretty wow. good. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, Austin Never stop. Never Austin stop, guys. Stan, not doing very well right now. <laughs> okay. Uh, who, Salt on my mic. Who won? <laughs> I breathe. Actually, no. What female snowboarder is co-founder of Omatic Snowboard? Melissa. Terry Dakitas. That's correct. Oh, I was like, oh. it's, like it's there. <laughs> okay. Melissa... This I, is thought, a, I thought Silky was coming in saying that Melissa was. I was like, Omatic is no. back? <laughs> <laughs> Melissa's kickstarting Omatic? Uh, here we go. <laughs> okay. Richards is rolling over in his grave. Right yeah. What snowboarder has last part in the, in the video lame? Ashley. Benedict. No. Fuck. Melissa. It's a montage. Isn't it? It's a montage. Oh, so you guys both got to do smelling salts first. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then Stan is next. Uh, I'm going to go with Travis Parker. That's correct. Oh, Ooh. Uh, Melissa. Okay. Uh, that's for Pashley. I'm still doing one off this mic every time I breathe. I'm yeah. sweating that's trying that's to do this. That's working nice smarter, not that's harder. On brand. Ah. That's on brand. <coughs> <coughs> okay. <coughs> So who's so Stan on the board now? Stan's on the board. Okay. So Stan again, Austin not doing great. Uh, <laughs> could be a Cinderella story here. What snowboarder has been quoted saying, "I shit my pant. I did. I shit my pant." Who is uh, LNP? That's correct. <laughs> All right. Is, where is, is it? Jeopardy. Yeah, I like it. I'm bringing a Jeopardy flair to this thing now. <laughs> All right. Stan's coming from behind on this one. 
Thank you, Alex. That's okay. what she said. What snowboarder? <laughs> that can get edited. <laughs> <laughs> what snowboarder is credited for inventing the wet cat? Pashley? Todd Richards. That's correct. Uh, that's me, Austin, not you. <laughs> Just, I was going with you. All right. Well, Pashley's in the lead here. <laughs> okay. Who won 2016 Men's Rider of the Year? Wow. Holy knife belt. That's incorrect. Fuck. Let me get the oh. buzzer sound going, actually. <laughs> that's not right. Yeah, that's um, 2017. Smelling salt again. 2016. Seven, no, it was 2007. Ten Whatever. years off, but nice. <laughs> yeah. 2016. Whatever. Rider of the Year. Anybody? Bueller. I'll, I'll hit a guess. Bueller. Yep. yep. No, it has to, uh, yeah, I think you got to hit the button. Hit the buzzer. Is it Haldor Helgeson? What? That's incorrect. Uh, and do a salt. Uh, nobody else. I'm going to say he's tall. Um, oh, I got it. Bodie Miller? That's a skier. You're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Bodie Merrill. <laughs> Bodie Merrill. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> we going full point or half point? I mean, it's like a half point. <laughs> you know, let's I'll give give, give a sympathy I'll point because he's I'll give him full. We'll Austin's get him on the board. Not doing I was doubling him yesterday. You know. Mm. Yep. Who is Michaela Schifrin? <laughs> 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 Who is Lindsey Vaughn? I mean Bodie Miller. I mean Bodie Merrill. Okay. Uh, Next question. Austin, I think you got a chance at this one. Doubtful. Who was the first? Email. <laughs> Go ahead. You gotta finish the question. No, no. that's not how it works. No. That's not how no, it works. No. That means you know. I just break one off. Let's see. <laughs> mm, Zoe. Incorrect. Salt. <gasps> okay, uh, but you're still in contention. You hit the buzzer again. Who is the first female snowboarder to win X Games gold four times in a row in slope style? Melissa. Melissa. Was it Barrett? Uh, uh, I think I think I'm going Pashley on yeah. this one. Jana Mayan. That's correct. I know Austin knew that one. I know he did too. <laughs> I wanted Austin to get that one. Let's just keep some salts out just for the gang. Just yeah. Because for the wrong answer. Let's keep these things on deck. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh. All right. So what's Pash got? He's doing pretty well right Pash, now. Pash is at four right now. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, wow. That's bullshit. All right. What filmmaker made the video December? Stan. Jake Price. That's correct. We and Silk don't have a line of sight over here. We got a block. Yeah, who up. was? I mean, I, video review? No. I mean, I video can't review. watch it now, it's but fine. It's fine. I'll watch it and. Yeah, can we get an instant I'll put replay? Some, I'll put some text on the screen if I fucked up. Okay. Like that NASCAR photo finish the other day. All right. <laughs> here we go. What filmer editor is responsible for making the DC Mountain Lab videos? Austin. Oh. Here, Wickberg. That's correct. Mm. All right, come from behind win potentially here. Um, what is the name of Sage Kotzenberg's board brand that never hit the market? Stan. Anthem. That's correct. Oh, I would have gotten that wrong. <laughs> we have a tie. Bonus. Stan and Pash. What, mm. what trick that Sage named is on the cover of a Wheaties box? Holy Crail. That's correct. Oh, Text nice. I would have gotten that wrong, too. <laughs> Noted that you did finish the sentence on that one. Just <laughs> in mine, you didn't finish the sentence. Yeah. Someone's playing favorites. Favorites. Hmm. How much are you paying them, Stan? <laughs> All right, next the question. Dutch, the left-hand side, Steve? Focus up. Focus up, gang. What snowboarder was quoted saying, Yahamaha snowmobile in 91 words for snow? Uh, Humpus. <laughs> Debating. Benedict? Incorrect. <laughs> Jakob. God, you guys are bad. Fuck <laughs> me. Uh, I don't think. <laughs> Christopher Weber? <laughs> so the answer to the Yahamaha snowmobile is Marco, is Grillo. Uh, uh, famous Grillo fuck, quote, rest yeah. in peace, absolute legend. Uh, we're going to keep it moving here. Uh, who did a solo session? Uh, backside 1080 on the jump we refer to as Earl Grey in Logan, Utah. Austin. Um, Bodie Miller, once again, the skier. <laughs> That's incorrect. Bodie, I think, switched back five did, I believe. Solo session. He's from Bend, Oregon. Gabe. Gabe Ferguson. Ferguson. Put one down for Austin. Do a sm- you got to do a salt, though, for your wrong answer. There's got to be a penalty here. Can't just be throwing out names. Okay. He hit it first. Uh, Bodie was. Next, yeah, Bodie, I think Guinea did, I'm pretty sure. He pioneered the jump. 
Uh, all right. In the in the company DC, the acronym DC stands for what? Melissa. Drawers company. No. Drawers clothing. That's correct. Oh. Close. I I got. He's trying to steal the Jake Price point back. I mean, <laughs> I I think that it's it's got to be clothing, right? It's got to be clothing. Drawers clothing. Oh, I was just cu- I was saying I went first. That was my. Yeah, yeah. That was, but Austin just fucking screamed out the answer, but. Okay, uh, that's actually the end of my trivia question. It's pretty anticlimactic. Wow. That's it. That's it. Well, Stan, you still won. Oh. Stan won? Stan won. Wow. Virginity Pashley, rocks. Come Pashley on. Pashley in second place. Stan has five points. Pashley in second. Mm. Wow. Um, actually, no, Austin and Pash are tied. Four each. Melissa, third place because there was a tie. So you're still on the podium. Wow. Mm. All right. Cinderella all story. Over this pub beer. That's a Cinderella story, gang. Um... One thing about this, too, we talked about this. I think we're going to do it later in the show, uh, something to look forward to. We're going to do a Bend, Oregon draft. Uh, we each mm. are going to draft, snake draft, our top three people from Bend. Um, Austin is from Bend, so it'll be extremely awkward if he doesn't get picked, which is really fun. It'll be extremely so, awkward as his boss, yeah. Yeah, so that's something <laughs> to look forward to is the Bend, Oregon draft uh, pick that's happening later in the show. All right, let's talk master plan communications. It's a PR agency to take your brand to the next level. They have worked in snowboarding for a long time with brands like Cole, DeKine, 32, and many more. Now my buddy Ashton runs it, and he's been in snowboarding for a long time. He loves it. He breathes it. He even jibs the top of the 32 bus from time to time up at Brighton. And if you're interested in finding a PR agency, go to Master Plan Communications. They offer everything from social media strategy to web design to brand design to PR campaigns. They are all about strategic PR programs with measurable results. If you want to elevate your brand, check out masterplancommunications.com for more info. And let's keep supporting brands run by snowboarders. All right, let's talk headwear. We're going to talk autumn. Autumn's a great company. Let me tell you why. Brad Alban runs it. He is a gem in the snowboarding community. Done a lot of really cool things. And also Lil Jeff, Lil Hefe. Absolute legend in snowboarding. So good people doing a good brand. Uh, at Autumn, their motto is style matters. So they have all different types of styles of beanie. They got the deep resi fit. We call it the surplus fit. They got the shorty fit. Which you, might, you might catch Silk D wearing. More of a fisherman's friend shallow fit and they got the simple fit which is right in between they got all different styles of beanies and they also have riders with impeccable style you might catch danimals cannon cummins running on them everybody knows their style's amazing so if you want to support a great company and you want a great beanie they do our beanies they do the run through a wall beanie and then our other all over print beanie um and they're just I can't speak highly enough about the quality of the stuff they make. So check out autumnheadwear.com and use promo code BOMBHOLE for 20% off your order. Again, autumnheadwear.com, promo code BOMBHOLE. Get yourself a nice piece of headwear. But right now, let's sink our teeth into the natural selection duels here. Uh, Let me find my paperwork of who is in it so we don't miss anybody. Um, I can rattle them off if you want. Yeah, go ahead. Start it off. You got uh, Spencer O'Brien, Mary Rand. Yep. You got Jamie Anderson, Emma Crosby. Yep. Kevin Backstrom, Sebede Buck. Yep. Keep going. Nils. <clears throat> Nils awesome. Mindick and Victor Daviette. Yep. And for the final There's round. two more. And for the final two <laughs> rounds, you got... Uh, Red and Austin. Yeah, yep. Red and Austin. And there's one that happened in Japan. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Torger and Raibu. Raibu. Okay, where do we want to start? Do you want to, Let's start with, uh, I think we should start with Emma and Jamie. I, I really enjoyed that one. I thought the venue was incredible. I thought the, the riding, they were attacking the mountain. Uh, most notably, Jamie um, Open Jacket. I was going to bring yeah, that go up. Ahead, I'm Sam. so glad you brought that up. Yeah. Open Vest Flex, uh, kind of flexing on all of us. With the open vest whole time, flapping in the wind. Extra points for style, for sure. But I do think, you know, there was some, definitely some challenging venues this year for the duels. Obviously, like, a tough part of it. They got to, like, make that happen. We all know it wasn't, like, the best snow year. But uh, that one was spicy, and it was it was good. I thought Emma rode really well. 
Were um, they at the same location as Austin and Red, but just like different areas? They were they close all like enough. Okay. But not, yeah. Um, but I thought Emma, who was like relatively untested and kind of a competitive field, kind of dipping her toes in the backcountry, like rode really well. Um, and then Jamie, I think, is just a competitor and also. After that first year of natural selection where if you lost in the first round, you couldn't come back, I think that that, like, fired a lot of people up. And I think we saw it in these duels as well. I think we saw it in Austin. I think we saw it a couple times. But I think, yeah, Jamie showed up, like, pretty ready to open vest, Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, one thing I wanted to comment, too, is, like, watching Emma ride, uh, the thing I liked is she was attacking the mountain. Like, she wasn't wasn't riding kind of scared. She was putting her whole body into everything and riding aggressive and, like, really... She, uh, the only way I could put it is attacking the hill, so she didn't advance. Obviously, Jamie advanced in that one, but I thought that Emma should be really stoked on how she rode because it was... And it was, like, a great venue to watch. And, and uh, Melissa, you got any takes on that one? Yeah, that was, I think, my favorite duel. Like, Emma is so, so good, and it's just, like, the tip of the iceberg, I think, of watching her ride. Like, there's one... Um, feature she hit in particular that you're just like wow she ended up tomahawking off it but she was like riding on the top and like kind of blasted from one pillow to the next and like tomahawk the landing but that was insane like I can't wait to see her ride more in this and Jamie is just the goat always like just flawless like so much style going through the course like they're both really sure of themselves like watching them ride and like really confident and that was I think my favorite thing about watching both of them Cool. I love that. Uh, moving on, I think we, we could talk. All, we were all rooting for Emma, the underdog. Yeah, you guys got any more takes on that? Sorry to interrupt you. It's just, you know, Jamie is great, but you're always rooting for the underdog. It's like uh, no one wants Tom Brady to win, you know? Same, same. Not true, but uh, <laughs> no one does. That's, yeah, that's actually not factually correct, but um, we can keep moving. I think uh, Sebe the Buck, Kevin Backstrom, this, <laughs> the sporty conditions. The, uh, conditions looked like dog shit. It's yeah. I'm like a free ride world tour out there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rough. Bad. I was waiting for De La Rue to come flying out of his side. <laughs> oh, you guys here today? Um, he's got a bib on. He's that like, was a subtle plug for me, too, by the way. <laughs> also, oh. sidebar, like, uh, I, that one could have gone either way to me. Sebe had a Sebe, Sebe had a tough time. He like he couldn't really get the landing gear down. Kevin's also another. I mean, Sebe's a great rider for that tour as well. Strong rider, put out great footage this year. But um, Kevin Backstrom is another character that plays into that tour really well because he's. Sure. I mean, just like his style of like cranking his spins and like that can go bad. You know, riders can like crank that spin and it just looks disgusting and like I hate it. But Kevin's really good at doing that. And he was just able to, like, put it down. But, yeah, it looked sketchy. It's also interesting, I think, like, when some of them build jumps and some of them don't. Like, my – you know what I wish was more prominent in the duels, actually, if I may, is that I wish there was more context for what they're saying to each other about what – like, how many runs they're going to take, like, how they're building this jump. I want to hear that. I want to hear what they're, like, getting into with each other. Like, how are they deciding to stop, you know? like Or picking the venue, too. Yeah, I'm, like, I'm kind of curious to, like, I, I bet it gets a little drama-y in there where they're kind of like having to decide with each other like okay are we done now like especially if one person like is clearly losing and they don't want to stop i don't know i want to like hard for those two because they're like buddies yeah and they're always filming together with beyond medals and everything too yeah it's like i personally like when you get the big air jr gigi situation going (laughs) where they're not they're not psyched on each other they're like you know it's it's like we're trying to be excited for each other but we're actually not because we really fucking want to win you know i like that vibe you know so what I'm hearing from that, Stan, is your main feedback for the duels is that uh, the episodes are too short. You want them to be longer? <laughs> no, I'm saying that, you know, that if we're going to make them that long, let's get some more drama in there, you know? Yeah. Let's get some more back and forth. Let's, like, hear, you know, I want a little drama. Like, I love that they're out, like, having fun with the community. That's mm-hmm. great. Mm-hmm. That's good. I think more reality TV. I like where we're heading with this, like, like more Formula Bachelor. One. For- like, Formula, you know, the mm-hmm. show? Or, like, what's the golf one? Either way. Um, Full swing. Yeah. I want a little bit of that energy. I'd like to pitch a hypothetical for you. Um, What's the show where they all are put on an island and they're not allowed to hook up? Um, Too Hot to Handle. Too Hot to Handle, (laughs) yes. Whoa. Nice. So, (laughs) got your pretty quick. (laughs) Um, I've seen that. Or whatever it is. (laughs) Basic premise is if they, they like, start with everybody on, like, an island and um, they have this huge pot of money. 
and if any of them like hook up or like jack off or anything, like they lose, they have cameras everywhere. And so um, I think you could take everybody from natural selection, put them in a house, and you're not allowed to drink. Actually, no, no, scratch that. Fill it with booze. <laughs> yeah. Fill it with Complete booze. Opposite. And, um, you know, put a lot of restrictions on what they can and can't do, and then make a reality TV show along with the snowboarding. Any any takers on that? Well, like a real wor- a real world type yeah. Uh, scenario. Yeah, I think if I had the opportunity to watch just a live cam of Jared Elston's life, I would watch that. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm curious. Yep. Would you watch Jared Elston or Mason Jar live? Mm-hmm. Well, I think it would be like a nice little like collaboration. You know, I don't think I could I could watch Mason Jar live all the time. You know, I think that would give me anxiety. <laughs> or FOMO. I don't know. One or the other. But, yeah, more reality shows with the NSD cast. Probably <laughs> smart. Good for snowboarding, for sure. I think that is what we need, yeah. It's like a voted off the island thing, like where you kind of, you know, everybody's got to get together and vote one person off the island. It has nothing to do with snowboarding. So then, like, tension is like Survivor, basically. Mm-hmm. You know, tensions get really high. Uh, maybe you do a naked and afraid type of theme with this, combined mm-hmm. with Natty Select. You know, I'm just spitballing here. You know, I think it could work. Yeah. So I mean, just some ideas. Those are free, Natty Select. Um, <laughs> those are free. Those are free. Liam, yeah. Liam, you can take those into consideration. All right, we'll continue on after I just uh, derailed this. Uh, well, I think it's also with Kevin though. It's probably like a nice one because I think, in my opinion, Kevin got Travis the last time. Right. There was drama there. Mm-hmm. There was a little drama. So I'm pretty hyped actually. Drama kind of follows Travis in the Natty Select tour about like should he have. A lot of the fans of the tour saying he shouldn't have won a lot of runs. Well, he seems to show up in the Alaska section where it's it's he rides insane, but then that like always like the the Jackson kind of uh, live. Yeah, that one was tough. That well, Revelstoke, he did like one of the craziest yeah, that things was I've crazy. ever that was actually scary, seen sure. on a snowboard. But yeah, you know, there's always just the question, and I think it's not his fault. It's a, ju- it's a judging thing, but <laughs> like he also- he's just. Go on. <laughs> also has a small upper hand in some of that stuff where he's picking the venues, he's looked at it more versus yeah. the Revelstoke venue is so complex and long and challenging and uh, a little extra time goes a long ways. Mm-hmm. Now, um, you once rode in the one back at maybe uh, 30 years ago, right? The Ultra Natural back in the Great Depression era? 2008. I don't know what it was called then. The supernatural, the natural, something natural. Large naturals. Large yeah. So natural. wait, which one? I think the first phase? one was natural selection. No, the very first one. Oh, Jackson, Jackson, Jackson Hole. Supernatural. And what happened there, Austin? Why don't you elaborate on that? Um, that was the sickest I've ever been in my life. <laughs> it was the only time where I've been explosive diarrhea and vomiting through my legs at the same time on the toilet, and. Uh, so yeah, I like wasn't able to show up for one of the days, which um, I don't know. I feel like Travis might still be mad at me for that because I just was a no show. Yeah, but uh, haven't got an invitation. Toilet, haven't, haven't got an gotten... invitation locked since, huh? I had I had my shot. <laughs> I've been locked. I had my shot and I missed it. <laughs> yeah. Wow, could be a whole different career for you, Austin, if you know if you hadn't had diarrhea. Also, at that one, about the half of the competition staff all got sti- all got sick. We stayed at this like brand new fancy new hotel Travis was staying at his house and then kind of everyone that was in this new hotel got sick conspiracy I don't know yeah who's patient zero do you remember there's a lot of theories around that hard saying Trent Ludwig was in my room he was also vomiting we were taking turns mm. Are okay. you, you think that Travis might have planted like a faulty burrito or something <laughs> what, are we, what are we saying <laughs> might have been a pre-COVID yeah. thing <laughs> <laughs> Travis Rice started COVID <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't <laughs> Wuhan. It was Jackson Hole. I feel, Austin, you could, could get a page out of his book with uh, your little incident that you did at the Derby a few years ago. Yeah, I did poison everyone with <laughs> spicy Indian food. <laughs> Took out half the field the next day. Smart. It's a pro tip. Yeah, Eric Wallace has a cool, great story about that. It's kind of like The Last Dance with uh, Michael Jordan. They, like, mm. supposedly poisoned his pizza the night before. It's kind of the same scenario. In you Utah. Know, in Utah against the yeah. Jazz, yeah. Learn from your mentors. Yep. Okay, uh, this, is a, this is a spicy one. Um, one of my favorites, the Nils Mindich versus Victor Davian showdown. Anybody want to field this one? Stan? 
Actually, it seems like he was jumping to say something here. Please. I mean, so I know that resort really well, um, being in southern Colorado. And uh, very fun place, but also pretty flat. And so if you saw, like, they were just struggling to hit stuff and get any speed. And then it was it was a little underwhelming, I'd say. But um, they did the best they could, I think, with the what they had available. And then they uh, apparently, according to uh, Aaron Dodds, um, they sent a... They sent it pretty well at the schoolhouse, which is a local establishment there that the Southern Colorado people be hyped. Mm. That's being shouted out here. Yeah, they hammered some ice cold beards. beards? Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Um, also, very uh, native to Colorado, flat, like as you mentioned, just to highlight that. It's like very steep, like very benchy. Like you're getting like a couple hundred vert of steep, and then it just benches out. And a couple hundred, and that's, you could tell that from that. that but it was sure. deep. If it was like it eight was inches on top of that, yeah, it would have yeah. been a whole different Yeah, show. for sure, for sure. But still, nonetheless, I think with the venue they had. I mean, that's Nils's bread and butter. Again, you come down to, to the venue, curious, you know, like, that. to me, that's an advantage to Nils when you're, you're looking at two back-to-back jumps. Um, he's warmed up for that. He's primed for that. You know, like, maybe it would have been a little closer if they're on top of a snowless couloir. You know what I'm saying? But... I think, you know, once Nils sees a, like a sm- – it wasn't like a massive jump, but I don't, I don't think. Um, once he sees that, he knows he can get a little weird with the grabs. I think he was just like, yeah, I got this. And, and to be fair, I think that venue was back up. Like they were planning on going and going out into like this powder cat area that is a little bit better and would have more features and stuff. But because of all that snow, everything got super touchy. And so I think that was actually on the resort. Like if you looked – you can see the runs right next to it. They just shut down a couple of runs. So that makes sense. Yeah. Best they could do. Austin, you got any takes? Yeah. Um, it looked like Bachelor. I was, you know, I was feeling at home <laughs> watching like, that one. I was like, this is some uh, they needed the swallowtail out to make some of those <laughs> yeah. uh, make some of those jumps. But not as tricky. It was just a slope style contest, three level jumps in a row. And I gotta say though, the thing is is like it was so deep and be able to just manage getting to each feature and carrying your speed, you had to land perfect. And Nils did something that is needs to be highlighted that's monumental, like the full switch runs where he did switch frontside seven on the bottom jump and switch backside seven and switch grabs the whole way down. And I just thought that was that was like incre- like launching a switch method in a run that you gotta land. Like I don't know if you guys have ever like I can't do a switch method on a park jump, never mind a powder popper and where you get a land switch. So I was really impressed by Nils's riding, like the cat launching a cab nine and all that stuff. Um, and he didn't fall once. So I just feel like Nils is locked in right now. Yeah. I mean, he's c- competitive as well. Like he for sure wants back onto that. Tour. I mean, Dirks and Derby, he was parked in the lot. <laughs> like I swear, just staring at the course. I think he had a GoPro. <laughs> for practice, and he was looking at the turn seriously. Like I think he's on like some some Mia shit where he's been waking up every day saying, "I'm gonna win." Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna win. <laughs> yeah, but that's the thing. Like Nils rides with so much intention. Like since you know we're biased, we ride together, you know here and there. But he will ride switch all day. Like we, I remember last year when we went to Bald Face for the Avi Clinic, he was just riding switch the entire time, just switch runs. And it's like that's a that's just not that fun. Like, it's just, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I mean, like you're, you're, totally. you're, it's way funner to, to just ride normal. And, but like he, he wants to get better. He, he's thinking about natural selection, even, even on days where, you know, it's, he's it's training. flat. He's training. He's training. Exactly. I think that's kind of what he has on pretty much every other rider. It's like, I don't think I've seen anybody else ride powder switch that well, like navigating also. And like being able to just like, do anything he wants off a jump. It's pretty insane. And he's riding a directional board, like, straight up. Like, it's not like, oh, I'm on a... When you watch him switch, he's got, like, n- not much nose and a shit ton of tail. It's like, damn. He's a problem. He's a threat. All right, uh, let's keep it moving. We got uh, Mary Rand versus Spencer O'Brien. Uh, venue looked a bit challenging. Any takes on that? Yeah, I know that they that originally was scheduled for a month before and they were caught in that like crazy no snow window and then from what i heard it was crusty and they just had a hard time finding spots and then it ultimately really comes down to a classic battle of backflip versus 360 which is a common duel (laughs) in natural selection world and the flip always seems to win which uh, you guys have a feeling about that i don't know sometimes i think the flip gets a little 
I think it's such a crowd ge- pleaser. I'm like, like kind of generally speaking here, like not necessarily specific to this, but I, I, it's funny. You notice as soon as somebody does a flip, they're like, oh. But it's just a 360 in a different way. I don't know. Like look at rail contests and stuff. Anybody like you front board through a down flat down. People are like, oh, okay, cool. You do a back flip off of the kit. You're like, oh my God, it's insane. You're like, what? But I will pleaser. say from a rider perspective, I think the back flip's easier to land. Would you say, Austin? And especially on those takeoffs, yeah. Backflips easier. I was surprised how much uh, Kevin and Sebe were falling on backflips. I was like, these guys never fall. Yeah. And they were, uh, yeah. Speaks of some dog shit conditions, I think. Uh, and then we got uh, Austin Sweeten versus Red Gerard. Uh, not the, the venue to me it was like long, and there's a lot of downtime where they're just riding through the trees. Uh, that one, they both rode really well. Wouldn't want to be, be a judge on that. You guys got takes? Yeah, it's that one was really tough, similar to Sub A Kevin, but this one was really well because, like, Austin, again, one of those riders that got out in the first year, but, like, to me, that kid is made for natural selection. Like, it's it's a shame that he hasn't been in it this whole time because I would have loved to have seen him. Um, and then Red Gerard is kind of, like, I think lined up to be another logical step in the contest rider that turns that country and I'm, I'm just curious to see him more in that environment so like that was a tough one because I really want both of them in because I want Red you know to be able to prove himself in that a- arena and I know that he kind of got dogged last year because he had to go against Travis in Jackson and I heard Travis wouldn't show him where the spot was until <laughs> they showed up <laughs> and so it's like yeah that one was tough but I mean Austin also was like letting it was letting it breathe with a couple of those airs but I think the opposite. That's always been his problem is he lets it breathe too much. Oh, and totally. for the first the time he's first like, one. I got to tone it down. Yeah. I got to contain myself. Yeah. And so he's uh, becoming a competitor. What's so. the deal they're allowed to bring? Now there's like a reader's choice or whatever, viewer's choice selection. So too. is yeah. it male and female? No. It's I just don't one think it is. person. I think it's a guy. Oh, but it's one guy. Which it must be a numbers thing. I, I could be wrong here. But I'm, I don't know what's going on. Fill me in on what you're talking about. So one person from the duels who did not win their duel yeah. is going to move on. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Reader's choice. Style. I didn't know, popular, though, if it was, like, one male, one female, or if it was just one total. I think if we did quick math, we could figure it out, probably, or if we had a list of the full things. Yeah, but yeah. my thought was that there, mu- there must be an uneven number of guys right now. But I oh, think there's an even one number more. of girls. Okay, okay. That makes sense. Yeah, there's five. There's five dudes. I'm looking at in the brackets for the duel, so that would make sense. Yeah, that, so that would. But be I mean, five, for the oh, no, people who are already in, oh, like, okay, in yeah. the tour, the Travis, Blake, oh, got it. Jared, okay. those guys. But I don't know if it's one, but uh, I don't know. I'd yeah. like to see Red in there because he is a competitor, and he shows up under pressure. And in the venue, like they have for Revelstoke, where it's poppy, you know, he, he's got some poppers he can freestyle on. He's he can really show his skills. I think Red uh, has a lot more to offer as well. And I thought that when I was watching that duel, Red kind of had it locked up his first two runs he was in the lead yeah and then sweeten showed up at the end but that like natty back seven where he like skims his nose yeah and still insane. somehow lands i mean i freaking that would be the best day of my life if i landed that and that's like in the middle of his natty select run that was one of my favorite ones to watch i thought that it was so impressive to watch like the route finding like especially austin opening it up like how do you like turn left at this tree and then there's a pat down here like that's impressive to watch that one and Austin opened up I think a couple others during it like he took new lines through it so that was I loved watching that one that one was one of my faves Mm -hmm. even though it was like longer between the features if it's one and one it's for me it's red and Emma yeah yeah Yeah. hands down for sure yep yeah I like that and the last one that we haven't talked about yet is uh Raibu Katayama versus Torgir Bergam in Japan what do you guys think? That one actually looked fun. Like that venue looked <laughs> like it just like pow. Just yeah. like, okay, this looks like good snow. Um, a little bushy, but uh yeah, think, just looked yeah, so looked much more good, yeah. comfortable, yeah. kind of. Like I know Ribu's pretty I, I mean I've seen clips of Ribu in the backcountry that are super impressive, but obviously um Torgir's project was insane. Temple yeah, yeah. dog. I think he was primed. And he just had like the landing gear. Like you could just see, like even if Raibu did put it down, it was, like, sometimes a little washy. Um, 
But I, I did think there might be like a home court advantage thing playing in Ribu's going into before I watched it, but Tori Gears, that kid's bulletproof. So he was just landing everything. Yeah, he got him for sure. Yep. And I'd like to see him being a wild card of winning the whole thing. Mm, I like that. That's a good take. Wow, you heard it here first. <laughs> yeah. One thing that was crazy is that bottom pillow they were hitting towards the end of the duel, they're just ragdolling like right next to trees. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah. <laughs> that was nuts. I think they both went for a seven. Like, Ryby went for a front seven, Torgier went for a back seven, and they both just top walked through the trees. One of my favorite parts was when Ryby looks into the camera, like the filmer, and he's like, did you see that? (laughs) (laughs) Ryby was my favorite to watch. (laughs) Let's hope the cameraman saw that. (laughs) (laughs) Amazing. So that was, uh, that's the duels. That's the duels breakdown. Uh, Any other analysis from you guys? Um, Yeah, I mean... I, I think the duels was impressive, and then we're also obviously in a big duel between Polaris and Snowcat right now. So <laughs> that is, yeah, and obviously Skidoo <laughs> on top for that. I mean, so that's Rats, kind of a shoe. And Tra- Skidoo is kind of like Travis Rice at the national selection. He's pretty much always gonna, it's always going to win. You know what I mean? And likely getting taken down this year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that. And are you working for Natural Selection when they go to Rebbe this year? Yeah, nice. yeah. I'll be like, I'm a glorified weatherman out there. Okay, you know, yeah. that's really my job. They're like, "How's the weather?" I'm like, "It's sunny." They're like, so "Thanks, Dan." <laughs> Back Work to you. Out. Back to you. Or I have to like point to a QR code sometimes. But um, no, it's it's like honestly so sick to be able to be up there and <laughs> kind of like feel the competitive energy. It's tough. Snowboarders, I think we've been talking about whatever this like show, a theoretical show. Um, and I think sometimes snowboarders have a hard time like opening up in the camera or wanting to be real. Like I think they would feel like it was corny, which it might be, but when you're there and you know, so if they were be able to film like kind of the real vibe in the behind the scenes, it's like, it's a really cool thing up, up there, the energy and general competitiveness, but also like sort of pseudo friendship. But then it's like a, it's a cool thing. I think natural selections, an incredible thing. A hundred percent. Best contest in snowboarding. And then the other thing too is like, I think sometimes you watch it and, you're, and you might think to yourself, I could do that line, but then I bet in person it's just huge. I mean, that's like the tough part about I, the drone yeah. stuff is just not, I, it's not ideal. Like I would love to see, it's crazy impressive what they've, that they've been able to make that advancement. But when you're in a super wide angle looking up down at something, it doesn't really translate how big that stuff is. And I even thought that during the duels, like even during Raibu's and Tori Gears, like all the drone angles, you're kind of like, huh. And then when they, as soon as they cut to the bottom angle, you're like, oh, damn. So it's like, I, that, that's my biggest, any tech camera people that may be listening that I would love that if we could get like a less wide angle on a drone, I think it would make all that stuff like look a lot bigger. The big thing for me, I wonder if it like, I personally, I love it, right? Like, I think it's great. I think it's really cool for the sport and everything like that. And I, you know, spend most of my time probably in the backcountry, so I know like what goes into all of it and how difficult that stuff is. But do you think it translates to the average consumer? Like, well, I think the live show it translates the best yeah. because there's that element of like no one knows what's going to happen. The commentators don't know. We don't know. The viewers don't know. And I think that energy translates pretty well to the normal viewer. Um, But no, I don't think any real, like any snowboarding really translates to the average viewer like it does Like, you know, I think about when it was, when it was still at Jackson and, you know, it was like a week after X or whatever it was or or vice versa. I can't remember which one it was, but you were like, you were watching like Mark Mick at X Games go crazy on all these jumps and they're spinning like wild style and everything. And then they go to Jackson and, you know, he's like struggling to get like a front seven or something like yeah. that. And you're like, and the average consumer is like, well, he was hitting this hundred foot tabletop in Aspen and landing a 1440. And then, you know, a week later he goes to this thing and it's in powder. It should be soft. And he's having trouble landing a 720. Like, is it, and we all know like how much more difficult and stuff that is because it's just, you know, not maintained and everything. But I'm like, does the average person like see this and be like, well, it seems like a little whack. Like, I don't know. But I mean, I would assume the average person is pretty disenfranchised by the idea probably. of a 1440 in the first place. <laughs> you know, like yeah. I'd say that's probably a benefit to it is like we can all kind of wrap our heads around a 720 a lot easier. Yeah. Like when Gigi for, did that first first drop, first run, stomp that seven on that, as Chris would say, electric. That was electric. Absolutely. <laughs> but even that stuff, like to your point with the filming and everything, like 
that Jackson stuff is actually massive. And if you oh, weren't yeah. like there, like if you're watching it on TV, because I mean, that's where I live. And so like, I know what the distance is between everything like that. But when I was watching, I was like, doesn't look that big. I think I could probably hit this. <laughs> like, so yeah. I was there watching it on the TV at the yeah. top, and then I got to ride it afterwards, and I was like, yeah, fuck yeah, totally. this. <laughs> like, not a chance. Like, that first road gap, you're like, watching it on the screen, yeah. you're like, I could hit that. And you, like, ride up to it, and it's, like, double overhead. You're yeah. like, no way. Yeah, it's Again, tough. I mean, one thing to consider, we've talked about this before, but maybe we, this is just an idea, we send Stan down the yeah. course for the general <laughs> civilian yeah. to understand, oh, you, hey, guys, I'm a very proficient snowboarder. Uh, I, I'm really good. My name's Stan. I'm not professional. <laughs> but really just so in, in case you think you can ride this course, yeah. I'm going to go down it to, <laughs> to provide context. And then we'll watch the pros do their thing. Yeah. I've also ridden out down Scary Cherry after they did it. And, uh, yeah, incredibly scary. <laughs> incredibly <laughs> scary. And I was trying to follow. They gave me a GoPro to follow Jared Elston down that, like, <laughs> Good luck with yeah. that. I think in, instead of... How far can we zoom in on this? <laughs> like 30 <laughs> times? Because I'm 30 miles behind him right now, but... What do you got? Austin? Instead of Stan, we have that person be Mike Boggs, and then, oh, he, and then he wins it. Yeah. He has a little curveball. Yeah, that would be great. That would be great for the sport. Yeah, they need Boggs out there, MVP of the follow, for sure. So uh, what I also understand is that day one of Revy is live, and then day two is not live, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, that correct, Stan? That is correct. Is, yeah. Day one is sort of side country, Revelstoke Resort area. Okay. And then finals day is like in uh, Selkirk, Tangiers, like heli. Okay. Up. So logistically too much of a nightmare to do a live show from there. Yeah, I don't know the exact numbers behind it, but like I'm going to throw out a loose. Like I think it's like an extra million dollars to go li- to go live from the back country. And so, Yeah. What if I get like a GoFundMe going and I get like a hundred bucks? Can you go live on your phone for us? And yeah, we'll call it good for sure. Yep, hundred bucks ought to cover the expenses of the heli go, flight. Out no, of just for it. you to go live for us on your phone, you know? IG live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we just need a dog shit live feed where we can kind of basically see what's going on. It doesn't need to be that polished. Oh right, like a yeah, I'm going bootleg on him. Yeah, yeah, bootleg. bootleg yeah. Got gotcha, you, got gotcha. We need a bootleg GoFundMe going for the live. We'll get somebody with a ghillie suit, hide it out halfway through. Yeah. Well, there was years ago where Otterstrom and crew like they sled it up to the bald yeah the bald face run. There was all sorts of like kind of drama or something about that. They snuck in, we're just checking it. I out I mean, if the there base. was anyone who could get a heli budget t- together. <laughs> On this table, it'd probably be Pashley yeah. to, to get a little, here. like, park uh, across the gully, maybe yep. a little binocular angle. I don't know. Yep, I like that. I Just like undercut the Arcteryx partnership a little bit. <laughs> you know what North Face goes live. <laughs> Tune in to North Face YouTube to get your IG. It's actually not a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you call some people. people. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, still, as much as uh, we're bagging on the fact it's not live, still a great event. All right, we're going to take a quick break and talk to you guys about Bub's Naturals. They are a supporter of the show, and they've got a great new product that just came out called Hydrate or Die. It's an electrolyte mix. It's a little bit of powder. You pour it in your drink, mix it up, keeps you hydrated. Now, Bub's Naturals Hydrate or Die electrolyte mix is here to help you hydrate fast and recover quickly with no added sugars, Hydrator Dye has 2,000 milligrams of powerful electrolytes from nature, not a lab. So uh, there's no added sugars. This is, this is good for you, and it keeps you hydrated. And as you get older, you end up getting dehydrated. You chug coffee all day, and then uh, you got to get the hydration back in the system. What about you, Yosh? I heard you're on some bubs these days. Yeah, I've actually had some of the Hydrator Dye um, when I was at Peace Park. Uh, Mike Hatchett had some in his bag, and he handed <laughs> Yeah, a little shout out. He handed me some of these, like a big bag of them, I think the same size. And uh, I started putting it in my water every day, and it, it really did keep me hydrated. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. I can't recommend it enough. And it's not like some BS. I use this stuff every single day. Uh, it's, it's really good. So if you're interested in picking up some Bub's Naturals Hydrator Dye, head on over to their website, bubsnaturals.com. Use promo code BOMBHOLE for 20% off your first order. Name That Video Part is presented by Woodward Park City which we love here at the bomb hole. We're regulars over there. Uh, just had an event earlier this winter up there called the Dust Bomb, and it was a blast. Now, one thing we love here at the bomb hole is affordability in snowboarding. And you can get a lift ticket 
for $40 and go snowboarding, which is unheard of in this day and age. And their monthly membership is cheaper than most day passes at other ski resorts. So definitely check out Woodward Park City if you're looking for a nice, convenient snowboarding experience. You know, you jam up the canyon. It's 15, 20 minutes from Salt Lake. There's usually no lift lines. It's easy. It's fun. They got beginner features. If you're just learning, you want to hit your first box. They got a bunny slope if you want to learn how to ride. And then they got everything from a super pipe all the way up to some jackers of some kickers. You know, if you want to let the big dog eat, Woodward Park City is a great place to do it. So check it out. And then you can learn tricks into the foam pit inside. Cocard did this the other day. He learned switchback rodeos on a roller board and then inside into the foam pit and then strapped on his snowboard, went outside, did a switchback rodeo and jump. So they're all about progression at Woodward Park City. And uh, if you want to learn some new tricks, check it out. Now, we got a call with Eric Blem uh, in about 15 minutes, coming up shortly. Before we do that, I think we should rip through some Patreon questions here. Um, so let's, let's start it off with, here we go, Captain Surge. Uh, this is for Austin. Why is the season equipment logo a cigarette? <laughs> <laughs> we get cigarette. We get uh, a uh, birth control strip. Mm. We get a thermometer. We get, uh, but all those things are great, so that's why. You want to walk us through the, first of all, explain what Season Equipment is and then maybe the logo? Season Equipment is a ski and snowboard brand that myself and Eric Pollard started, pro skier. Um, and there's two logos, but the one that people really focus on is this little blue and yellow uh, color strip. And yeah, it's also kind of like half ski, half snowboard, so it's speaking to that. Um, but a lot of people think it looks like a Siggy. Who conceptualized it? That'd be Eric Pollard. He's more the creative. Mm. He's the brains, you're the balls kind of thing. He's the brains, I'll go jump off something for him. I like that. Okay, this one's from Casanova Cody. Thanks to our Patreon members, by the way. Um, ask Stan why he's not making episodes of Last Resort on the regular. Mm. Stan is too funny and beautiful to not be making more content. Damn, my mom put a pseudo <laughs> My mom's a Patreon subscriber? Crazy. Um, why don't I put out more Last Resort episodes? The, the honest answer is that I can't get away from wanting to make funny skits in the beginning, which take longer. And if I were to just actually talk news, I don't know, should I ditch the skit? This kind of, maybe, like, because I could put them out more quickly um, if I would just bail on the skits. Um, what kind of cadence are we going to talk with these? What are we thinking? How do you mean? How often are these going to be coming out? How often were they at the time? Like, because did, so did it start with Yobi? There was an air, hate line was once a week. That was yeah, yeah, yeah hate line, yeah. And there was pro almost like a seventy five okay Damn. episodes of that. And then I switched it to the news show for like twelve episodes, and I think there's thirty. This is the thirty fifth episode of Last Resort coming out. Um, they were coming out monthly. I think that's like. Considering I'm doing slush and traveling to various events to commentate or just hang, it's hard for me to set up the green screen, cameras, lights, um, more than once a month. But in, in my ideal world, I would still put one out every week. I think that that would be incredible. I don't know. I, I don't have a plan. I honestly, it was just like driving me nuts that I hadn't made one. People kept asking me and it was giving me immense anxiety and I actually did want to make them. And then I kind of finally snapped and just started making them. Cause I, yeah, I don't know. I want more, <laughs> to be honest, I just wanted more sponsorship money <laughs> for it. And I like, but then I realized I just should start making them. And so you can sponsor last resort if you want. <laughs> you ever think like, what if, scenario what your life might le look like if you would have switched it to a weekly podcast yeah <laughs> yeah yeah you ever think about that Stan? Yeah. Mm. i could have my own smelling salt brand <laughs> 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 which has always been a huge goal of mine <laughs> the guy's immune to smelling salt it's crazy yeah, he is immune i can't get over that yeah still. i'm pretty sure there's something wrong like some sort of blockage like a tumor in my brain that's <laughs> present preventing me from really feeling the full effects. Or just my massive eyes are just absorbing all of the... <laughs> Could be a combination of both. Yeah. All right, we got another Patreon question from Captain Surge. Melissa, when will Kodiak Cakes start sponsoring a snowboard team? 
I think they have, actually. Like, I think Nils and Blake are on it, I think. Yeah. But it'd be sweet if they kept doing more. I love everything about that company. Were you doing some work for them? Yeah, I was food styling. I still am food styling, like, freelance style. Like, I'll do, like, pancake shoots, obviously, because they're pancakes, but also make, like, chocolate tarts and other really fun things. Does that mean that you're the one cooking it and making it? Look nice. Yeah, I make it really beautiful. Damn. Looking. Yeah. Oh. Some Austin Granger shit right yeah, there. Yeah, oh yeah. Am nice. I right in thinking that you said you put motor oil on them instead of syrup? Is that a real I, pro tip? I mean, people who are really bad at cooking do that, but I'm really good at cooking, so I don't do that. Oh, you're legit. Okay. I'm, I'm legit. <laughs> There's other tricks. There's actually so many fun tricks you can do for food styling. Like you can boil the syrup and then make it cold, and then that kind of acts like motor oil. How do you find out about this? You go to school I, for I go this? in. <laughs> I go in YouTube wormholes. I was a minor in food styling at the U. <laughs> <laughs> Got my bachelor's in food styling. <laughs> it's the most ridiculous thing. You're like lining up these pancakes in front of the camera, and you're like, I have to get it perfect. It's like fluffy on this side, but not on this side. It's pretty. Well, if anyone should be on um, Kodiak cakes, should be Aaron Blatt. Oh, he's in oh, nice with the yeah. flat. Oh, yeah, he's nice with them. Yeah. Uh, okay, we got another Patreon question. This one's from Ian Tarbox. Uh, he says, Pashley, you've been on so many amazing trips across the globe with such diverse terrain. What are the biggest lessons learned in the backcountry regarding snowpack and terrain management? How has your level of risk changed throughout the years? Hard hitting. Whoa. Wow. Not expecting, uh, yeah, I was expecting to be roasted by someone on some sort of <laughs> <laughs> form. So. Uh, yeah, crazy. So... I guess it's, like, as I've gotten older, it's definitely changed, and I think my risk level has gone substantially down. And I think now I just look at everything at not as opposed to, like, if it could pull, that it will likely pull. And by that, I mean, like, the avalanche scenario, that's kind of our biggest risk out there. But I feel now, like, with what I do and who I'm with, first it is for sure, like, all about the crew that you're with and everything. But, it, you know, in perspective, like, these last few days, it's been a group of people that I haven't spent a ton of time with and someone, I, Austin was obviously with me and I've spent a ton of time with him in the mountains. So I have a lot of trust in him, but then a lot of people that are pretty new to it. And so you're like, okay, like how do we help them like gain the knowledge without making them feel stupid too? Like, I don't want to ever be like dressing anyone down and be like, no, you're doing it wrong. You got to get out of there. That's a dangerous spot or anything like that. So it's, I think just talking through with people and everything like that, but then really it's mitigation. Like everything that I'm looking at now, it's like, okay, how do we just avoid that? And how do we just stay clear of that face or that slope? Or is there a pocket there that I'm a little concerned about? And maybe you could build the jump and land over this way or just weird little things like that and nuances. And I think like, it's just been a lot of time. Like, you know, I'm in my mid forties now. So it's like, I've spent a lot of my years just farting around in the mountains and everything like that. And it's really just because of always love snowboarding and Primarily, I know this is a little bit of a rail zone, but, but I've really just loved powder and been out there. And so I think I've just tried to, you know, take that as far as I can. I just want to spend as much time out there as I possibly can for sure. And, yeah, I think it's just trying to be safe and just knowing – it's really mitigation. Like as long as you can like realize like different areas and undulations and like, like that's a train trap. Let's probably not land in there because even if you ride out of it perfectly but the whole face pulls, like where are you going to go? And stuff like that. So it's just kind of setting up those scenarios and stuff and then just being, you know, overly stupid prepared with everything and, you know, super heavy packs and stuff like that that are on the sleds and everything like that. But, yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting thing to talk about because you guys are with the North Face crew and you guys are filming around Utah yeah. and Wyoming. And a lot of – a few people in the crew are basically brand new to oh, yeah. the mountains and stuff like that. So have you been, you know, been like kind of giving them any safety talks and or anything like that? Yeah, I think, you know, like right now, so yeah, to your point where Blake, um, Paul, and Spencer Schubert are filming a project that's a full, like a North Face project, and they're trying to tag in and bring as many of the other North Face crew that they can, so hence Austin being out there. We were just up in Jackson with Mark Carter, um, and then just recently we were back here in Logan with um, Kennedy Deck, who Kennedy is a recent addition. Um, that'll all be kind of coming out, but it's it's kind of out there now. Everybody kind of knows, but... So um, they've been out with us, and it's been really cool to see Kennedy kind of getting after it and getting out there and really crazy style, but also really open to listening and, like, taking the feedback. And, yeah, I think big thing I'm trying not to, you know, 
make anybody feel stupid because like that's the worst thing you can do. So it's just like trying to be helpful, being like, oh no, these are scratchers, and yeah, these are Polaris scratchers, and they suck ass. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> She's been crushing. Yeah. She's been doing really good. And uh, Austin's honestly, you know, like as much shit as I give him, he's, you know, one of the best for this scenario. He's like very helpful and very friendly and like being, you know, like he's been taking Kennedy out and like they've kind of gone off and kind of go rogue and just go missing for a little while. And then all of a sudden over the radio, they're like, okay, we've got a feature over here if you guys want to come hit this. And, you know, helping Kennedy get everything set up and being like, okay, this is the trajectory. This is where you're going to want to start. This is the speed. And just like, I mean, he's been a doubling machine, so for sure. This will probably be one of the last comments I, or compliments I give him, but yeah. I haven't been going that far. More just like set her somewhere and say like, figure it out. I'll be back in an hour. See what you made. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But well, it's then, been cool. Everybody's she, been super responsive to everything. And she's just been loving being out there. She's like, you know, she's been going on rail trips for a lot of years now and kind of her first time being in the mountains, and she's just been seemingly pretty excited to be out there. She's like, oh, this is a lot sweeter than... Edmonton. Yeah. Uh, it's minus 30. Yeah. It's pretty nice out there. We gave her her own, her own sled this time, too. Why extra sled? And it was one of those moments where you, like, hand it off. You're like, okay, this is kind of running through everything. And whatnot. you're like, sayonara. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck. It's turns insured. Out, turns out she did better on the sled than Spencer Schubert. Oh, so yeah. he kind of crashed one of mine. Yeah. So why, don't you walk, why don't you explain that situation, Austin? You got to go down with the ship. Um <laughs> Yeah, Spencer was trying to, like, snowmobile across this little zone and got kind of bucked off and just kind of ditched the sled, and then it went uh, nose first into some trees, um, which is, like, half my snowmobile, half my buddy Kale Meyer's snowmobile. So Kale wasn't loving to hear that, but um, Spencer was a trooper. He was, like, kind of freaking out about it, but that's what happens. Like, if you're going to get into snowmobiling, if you're going to get in the mountains, you kind of have to expect to uh, make a lot of mistakes and just be okay with that. There was one day where Spencer was kind of throwing these little... Small temper tantrums um, <laughs> where he's getting stuck and he's just yelling and just like, I want to quit. And just like, this is fine. This is just part of the process. And you just have to be okay with yeah. screwing up and getting stuck. And yeah, it's part of the process. It's a team sport. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. How are you on the snowmobile out there? You were looking good. I'm getting pretty good with it. <laughs> Not nice. good yet, but like I'm, I'm figuring out how to like dip it in the powder. And like, I think my biggest battle is like hill climbs with really deep snow. That's yeah. like really tricky but I did my first wheelie up one the other day and that was what? super exciting well and you, you've yeah, been spending a bunch of time o'clock. like up at uh like Mellowstone Club right um that a area? bit at the Mellowstone Club but okay. a lot in Logan this year okay. in that area yeah bunch up there love that now I, I guess ask we're talking about safety here and stuff like that now do you feel like Pashley since you're on a Polaris you're kind of a, <laughs> a risk to the crew <laughs> like do you ever think about the other people on the crew when you're riding that machine I mean, up until up until a day with you actually in Jackson, I was gone a, almost a two year stretch of zero sticks. So mm. let that be known. Well, and then I uh, happened to do a little pruning of the hedges yep. scenario with you the other yeah, day. Yeah, I actually got a perfect view of you uh, torpedoing your snowmobile <laughs> up a hill climb directly into a tree. So uh, I kind of blame let- Austin on that though. It was more his fault. He was maybe going a little too slow, kind of in my way, and he kind of chose one where where I was going to go, and then the only option was straight up this tree. <laughs> oh, is that? It was Austin's fault that yeah, you hit the yeah, tree? Yeah, 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 it wasn't yours. Yeah, I like that. Accountability. Or is it because you've been snowmobiling with Colin Wiseman for the last two years? <laughs> and so you haven't uh, been getting stuck, and now that you're out there with me and Chris, there's a little bit more critical terrain. No, yeah. I mean, I'd say that's the only thing with going out with all the new the new crew and everything is, like, my back is getting really strong. You know, you're mm-hmm. just a lot of uh, lot of excavation going on in my world lately. You're going to have to start playing the game of stuck with everybody, you know? S T U C K. Whoever gets mm. stuck the most or gets the letters first, they buy the beers. Like, oh, okay. heard of that. yeah, we haven't Whoa. played that. I think it's a uh, if you do a ski pole, like just a ski pole, like okay. you don't have to stomp anything out. That doesn't count. But if okay. you like have to stomp them out and like yank them out, bring the shovels out. That's that's a letter. Okay. Mm. I don't yeah. agree. I like encourage and uh, yeah. I support I people you- getting stuck because I think if you're not trying, if you're not getting stuck, you're not trying. And if you're not trying, you're never gonna learn. Yeah. That and is so true. You're, you're just going to, like, get to the lake bed, sit there, wait for someone to build you a road and kind of do it, and then, like, that's what I'm least supportive of. So I'd rather you just go out there, balls to the wall, get stuck, I'll come help you, total some sleds, we'll tow it out. That's what I want to say. Yeah, start. but okay. let's not forget how fun it is to make other people buy you beers. <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> hey, you were trying really hard then yesterday. <laughs> I got a couple on the board. He had a couple very nice pieces yesterday for sure. Let me tell you what's something about the turbo. It, it is... It is a challenge to get it stuck. Okay, <laughs> like you, you don't even, 
it just wheelies itself out any hole that you're in. You know, as long as you're on steep terrain, you can just kick flip the thing right over and you're good to go. Uh, one last question here before we get into this call from Eric Bam. Uh, this is Blem, sorry. This is from Peter B. Shout out to our Patreon members. Thanks for supporting the show. He wants to know what are some recommended catboarding operations other than bald face? Would love to go. I know it's hard to get on the wait list. Would love a good recommendation. I don't know. I got no intel on this. I'm a rail guy. Uh, Pash probably. Oh Austin. yeah, he, don't hear who's who's gonna go under the Pensiero fire first. Here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> line it up. Yeah, <laughs> Just gonna freak out here, but uh, I'd say I've spent a good amount of time at Retalic, um, and that's one. It's just outside of Nelson um, as well. It's maybe like an hour and a half outside of Nelson, but uh, another great operation. Um, it was kind of, I'd say it's probably like the ski version of Baldface, honestly. It was uh, originally like Tanner Hall and Seth Morrison and uh, maybe a couple other people were involved in it. But it's moved on to a different partnership now, but that's a good one. Super fun runs. Me, Brian, Bob Plum, Rick McCrank did like a camp out trip there. Yeah. It's really fun runs. That's a good place. There's a bougie one um, I went to not too long ago called Kiefer Lake. And that was a really cool place, too. That's, like, up in the Monashies, so a little closer to Kelowna. Also, shout out uh, Great Northern. Oh, Great yeah. Northern, that's, like, some of the funner runs I've had in my life. Um, and it's BYOB, which is kind of cool. They're not trying to sell you beers. You can bring your own beverages uh-huh. if you'd like. Um, and there was a hockey rink next close yeah, totally. by, which was cool. Yeah. You, know, you know what seems like a good one? I've only been after they closed, but Chatter Creek? I've never been to Chatter. Yeah, it's no. a really cool remote location. The terrain's awesome. It's tough, though. All that stuff, it's just like you uh, you can't win if you don't play, but it's just yeah. totally conditions-based. You can go to any of them and have, like, the best time, and you can also have a tricky time if it just rained or something. But going up to Canada is always usually a pretty good bet, but they've had a tough go this year. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's where bald face shines, right? Like, especially being a snowboarder, like, if anybody ever asks me, like, I get it asked a bunch about, like, operations and stuff to go to check out and whatnot and if you're a snowboarder you gotta i mean bald face is a sure in right because like you, i mean you could go there and the snow could be complete dog shit and you'd still have a great time because of all the history and the lodge is really cool and everyone's really great and jeff too and everybody that works there is knowledgeable and really fun to be around and yeah the history and everything that's there is epic and mm-hmm. so you can have a fun Craig, time yeah. i mean literally we went i was with stan over new year's and we were up there and i went thinking that it was going to be complete trash but I was like excited just to go and hang out with everybody, and so only a powder I've ridden all winter, <laughs> honestly. No way. Yeah. Yep. And the thing too, you just haven't been calling me. <laughs> Did we I gotta say get, something? We gotta get Stan on a snowmobile. <laughs> we gotta Again, get him out there back for to sure. Be looking for a snowmobile sponsor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's get him on an Arctic Cat and see how he does. Yeah. Or maybe like an O3 Yamaha, something yeah. like that. Um, I, know that. I think I could be a Yamaha guy because I want someone who can make like a piano, a drum set, a motorcycle. <laughs> That's a great point. That's a great point. Uh, those guys are just Dirt good bike. at everything. Yeah. Yep. yep. I like that. Um, and then one other thing with the, the cat skiing operations is like a lot of the cat skiing is from what I understand. I haven't been to a lot of lodges and stuff, but they're they're like they're, they're rooted in skiing. And I think that going back to what you said, bald face is rooted in snowboarding. Yeah with Craig being a part of it, Craig Kelly, and all the memorabilia snowboards on the wall, where some other places, if you're a snowboarder and there's, like, skis and shit all over the wall, yeah. not that's yeah. just, like, something that's near and dear to my heart. And speaking of Craig, um, and uh, we're going to give Eric Blem a call, who wrote uh, The Darkest White here, and talk to him about his newest book. All right, we got Eric Blem on the line, who just wrote uh, The Darkest White, a book about Craig Kelly. Uh, and it comes out, when does it come out? It's coming right around the corner, right? Uh, it has been out for three days. Okay, my bad. Sorry <laughs> about that, Eric. That's okay. That's all right. Not a problem. I got to get you on that one, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Walk us through the process of writing this book and, and how that was for you. Oh, my gosh. Well, I mean, Craig Kelly, right? I mean, for those of you who know, he was kind of the original superstar of the reason why we all do what I, what we do. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I decided to write the book, um, when there was a kid in a lift line standing next to me, uh, about six years ago, and he looked down at my Craig Kelly as my co-pilot sticker on the nose of my board and just asked me with all sincerity, who's Craig Kelly. And I, I was floored. I just couldn't believe anybody, 
uh, on the planet, much less another snowboarder um, would ask that question. And that's when I realized that Craig's, you know, was kind of drifting into, um, you know, that gray area where he might be forgotten. And a lot of the current generation riders didn't know who he was. And I just wanted to correct that and um, honor a friend who was so special to all of us back. You know, he was literally like the, I don't know, you could say he was like the, you know, Sean White, Chloe Kim of the 80s and 90s. Um, for all of all of us in that generation and um, he was killed tragically in, a, in an avalanche um, after he kind of walked away from all the fame and fortune of uh, competing and competition and uh, decided he wanted to go kind of venture back into the backcountry and become a backcountry guide um, and that's when during this intense training uh, he was tragically killed. Yeah, absolutely. And I think some of the stuff that's cool, I haven't gotten all the way through the book, to be totally honest with you, a uh, bit of a slow reader. But, you know, at the time, too, a snowboarder being a backcountry guide was relatively unheard of because it was mainly occupied by skiers in that space, correct? Yeah, no, totally. He broke down the walls for the, the ACMG, the Association of Canadian Mountain Guides. You know, they're renowned around the world. And really, even the international um, guiding, there, there was nothing... Uh, no sort of a certification process or way to even allow a snowboarder to apply, much less pass their their training and certification program. And Craig just didn't accept that. He said, you know, we, we have split boards. We're just kind of coming on and getting starting to become some. And he, you know, he had that option. He thought, you know, a guide at the time could pass the, you know, learn to ski and or uh, whatever you telemark, whatever it was that they wanted to do. Um, in order to be allowed into the program, but he said, "No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to, I, I can do everything you can do on my split board that you can do on skis." And um, he stuck to his guns and was ultimately accepted. And yeah, and he was um, well on his way and through a uh, a good portion, more than half of what he needed to do uh, <clears throat> to get it done. And again, people, you know, various guides that have come in since then, you know, that that know the history, realize that he was the one that kind of open those doors for, for guides on slip boards in the future. Yeah. Eric, I was kind of curious. You, you know, you had a relationship, uh, with Craig, um, and we're able to kind of know him, see his effect on the world in real time. And I was just wondering, like, if it was hard to dig into that process really, and, and kind of do some of that extensive research, like your, your description of just that day is so extensive, goes over a couple of chapters. And like, you know, I, I know that you experienced like a little bit of a hard time really, uh, getting some of the guides, uh, to, to talk to you about that. And, and I, yeah, it was, you know, is it hard to write about something that that's, that's that close and like, how do you, how do you manage that? It, it was tough. I mean, I've, I've, I was an editor at Transworld Snowboarding Magazine for many years, and then I kind of walked away from that and got into nonfiction book writing. I wrote all books about special operations forces, Navy SEALs. And so I dealt with, you know, honoring people and their stories um, who had died and some in tragic, tragic situations. But this kind of hit me um, harder, much harder than I thought, because I did know Craig personally. And, uh, you know, to, I knew even at the outset of, of the book, I mean, it took me, it was five years of research. And I mean, really the research started when I was in the front row of, at his memorial service, um, recording a lot of the story people told 21 years ago was when he was killed. And I was just, you know, it's a long time ago. And I put out all that research into a box for many years, reopened that box. And it was kind of like opening a cold case because, uh, there was a lot of questions about that avalanche, and you're exactly right. I mean, I knew from the beginning, you know, digging down into that, those dark layers, um, you know, both metaphorical and, you know, understanding the snowpack that day and all the questions about the avalanche was going to be tough. And um, I think that's part of what took a lot longer for me to do this because I just like people have told me already that have read it, you know, they know what's coming and they hope for another outcome. And I was researching it in that same way, you know, just almost kind of putting off that end. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's a celebration. It, we, you know, it's here, we're, we're here to celebrate Craig's life. And, uh, way back when I had to write, you know, an obituary about Craig and some tribute stories in Kuwar magazine and trans world, you know, we all said, let's celebrate Craig. And so we all kind of shied away from his death. And, and in this case, I wanted to, um, I didn't want to shy away from that. I felt that's important. There's still lessons to be learned. And so in going to that dark place, um, there was light. You know, there are lessons learned and I think it's going to introduce, it already is. I mean, New York Times gave it a rave review. It's been in 
a lot of different um, publications and interview already. It was it the hardcover is sold out in Canada in two days, um, and they're selling out quick in the U.S. So the response has been great, and that's what I wanted. I wanted to introduce them to not only uh, you know us, the people who know who Craig was and the, and the snowboarders, but the general public because. Again, he was, he was kind of like the Michael Jordan. I mean, the people who don't know snowboarding, when I explained what it was like for that kid to say that to me about the Craig Kelly is my co-pilot sticker on the board, I told him it would be kind of like, in all seriousness, me walking up to a pickup basketball game somewhere wearing a Michael Jordan jersey and somebody is looking over and saying, Jordan. I mean, that's, that's how big Craig was to all of us. You know, the world was much smaller in snowboarding at the time, but he was that huge, so... Uh, that's kind of a circuitous route to that answer, <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. was it tough? It was it, it was to to dive in there, but I think what kept me going was knowing that you know in that darkness there's light. I love that. Uh, another, another thing I wanted to bring up too is is Craig. You know, in in the stories I've heard and things like that, is very inspiring in the way he lived his life. Uh, almost on a f- philosophical way, that his outlook, the way he approached it. In diving into your research, what did you find to be very inspirational about how Craig approached life? Oh, man. I, you know, I, there's so many things. I mean, in, the, in a soundbite, really tough to say, but there's some, one thing that, you know, you can see in some of his videos uh, in the past where he would say, I followed my bliss and follow your bliss. You know, just set yourself on a journey and just live it. And when you go into the, the depth of that, you know, um, following your bliss was, and gosh, being on the spot here, I cannot remember who kind of coined that phrase, but he read a lot. He did a lot of studying and philosophical readings. And, and what he learned in this was that if you follow your bliss on that, that road and meaning, you know, what you're drawn to, where your heart takes you, what you want to do, what feels right you're going to meet like-minded people on that path and it's going to, it's, it's just kind of a good compass to, to guide your life. And I think that's what Craig did. And so many people along the way that he met uh, were inspired by him. I mean, when we, at, at his uh, memorial service, I was, what was really cool. Craig's, you know, his widow Savina was there. And one of the things at the end of it, she just could not believe how many people, the sheer number of people that referred to Craig as their best friend. They thought of him as his, their best friend. So even somebody who was as busy as he was traveling around the world, he always um, made time um, or, or, or not even time. He just, he gave the focus and was thoughtful enough to make the connection with people. And um, again, the people you meet when you follow your bliss are the people that, you know, they both inspire you, but you can inspire them as well. I mean, in snowboarding and backcountry, for him, he was really into reading. He was a lifelong learner. He was very curious, and just yeah, it's just he was just a really inspiring guy. Yeah, I thought another really great element of the book, like the first three quarters, is kind of telling the history of snowboarding, but it's it's sort of telling the history through Craig. Um, and I'm curious, like how much of those were hand in hand? You know, like that that was right. one of my favorite parts. Is like you, for anyone who hasn't read it yet, it's not just a story about how he died it's also a story of from his early days you know not necessarily like the most joyful childhood per se and how he kind of starts as almost this like little shit stir and by the end he's this like guide who's you know really selfless helping people but you kind of tell the whole story of snowboarding through him um was yeah. that yeah was that an easy thread to pull it's really three books in one right it's a it's a history of snowboarding it's a, um, a biography and then it's like this disaster narrative, you know, kind of like the perfect storm or, um, you know, into thin air. That's was kind of the outset of what I looked at. And, um, you know, it's the golden age of snowboarding that Craig, you know, was most active in obviously. And I just wanted to, um, go back and, you know, I've read, a, I've read a lot of history about snowboarding over the years and being an editor trans world knew the basic history, but, they, I'd never really read a story where it was, you know, following someone's life through that history and especially all the way through, you know, basically from the moment, the first time he ever set foot on a snowboard, actually the moment he was born, which was only two weeks after Sherman Poppin, um, applied for the patent for the snurfer, which is what inspired Jake Burton Carpenter, which was inspired the back hill, which got shipped to Jeff Fulton Schwinn's parents, Schwinn shop in Mount Vernon. 
that ended up getting into Craig's hand. So I like tracked it to that moment um, of when it all started to the very end. And um, I thought that that's just a really cool way when you're following along someone else's story through a, a history. It's, you know, I think the, the best way to learn anything is, is with story. And if you can track someone's individual story, it just, it just gives you that thread that allows you to follow along. So I wanted to keep the reader reading. I mean, in today's day and age, you want to hook somebody, you want to give them a read and keep reading. And um, that's, you know, I'm hoping that that's, you know, we'll give some people a reason to pick up a book and, and, you know, that joy of having good books on a shelf in your room or in a house or wherever it is, you know, they're just, they're magical. You know, they take you away to another world in a way that, you know, visuals can't, they, they work different with your brain. And Craig was a big book reader and I wanted to honor him with that. Yeah. I thought like another really interesting part, like I, I've heard the narrative where, um, Jake had said when I started listening to the riders is when the business took off, but like ultimately a big part of that was when he was listening to Craig. Um, Mm -hmm. and Craig was really the first rider to separate from this. Like you have to compete in every, I'm just paraphrasing the book by the way, (laughs) but like you have to compete Uh in every, event from slalom to half pipe and he was the first rider to be like i'm actually just going to do just half pipe i just want to do this one thing i'm going to focus on my own path and i think that in itself was like a trailblazing uh, a moment for what snowboarding would grow into which is just like your own personal journey um so yeah I i mean i don't know if i have as much of a question but i just thought that was another great angle of the book where you kind of i you like delineate that yeah, and and every, and we've heard little tidbits and sound bites of of Jake Burton Carpenter saying that over the years. And what was really cool is that I I was he he told that story um, at the memorial service, and I recorded it, so I got it verbatim from from Jake. And that was he actually he actually reread what he had did. Craig had won the Trans World Lifetime Achievement Award at the time. Didn't age so well the name, but it was called the Tranny Award. And they um, and that's what he won. And Craig, you know, he he presented it to Craig and he read that line, which has been, you know, again, excerpted and snippeted all over, but it was really cool to actually hear it in full again. After all these years, I had it on, you know, had it on mini disc or I'm sorry, I had it on, on micro cassette and I had to digitize and I sat and listened to it again. Now he, <clears throat> Jake kind of um, put it out there uh, and, you know, lionized him really because he was kind of, he was letting go of his overall world title. Like when he decided, Hey, you know, I was, he was the overall best, you know, four-time world champion. And he knew, and Jake knew, hey, you know, if you're going to stop training and racing, everyone's going to pass you up. And he's kind of like, well, that's okay, because I, I really want to really want to focus on freestyle and half pipe. And then sure enough, the half pipe became like the, the new, like, focus the following year. And so Jake and others were like, is Craig, like, is he setting the standard? Is he predicting the future? What, how is this going on? But whatever it was, Craig had this, his finger on the pulse. And I think it was the same with free riding because at one point he finally realized that, you know, that feeling you get when you're free riding is just what everybody falls in love with, with snowboarding. I mean, they don't fall in love with that first time they, you know, bash a gate or even, you know, maybe drop into a half pipe. Maybe some people do, but for the most part, especially in that era, it was just free riding. I mean, everybody was ready for the contest to end. So what? You could go free ride. And um, Craig picked up on that early on and and um, decided just to, to devote himself to that at that point. He finally said, you know what, I, I'm not going to compete at all. And so he was the first one who actually, you know, and Burton supported him that was able to free ride and still get paid. <laughs> and it was a big deal. And he got paid well. And because of photo incentives and everybody that followed him and the photographers, he ended up making, you know, nearly what he did had when he was making, you know, Burton was matching his prize winnings for competition. And at the time, I mean, that one year in today's money, he made out a million bucks for the year. I mean, he was the first pro rider to ever buy a house with money. He made purely from snowboarding. I mean, there are people who were company owners that had bought houses and cars, but he was the first to order to do that. And then he continued onward just free riding and kind of set the standard and he inspired riders like Brian Gucci and, you know, down the line, the people who were more the free riders and just the filmers, and thought, hey, I can make a living at this. And look at how many people are doing that now. Love it, Eric. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for your service to snowboarding, for sharing the story. It needs to be told, and uh, it's it'll be great for all of the snowboarding community to read and learn about the history of the shoulders that snowboarding's been built on. So we appreciate that. 
Yeah, well, hey, I appreciate being on the bomb hole. I'm fired up, and I'm just stoked to um, to be able to share Craig's story. I mean, that's my goal. You know, 2024, I don't want any kid out there that slides sideways on the snow to look over and see a Craig Kelly as my co-pilot sticker and not know who he is. Let's, you know, spread the word. Love that. I love that. Well, thanks so much. Uh, I'll make sure hopefully everybody that's listening can pick up one of these books too. And and uh, thanks thanks again for calling in. Yeah, thanks a lot, guys. We'll talk to you later. Okay. Love the show. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate you. We'll talk to you. See you later. Later. Bye. All right. We are introducing the GoPro line of the winter contest. Now, they got $120,000 in cash prizes for ski and snowboard POV clips and the opportunity to be crowned GoPro line of the winter. Now, to enter, upload your raw footage from any GoPro camera to the GoPro line of the winter challenge at gopro.com slash awards and post your line with the hashtag GoPro line of the winter. Now, what's up for grabs? We got 10 grand each for four ski and four snowboard clips from January through April. And then they got 20 grand each for one skier and one snowboarder whose run is crowned GoPro line of the winter in May. Each month, GoPro athletes Jamie Anderson, Sage Kosberg, Tom Wallace, and more will judge and select their favorite clips to take home the cash. Submissions will be judged on athletic performance, video capture quality, and overall wow factor. So get out there, record some A-grade lines, and you could be the GoPro line of the winter winner. All right, we're going to talk about one of my favorite brands, and that's Skidoo. The 2025 Skidoo sleds are here, and they're more capable than ever. From now until April 2nd, you can spring check, a.k.a. you can reserve spring-exclusive models like the Summit X, the Summit X with the Expert package, or the Free Ride. Each are available with the awesome power of the Rotax 850 E-Tech Turbo R engine. That's 180 horsepower of epic adventure waiting for you. And let me tell you, I have an 850 E-Tech Turbo R Expert package, and it is so fun it should be illegal. Try not to have a smile on your face riding one of those things. And if you order a new sled by April 2nd, you can pick up between three years of coverage or get a thousand bucks worth of ski to apparel or accessories like the Link ski and board racks that'll have you ready to shred with just the flip of a lever. Don't wait. Hit up your ski do dealer and make sure you reserve that new 2025 sled today. Uh, I think it's a good time to change gears and get into nitro turbo takes. What do you think, Silk? I think that's a great idea. Welcome to Nitro Turbo Takes! Brought to you by Nitro Snowboards and Kindu Eliasson. Nitro Snowboards has been building snowboard products, boards, boots, and bindings for over 34 years. And has one simple mission, to inspire people to get out and go snowboarding and support their local and global community by supporting the shops, the organizations, and the people who are dedicating their lives to this. Snowboarding is what got us here, and giving back to snowboarding is what keeps us here. The deeper the layers, the better the cake. Just like the snowboarding community, this season Nitro is releasing a two-part film project, Layers, The Unintentional Culture of Snowboarding, a full-length 80-minute documentary exploring the different layers of the snowboard community around the world. First question, Austin. Do you rotate your high backs to match your heel side edge? There's like a speed answer. I mean, as fast as possible. <laughs> yes, he does. Yes, Canute. Um, I do <laughs> rotate my high backs to be in line with my heel side edge. So you just twist them a little bit. Explain why. I don't know why. I think it's from actually Curtis Sorensen. Um, he was a digger with Ooh. me back in the day. At <laughs> High Cascade, and he always had like wicked. He like always battled with shin splints. He was a big shin splints guy, and um, I don't know. I was like 15 at the time, and he was adamant about it. Just like you got to rotate your high backs, or else you get the shin splints. <laughs> and so I did it preemptively to avoid shin splints, and I've been doing it ever since. Okay, would you recommend? Absolutely, whatever Curtis Sorensen does, it's a good idea. <laughs> I don't know about that. Next question, Pashley. What is the best thing a team writer slash athlete can do to create value for the brand? Hard-hitting question. Wear the product. <laughs> Ride a Polaris. 
Uh, what was it again? Best best thing that they can do to be a part of the brand? To create it? value to for create the brand. To create value for the brand. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's probably worth the product. But um, I think working with with the people at the brand is probably the best thing. Like, as long as they're in communication with everybody and they can kind of get their name out there and really work well with other people, I think that's probably the easiest for sure. All right, Melissa, do you think more pros should wear helmets? I always think that's a tough question. It's, I think, a very personal preference. I started wearing a helmet after I had a really bad concussion and had to do a lot of, like, rehab to get my brain back where it needed to be. But I think... uh, it's hard, honestly. Like, yes and no. Like, sometimes it helps. It's like a seatbelt. Sometimes it really helps. Sometimes it doesn't. It's just, it's such a preference of the rider. And if you're going to be, like, not comfortable in your own skin if you're wearing a helmet and you're riding sketchier, like, maybe that's not the route for you. But if you're, like, riding big lines and there's a bunch of rocks and obstacles you can't see under the snow, maybe that's a great option. Like, so I don't really have a full yes or no on that one. I'm taking from that is I'm going to quit wearing seatbelts. Yeah. <laughs> seat belts, oh, yeah. Don't seat belts seat belts. are out. <laughs> Let me tell you something. When you Actually, go in, don't have when, a seatbelt. Do you, you even have a seatbelt? <laughs> when you go in Austin's fire truck, you don't have an option for a seatbelt. So it's very similar. There's barely a floor in that thing. <laughs> Certainly no heat, I can say from experience. And no brake lights at the moment, which yeah. is the sketchiest thing yeah. versus seatbelts. All right, next question. Stan, what's the best-looking hand plant and who has it? Um, so I think my current, this is a tough one. I'm going to go, I'm going to not answer this historically, like ever. I'm going to answer this as a right now. And I think it's, uh, Reed Smith's frontside invert, like revert. Yeah. Back out. That's that, a good that one. Things nice. And he does it in the, the hand plane is a divisive trick to some people. Some people like think it's lesser than, you know, it's like a. Street style metal and X Games, <laughs> like people are like less into it. Um, but I think it's incredible. And Reed, uh, he he does it in legit street spots. I think if you take care and you do it, you do it right. You know, that was him on the big red thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that was nice. All right, this is an all play scenario. Oh, use your buzzers. Get your buzzers ready. Yeah, get get your buzzers ready. All right, we're good. What is your favorite? Guilty snowboard pleasure. And I'm going to give you some examples here from Knut. Grabbing, I guess, is one. Uh, listening to MGMT. That's <laughs> nice. one. Nice. Um, nice. Yeah. Getting first tracks. Skipping rails in the park. Eating too many snacks. That's Those are his examples. Stan. Stan. Uh, I'm going to go with, like, just being eggy towards skiers. Eggy, all right. I like that. Yeah. Elaborate, please. It's like, here's the thing. I don't I don't universally dislike skiers. There's many snowboarders I don't like. You know what I mean? It's not a one thing or the other. But I do gain ever so much satisfaction when you just kind of jab at skiing a little bit. Like, I, I, I have a, a hard time letting that one die. Despite it, I actually don't really care that much. I think it's great. But I it's it's a guilty pleasure of mine for sure. Understandable. Okay, who's up? Austin. Austin was next. Oh, guilty pleasure. That's um, snowboarding and, like, not filming. Just going snowboarding for fun mm. and, like, don't worry about bringing out the phone. Don't worry about filming this. Just go and do tricks. That's a good one. Chris, yes. Yeah. Uh, so I'd like to chime in here. I'm going to go with uh, making fun of turning. Uh, <laughs> really, uh, you know, A, I actually, you know, Cats out of the bag. I, I actually love turning, um, but it's just so fun to make fun of people that hold on to the turn so near and dear and don't ride the park. That's it, name some names. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just look at people that have turned their back on catching air, and they're they're like, a, I'm a t- I just turn now. Names, and, please. Yeah, that's a Louis uh, Vito. No, I think you call it here. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to keep it elusive, but, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, <laughs> Yeah, if you're if you're under forty, you should still be catching air and tomahawking violently. So um, that's that's my take. You want to talk about tomahawking violently? <laughs> We're out in the backcountry yesterday with um, here we fucking go. <laughs> a, a legend, uh, Mikey LeBlanc. Yep. And um, that guy can fucking take a slam still. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Um, flat landing, bodied and unfazed, just like pops up like more life than when he went into it. It was a beautiful thing. <laughs> Dude, and maybe the best thing, too, ever is that, like, as he's going off, 
right as soon as he gets in the air, if he knows he's off, it's immediate, like he's having a full conversation the whole way down. He's like, shit, fuck me. <laughs> it's, like, <you're> like, <laughs> it's impressive. Okay, who's, you guys, this is everyone. So. We're waiting, waiting for a buzzer. Uh, somebody's got to hit a buzzer here. Melissa or Pashley. Um, I think this is my guiltiest pleasure is taking a couple runs. Maybe it's kind of a shitty day and just getting a latte and hanging out in the lodge for a minute. Mm, <laughs> like that. I like that. It's not sugar coated, it's heli time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Burn in the budge. Yeah, burn in that budge. I'm not going to lie. That's a, definitely a guilty pleasure I have for sure. Yes. I love wow. that. That's a good, a good, good question, Kenny. Can you, that was a good one. You know, also a sidebar. I gave Knut about twenty minutes to submit these questions because I forgot to ask because I forgot about the segment. So nice work. Knut. Can we just talk Perfect. about what a workhorse Knut is actually briefly? Like industry tycoon. He's like, I feel like he he does everything. Mm-hmm. He's TMing. He's Instagram. He's commenting boom on every possible. <laughs> And I don't know how his he head is. He's huge. a family yeah. man. He's yeah. got a huge head. <laughs> huge forehead. He's a too. family man. Yeah. That guy is incredible. Arguably, like, well, I don't know, 15 years running of the best team manager snowboarder, best out there. Maybe. Yeah. Best, uh, One of the best riders brand, on Nitro, period. Brand rider. You know, Ika Backstrom should be thrown into this conversation. But yeah. I mean, Canute could take him. Yeah. You think so? We, if we do a game get... of snow between Ika and Canute. In the park? But we, what if we're talking like Step Down and Whistler? You think Kenny's got him covered? Kenny's got him. Canu- <laughs> Ika will maybe, he will persevere with his uh, resilience. Um, but if we're going like within the first three tries, I think Canute uh, will have him. Mm-hmm. Maybe okay. just one more. Maybe just one more. Maybe just one more. Yeah. God. All right. Love Ika. Next question. <laughs> this one's for Austin. What is snowboarding missing right now? Nothing. There's everything in snow. There's. We're good. We're good. Yeah. Um, hating on parts of snowboarding like turning no not like uh don't need to hate on it just like ignore it and go do your own thing like if you don't like something about snowboarding find your lane and chill there because there's mm. something for everyone wow we're trying right. to bring back more beef yeah okay, what kind of beef do we want mm. what's snowboarding missing we'll get that going when we do the bend uh snake craft later. snowboarding's mm. missing which canute actually owns this domain name he like bought this domain name maybe like 10 years in the 10 years ago, with, which was the pentacork.com. Um, so we're still missing yeah. the pentacork, which is what he's expecting to cash in big on that one in uh, 2029, maybe, for the pentacork. So maybe that's what we're missing. <laughs> Good answer. Penta is seven or five, five. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, not that close. far off. Close. Yeah. We'll count it. All right. Next question for Stan. What category do you think is the most influential in direct communication with people who snowboard right now? Brands? Pros or snowboard media? Well, snowboard media, certainly. <laughs> um, where would we be without a paper magazine uh, in this day and age? No. Um, I mean, I want to say it's pros, but realistically, it's brands probably because the brands are the ones making the gear that the pros wear. So, there undeniably, if we didn't have the brands, we wouldn't have the pros. So, I would say. It's got to be the brands, really. Chicken or the egg situation. Yeah. If we didn't have the brands or the pros, then the media would have nothing to talk about. Exactly. So it's all kind of based out of the brands. Based on the brands. All right, Pashley. Never stop exploring. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. What single item should everyone remember to bring to Antarctica? <laughs> I love that now I'm the expert of Antarctica. <laughs> it's crazy. Let's go uh, Ernest Shackleton. Of there is time. a right answer. Oh, I know awesome. there's a right answer. And it's the, <laughs> the toe pin of your split board would probably be the most beneficial one to have. Um, Can I get penguin suit, please? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, the penguin suit actually worked out really well for me and for others actually on that too. So penguin suit would be a good one. I did the last trip we went down. I had five in my board bag. I was really hoping to get like hassled in customs about that, but um, no questions. Yeah. No questions asked. Uh, Wearing the penguin suits was quite miserable, but if it wasn't for Pashley, how much joy it brought him, he was just like pure little kid happiness, and me and Curtis just like, all right, fuck it, let's wear the penguin suits for him. (laughs) (laughs) Let's appease his ass. All right, next question. Melissa, what was your favorite snowboard film from this last season? I like the sequencer a lot this year. Um, Life is Plastic was awesome with all the extra stuff aside from the snowboarding, too. Um... Dorothy, I adored Dorothy so much. Like, Kennedy and Emma just crushed it. Like, that was 
good vibe overall. Those are a few of my faves. There's a lot of good ones this year. All right, top three. Chris, can we get you to post the time you get on the bank slalom at Bombhole Cup? Ooh, this is Oof. good, actually. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah, I would like I'd that. I'd love to I see I mean, that. yeah, I'll set myself up for disaster. Um, Let's see how much you like turns. <laughs> yeah. Uh, get a little side bet going. You know, you know what? You know, I will do that because, you know, people, if, if it brings them joy to know that they're faster than me on a snowboard and I'm not particularly fast, <laughs> and I'm, you know, I'll be, I'll do this selfless act if that's something that they want to see. Last year, Danimals took my bib and got fifth in pro class, so it said like Chris Grenier fifth, and I was really liking that. Cause yeah, maybe not again this year. Bit of a false advertising yeah. situation. Yeah. All right, this is a little follow up question. question from Knut. I got a question on your bank oh, slalom. What no. kind of bank slalom is it? Is it a cap built or hand built? Combination platter. It's a bunch of hand built turns, <laughs> and the bottom is cap built. And this year, uh, Kevin Jones is insistent that we have a box or a rail. Uh, and I think we're going to do it on, on the pro course. We'll probably have a mandatory like box that you have to hit just to really piss off the purists. Yeah. But generally, people like from that. Bend probably aren't going to like that. Yeah, mandatory box. Griffin's not going to like that. Yeah. Oof. <laughs> yep. All right. This is a buzzer situation. I'll play. Who thinks that they could beat Chris's time? Two very confident answers over here on the left. <laughs> Ashley, you think you got me covered? A thousand percent. What? You want to make a little wager on this? Yes. Is he? Uh, what's his skill set on the bank slums? Better than you. you think so? <laughs> Are you going to come to Bomb Hole Cup? You were at my house, weren't you? You saw the duct tape. Oh, he does have duct tape. Yeah, in like what sixty plus like C class. <laughs> Yeah, dude. <laughs> 60 plus C class at Baker is still, yeah. it's going to give you a run for your money. <laughs> I win. You're wearing the, the Polaris gear for a good solid amount of time. I got to wear Polaris. I can't do that. I can't wear Polaris. You have uh, to wear the penguin suit for the rest of the bomb hole cup after he beats you. <laughs> Oh, all right. When is it? When is it? Before I commit to this, but uh, I'm down. April 6th and 7th. Uh, April 6th is the race. That's a Saturday. Oh, yeah, it's kind of like just before uninvited? Yeah, right, the weekend before. Oh, yeah, fucking I right. I'm or there. maybe two weekends before. Yeah, we got a race. Okay. Uh, we'll, we will iron out the details of what the loser has to do. This will be fun. Um, okay, yeah, me versus Pash. This is good. <laughs> All right, next question. This one's for Stan. Who do you regret most calling out on Last Resort? Ooh. Oh. Hard hitting here. Um, well... <laughs> no one really comes to <laughs> mind. <laughs> Honestly, um, I'm sure there's one that I'm not thinking of. I've just made fun of so many people at this point <laughs> that no one really, no one has really stuck out as like, oh my God, that was like a huge mistake. Really? Um, has anyone ever come after you? Marcus ran in a, in a way. Oh, good oh I remember yeah. this. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I don't yeah. regret that. That, I, mm -hmm. I think I did a lot for his I was going to say it was pretty good, <laughs> actually. I, thought. I think that gave him a lot of publicity. Was he was riding high off that, like, for a while. Um, Anyone you wished you would have called out that you haven't? Mm. Good question, Austin. Mm. Um, I have... I think that I'm easy on a, on a lot of people, actually. I think that I'm... You seem to be staring at Austin. Yeah. Shots fired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Austin Smith would be one. No, um, someone I wish I'd called out more. Um, I am genuinely confused about the RFK Junior endorsement coming out of spawn snowboards snowboarders right now. That's a, I haven't really gone there. I didn't go there in last resort though. I considered it, and I don't know enough about his platform to really like. I don't. I don't like to talk shit about something I'm like half and half on, but. It, it does make me feel weird. I am I am confused by that. So maybe that that's my most current one, maybe. All right, we'll take it. Austin, how and where how and where will people buy snowboard gear in ten years? <laughs> I don't think that was a buzzer snowboard. Yes, yeah. Austin. <laughs> how and where will people buy snowboard gear? Probably from the pros directly. Probably from like um, I'm excited for more uh, you know, it's like Facebook Marketplace vibes. I love buying stuff from people. So I don't know, the pro sale from Sendy, from Facebook, from Craigslist. I'm a big Craigslist guy. So uh, everyone's just going to be on Craigslist. I do love seeing Miss Travis Rice throw up a, like a jacket for sale. <laughs> like, like, $18. So funny about that. <laughs> 
All right, Pashley, what's better, pow surfing or snowboarding? Oof. God, for a while, I would go full pow surfing. I was a big Osmo guy for sure. But lately, I've been back on, back strapping in. And I did have a, <laughs> did have a nice little Osmo sesh yesterday where I uh, tomahawked violently as well. But yeah, I got to go. Right now, I'm, I'm going back to snowboarding. Can I add boogie boarding into that? Yeah. Good question. <laughs> we have some Instagram Thank questions you. about yeah. the boogie boarding. Okay, oh, get into later. Good, so don't good, worry about good. that. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, save perfect. save that for later. This <laughs> yeah. is our last question. This is an all play. Buzzers involved, of course. What <clears throat> snowboard shop should the listeners go and shop at this spring season? Ashley, first. I got to go with my boys, Powder Tools and Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Okay. Austin, you were next. I got to go with my guy, Bryce Phillips from Evo. Okay. We're going to go Eastern Border and Milo Sport. Well, you didn't hit the buzzer. Eastern Border Milo Sport. Okay. Um, I'm just going to – Chris did too, so I'm going to have to hit too as well. I would say the Garden in Western Massachusetts and uh, Splinter's Shop in uh, Sugarbush. Respect. Okay, Melissa. Yeah. Yes, Melissa. Um, Probably, you know – Backcountry.com or some of your local shops. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it for Nitro that's Turbo Takes. Nice. That was a good Turbo Takes. <laughs> that was good <laughs> stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I have to. Not do that. Like, <laughs> uh, you know what I'd like to do here for a sec while we got. Uh, you know what? Actually, let's let's rip through some some heater clips. Uh, not a, not a. There's a lot that probably happened, but only a couple that I remembered. Um, one we got to talk about is, I think his name's Yuki Omura, a Japanese writer. He did a line uh, down a face, took his shirt off, and then launched a triple front flip, which is embodies the energy of... He didn't land, but the energy of the clip. But he is a, like, is a was, baker maker. He was close. I yeah, call, like, I call was, that a make. Yeah. yeah. It gave me a feeling. And that's... It just, just kind of gets you fired up. That's what he likes. I live for that, because that is a... I mean, a, you know, a, a guy who is doing that literally just to do it. You know, there's no spot. Like, he's not trying to appease his sponsors. He's not trying to, like, progress something. He just pops top, hits, like, a triple. And is, yeah, a legend. Really. I describe that as showmanship. Yes, yeah. Like, again, you talk about Mikey LeBlanc. He's a, he's a, he wrote the goddamn rule book on showmanship, you know? Great stuff. Uh, another thing we could talk about, pro skater uh, John Shanahan has been snowboarding, taking the internet by storm. Um, this is grab game, looking really good. He's in the streets. He's hitting handrails. He's hitting mail. He's hitting uh, mailboxes and stuff. And He's nice on the snow skate, too. Mm-hmm. If, if you've seen his snow skate, he, had, he like that? put a couple of things at, out at uh, oh, Zoomies. Zoomies. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was gnarly. That was crazy. And then uh, the last person that we have on here, his name is Burke Rudd, I believe, and he's a professional skier. Yeah. And he started snowboarding, and he's better than me. He's better than... Uh, all of us. Pretty much everybody. Is he kind of the new Sean Pettit? Well, he's, like, doing <laughs> slope-style yeah, runs. No. So, like, back okay. 10 double melons and stuff. No way. Yeah. He's insane. He does, like, He posted a run where I think he did, like, board slide under flip, like, 630. To oh, like one of my favorite tricks. <laughs> <laughs> one of my, like, just a classic. It's just feel good. One I always dream about yeah. doing. Yeah. <laughs> and then he does like a nine and then a back ten double melon. And and it's just unbelievable. So. I know. I kind of want to know, like, what do you, why are you still skiing is my real main that's question. That's a good point. Come Stan. on over. That's a, you good, know? that's a good point. Does he like poles? Is that part of it? In both ways, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I felt like I was riding pretty high. I did a backflip on skis, thought I was trolling him pretty good. Joke's on me. Yeah. He's trolling us. He is. He's good. I wonder if he snow. Did he snowboard in hard boots? You think? That's a. You know, we should d- dig in a little deeper with that. That's good another stuff. kid. There's this kid Connor Kelly that has a mean rainbow rail that I just saw lately too. Mm. True. True yeah. story. Mm. And then while we're talking about NBDs, you talk about it briefly. Um, there's a new campaign for an NBD that Sean posted. Uh, Stan, maybe Stan, maybe you can sink your teeth into this one. Yeah. Um, just a really kind of intense video. Um, Sean White kind of, you know, claiming first. He's got a little ninja blender, I think. And he, you know, he gets his smoothie elements going. And then he starts blending it and just rockets a front flip off a jump. And the text is like, first ever front flip with a blender. <laughs> <laughs> Which is crazy. Because, like, you got to figure that Tommy Gesme always assumed he was going to have the closest connection to blender in yes. the snowboard industry but then sean white can't let the street kids have anything That's apparently 
That's so. a great take. You know, for whatever bag he secured, I'd be front flipping with blenders too. I'll tell oh you yeah, much. let the record show. I I'll do a lot for him. Yeah. Whatever he got paid to do that. Yeah. I'm not hating on that. It was just really funny. All right, let's talk about Blackstrap. Now I've been testing some of their products lately. They sent some stuff to the bomb hole. And let me tell you, they make some high-performance base layers, beanies, balaclavas, and more. Recently tried out the Blackstrap Summit base layers on a full day hiking around the backcountry. We were getting sweaty. It was cold. And I was really impressed. They're breathable. They're stretchy. They're quick drying. Good base layers are key for staying warm and comfortable in the mountains. And they are worth investing in. I wear base layers every time I go ride. So great base layers are absolutely crucial and Blackstrap makes some really high-quality ones. So check them out. Also, I was impressed with their balaclavas. As you know, I wear a helmet these days, new to that game, and I love the fit under the helmet. So if you're looking for a great under-the-helmet balaclava, be sure to check out bsbrand.com, and you can use promo code BOMBHOLE for 20% off your order. Again, that's bsbrand.com, promo code BOMBHOLE, 20% off your order. They also recently came on board to sport Bombhole Cup, as well as our Woodward Dust Bomb Ride Day. So support brands that support snowboarding and check out bsbrand.com and use promo code BOMBHOLE for 20% off your order and get yourself looking fresh out there on the hill. All right, we got a quick update from Icon Pass. The good times are stacking up with the 2425 Icon Pass. It's on sale now. Drop in on the 50-plus destinations, spring's lowest prices, plus limited time savings on child passes and renewal discounts. Pro tip, buy now, ride now with immediate access up to nine mountains and a total of up to 16 by early April. From $259 adult, claim your pass to the good times today. All right, on the line, we got Mike Cox from Burton calling in now uh mike i'd love for you to explain what your role has been for the past 25 years over at burton yeah it's kind of funny because it's over 30 now and nobody knows it's been so long and no one knows um when i started which is kind of funny but um it was back in the original rep hire days so i did sales for 25 years out of michigan in the midwest area and then I was Jake's right-hand person for five years, and we traveled the world together and visited dealers and shops and resorts, which was an amazing, amazing time. And then now I work in the marketing department under brand marketing and do some events like Deer Rider and Mystery Series, Culture Shifters, and then um, some other stuff. Amazing. So, yeah, it's been a fun, long ride and still going Killer. Well, I'd love to hear you elaborate on what's going on with this uh, this ride for Jake Day situation. Yeah, it's it, it's it's an annual event, basically to celebrate Jake's legacy and um, you know his motto of have as much fun as possible. But it's got some kind of cool roots, and you know he rode a hundred days a year, which is amazing, and it's a chance for us to take one day a year to to celebrate the community that he built and get out on the mountain together. And it's a, it's a global thing now. It's pretty cool. Yeah. What resorts is this popping off at? Well, this year it's over 60 resorts worldwide and there's 33 in North America, 11 in Europe, which includes Italy and Switzerland and Germany. And there's 13 in Japan, four in China. And then, also, we kind of encourage people just to go no matter where you are and get out on the mountain and um, and think about Jake. Killer. So so break down what happens for these these days to honor Jake that, that are happening all around the world. Like what, what do they look like at each resort? Um, there's some similarity. Like we we made a kit that includes a flag and some other fun stuff. Um, and then we support the resorts with um, – with a bunch of cool stuff. So we kind of promote it regionally as well as internationally. And then when people show up, we have a meetup spot. There's usually a DJ. Um, some of our other partners have been very generous with Underberg or Red Bull or some other stuff to, to get the crowd going. But 
basically we just all meet up, tell some stories, and then at some point everyone gets to the top of the mountain. We do a a little cheers of Underberg and then ride down together. And it it becomes like a a downhill extravaganza. It's pretty funny. Um, we just kind of take over a whole whole zone, and it's a lot of a lot of happy people. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, huge kudos to to honoring Jake's legacy with this whole thing. And I have to say, I've been a part of a few of these laps for Jake. You know, I, I was at last call a couple of years ago, and and I think it was maybe Alex Cack or somebody had the flag, and you got a hundred people at the top, maybe more. And when everybody's just rushing the mountain, the energy, everybody's close, packed in, slashing each other, flying down the hill. It's it's a beautiful thing to honor Jake's legacy in that way. So highly encourage anybody to get out there. So, uh, and and what day exactly is it? Um, this year it's March 16th. And we the first year we did it, the 13th, which is the 13 is a big Jake number and um it, it the saturday fell on a 13th so we we try to do as close to march 13th as possible so this year it's on the 16th yeah i've, I've heard there's a great story of mickle riding with the flag well actually the mickle thing is funny he um I, you know there's sometimes humor in sad situations and it was jake's wake right after he died at, at their house. And it turned into a, a party, as Jake would be stoked on. So I was talking to Mickle, who's kind of like a son to me, and he said, what are we going to do? Jake's gone. And I said, we have to carry his flag and you know, in his memory. And, and he said, where is this flag? I will carry it now. I will be the first one to carry it through this party. And I kind of chuckled, and I was like, Mickle, I'm you know, speaking figuratively but I, you know i like this flag idea so when we designed the first event we we made those flags and they're a big part of um of the whole thing it's pretty cool like you, you've seen it and to see those flags ripping down the hill and kids carrying them or dave downing or nickel or whoever it's um it's a, a pretty big part of the the show Absolutely. And we also, we on set have one of the foam uh, middle fingers, the Ride for Jake middle fingers. Are those going to be in circulation? Oh, yeah. And it's funny because we came up with the idea, you know, half of us were super stoked and the other half were like, well, people get it. And Donna did a nice little disclaimer that we sent out to the resorts on how the middle finger is a term of endearment, starting with Jake and then throughout the whole company. And it's funny because when we hand them out, like some of the resorts will say no. Other ones that get it will say yes, hand them out, but don't have our employees do it. And um, I always get a kick out of seeing them, um, again, like in the background of your set or just random in people's offices or hills or cars or whatever. But it's a, if you see it, don't be offended. Mm -hmm. And that's beautiful thing because what would Jake want? That's it. Have as much fun as possible, yeah. Love that. About Jake's legacy, uh, I heard that Stowe did a cool thing to honor his legacy. Yeah, it was really beautiful. Um, the One of the stops on the first organized day for Jake, um, Lullaby Lane was his favorite run, and him and Donna shared, and family shared many laps there, as we all do. So after the event, I think they were so taken by it that they they renamed the run Jake's Ride. So there's a cool sign right on the hill, and you know you always go by and give it a high five when we cruise. But that'll be there forever. One thing would be cool while we got you on the line is we just tee up, you know, why it's important to honor Jake's legacy. I think that's important for our listeners to know. You know, I, it strikes home for me. <clears throat> you know, you, you hear things about the culture or the community, and I think the snowboard community is real, and I think Jake had a big thing to do with that. And I look at, in my tenure with Burton and people that have come through Burton, and, you know, we may have left on good terms or bad, but the friendships have stayed. Um, people still shred and, and have gone on to do beautiful things. And um, I think that's what really strikes home. And when, 
when we show up in the mountain and you have people that don't know what we're doing and they'll they'll ask and they'll be curious like what's going on and you'll hear you know parents telling their kids who jake was and then you'll have people saying can i hop on this train and it's you know skiers and newbies and and all sorts of people and just seeing the smiles and and the friendships and the relationships that are developed through Jake and through snowboarding is, I think that's a big part of it. Love that. That's perfect. Well, Mike, uh, I got to ask for, I'm sure our listeners are wondering how can they get involved? Where can they find information where it's happening? Is there somewhere we can direct them for this uh, ride for Jake day? Yeah, absolutely. Um, on the burn website, it says, I always say ride for Jake day, but it's a day for Jake, a day for Jake. But if you, yeah, day for Jake, and if you plug that in, it'll pop up some information about the event, but also all the participating resorts and um, and steer you in the right direction. Well, that's perfect. Well, Mike, thank you so much for calling in. Uh, again, going to encourage all of our listeners to check out a day for Jake at their local resort and honor Jake's legacy because he did so much for the snowboard community. Cheers, man. All right. Thanks for calling in. Appreciate it, Mike. Okay. Bye now. All right. Uh, let's point the lens over at Austin here for a second. Uh, I think we should start by talking. You know, we have, we have no product talk. We have no product talk. Normally, we like to interview somebody that's like in the product division at somewhere. So maybe we could talk about you've been designing boards from the ground up uh, with Season. And what does it look like when you go into the design process of designing a board? I know you're working with Tonino right now and making a new shape. Uh, tell us about it. Um, yeah, it's been fun this last week. Uh, it's kind of been a dream come true for me to be able to work with Tonino again. Um, and we've just been in his garage just freaking taking some sawzalls and some uh, jigsaws and some uh, other Milwaukee tools, hashtag Milwaukee, and designing a new snowboard. And I don't know, you just like pick apart what you like about one snowboard, try about a bunch of others. We went to Interlude earlier this year, me and Tonino, and just kind of like demoed as many boards as we possibly could, and you kind of pick them apart and take little tidbits of different elements. It's just like a, it's like a poke bowl. Elaborate what you, what you're looking, rice. what are you looking for in a board? What am I looking for in a board? Um, nothing too stiff. Um, something that's fun, something that makes you just have a good time, I guess. Um, part of it's a good stance. Like, I think that's a big part of what makes a good snowboard is how your, how your feet are on it. So, and then with the design process, like, are you, are you cognizant of different cores that make different flexes and yeah. things like that? Yeah. That's been a bit, huge learning curve, you know, with, uh, Nitro made a lot of boards with the Quiver series for eight plus years, like had the opportunity to design a lot of stuff, but never got as deep to like the factory level. And with season, I've been going to the factory and, and just seeing like everything that actually goes into the snowboard and then just doing it like a more DIY approach in Tonino's garage. It's just like, yeah, you just like break it down and see that it's just a bunch of stuff glued together and you can try anything. It's been fun. What about side cut? Yeah, side cut. There's any options. What do you What are you looking for in a side cut? Do you want something aggressive where you can rail a turn, or do you want something that's predictable and straight? Right now, I'm working on more of a dual degressive, so it's like real tight in between your feet, and then it kind of fades out on the tip and tail, so it's not too grabby. Because everything has a trade off. If you do a super tight side cut, then you end up with like these massive tips and tails, and so then you have like mega swing weight, and it's a uh, can be kind of grabby, and so you're trying to bridge the best of both worlds there. Cool. I like that. And then uh, for season, I know we talked about it on another podcast, but the concept graphically, I think, is really interesting. It would be cool to touch on that again. Mm -hmm. It's just to, like, question how long you use a snowboard. I've, like, asked tons of pro snowboarders this. Uh, when we were starting season, I, like, called up as many people as I could and be like, how many days do you think a snowboard is good for? Um, the most alarming answer I got from, uh, I think it was Matt Cummins that I called, Temple Cummins' brother, who maybe has the longest running pro model. And he told me, uh, he's like, oh, like, no more than six days. And I was like, <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I guess you should be freaking buying a lot of boards. But I just, uh, I think people should use a snowboard to the end of its life cycle. And I think most snowboards are good for about 100 days. And, and I think, unfortunately, a lot of people just, like, feel guilted into buying new snowboards because they're on the, the wrong colorway or last year's graphic. But 
Um, it's like the most sustainable thing we can do with any product, whether it's snowboards or outerwear or trucks, just use it to the end of its life cycle. And that might be like a 1953 fire truck, you know, just keep using that thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, exactly. No heat, no problem. No seatbelts, no problem. Keep no using heat, it. No problem. Uh, and then let's talk about, we talked about in Curtis's episode, you guys all went to Antarctica. Uh, you made a movie called Endurance or Endurance 2. Um, two. Endurance 2. And, uh, you know, the thing that's convenient about this video is I was looking it up to watch it on the internet. <laughs> and I was like, you know, these guys are coming on the show. I ought to give this thing a watch. <laughs> um, and I noticed it's, you can't find it. Um, seems like a good ROI from, a, you know, making a movie perspective. I'd love to hear you guys elaborate on that. Um, yeah, endurance too. It was like a dream come true to try to go to Antarctica and Jake Price. He's getting pretty old. His like body's mm-hmm. really shutting down, and so I wanted to give him this last uh, dream trip. And he had a creative vision and wanted to uh, get him to Antarctica. And part of his vision was to make something that never went on the internet. He kind of hates Instagram, which I I think is cool. It's his own its own thing. And so he made a video completely um, not handheld, but by hand. So he filmed it with film. He hand developed it. He hand edited it. The film only exists on one reel, and then we put it on projector and projected it events. Um, and it's just kind of like a thing. He loves partying, really. And so it's like a way to get people to a party. And so yes. it's like, if you don't come to the party, you don't get to see the movie. And because uh, a lot of premieres now are kind of tricky, where it's like, it's almost better to watch the movie at your house the day after the premiere online when you're on your own couch and you can actually see the thing and can actually hear it. Um, but he just wants people to party together. So he's uh, doing in person events only. The now, piano okay. element as well. <laughs> Uh, and it was, it was like was cool. I'd like to bring yeah. It was a whole experimental exper- you know. It, it was, was a self playing piano that played the soundtrack. Mm-hmm. Which we were trying to get Scott Sullivan to play the piano. We we're gonna like fly Scott out and he was gonna like play the piano at the first event that we did. And Scott was busy and we we're like, Well, that doesn't work and then Jake found a self playing piano for like fifty bucks online and it turned out to be pretty sweet. Nice. How was it getting that in the venue? Super yeah, chill. nice. It was about a 1,500-pound <laughs> piano. That was great to uh, move around. <laughs> and then we did an event up in Ogden, and, uh, yeah, Jake Jake comes from, like, a history of uh, used car salesmen, mm-hmm. and uh, he ended up selling the piano to the venue. Made a profit, so wow. I was okay. a true car salesman. Wow. Now, Pashley, you were on this trip, correct? I was. Yep. Now, did, um, did North Face support this trip? <laughs> in kind of a roundabout way. So okay. this happened before I actually started at North Face. But, um, yeah, leading up to it, because I had been once before, Austin had seen some photos and stuff. He was super interested in it. We started talking about it over the summer. He's like, you think it could make it happen? I was like, yeah, we could probably, like, connect it up. And um, Doug and the crew at Ice Axe uh, Expeditions, they really helped out. And they're, they're out of, like, Tahoe. So they, they kind of pulled some stuff together for us and helped er- everything there, too. But um, And so we were like, yeah, maybe we can make it happen. And Austin's like, yeah, what do you think? And I was like, dude, there's an end at this point. I was working at Smart Wool still. And I was like, dude, there's no way that we can make a Smart Wool trip out of this. It's not happening. Like, we've got to figure out how else to do it. And so uh, the joke was I had never seen Austin, like, work so hard. There were, like, decks coming out and everything. It was basically a GoFundMe <laughs> to get us all down there. And so that's kind of how we ended up raising the money. So it was, like, pulling in money from a bunch of different brands and stuff like that. So, yeah. And so North Face technically was a part of it. Okay. But, yeah. right, Some like of the brands were a little bit confused. That's what, that's what I was guessing. Yeah, was it was a little, <laughs> yeah, and me as a brand guy, then when the video and everything was coming out, Jake's like, yeah, it's not going online anywhere. And I'm like, oh. And then everybody's hitting me up. They're like, man, how do we see this? I was like, yeah, you don't. Like, you can't, like, unless you go to the actual thing. But also, then after seeing it, I'm like, yeah, this would not make sense at all. If you watched it, like, on your phone or anything, you'd be like, what the hell are these idiots doing? Like, what were they doing down there? But when you, like, actually go and they're projecting the movie onto the sail of a boat and there's, a like, like, a piano there and then we did a whole, like, art show kind of thing behind it, too, like, blew up a bunch of stuff from Jake's um, scans off the um, 16 film and then did a bunch of, like, my prints, like, on super nice, like, glossy paper and whatnot, then it kind of, like, became this whole thing, and everybody was pretty fired up on that part of it. But, yeah, if you didn't go to the whole thing, like, if you just watched it on YouTube or something, you'd be like, yeah. this is crazy. Oh, it seems like a great return on investment for a brand. I, I, definitely, <laughs> definitely. I mean, the question is, yeah, I mean, only, I don't know, probably a 1,000 people saw it um, versus however many people would have watched it on YouTube, maybe, like, 1,200 then. Um, so we missed out on about 200 views, but uh, I think for the thousand people that were there, um, it was like a impactful experience. And maybe. There, there was a goal to do the first ever 900 in Antarctica, right? 
That was what I put on the pitch deck to try to get some funding for it. <laughs> yeah. It was kind of like Sean White doing like, I'm, it's hard to find a first these days. And so he was trying to do the first front flip with a blender or whatever. Right. And I was like, I don't have the tricks to do the first 2,400 or the pentacork. Um, so I was like the first 900 in Antarctica. Maybe it's already been done. I don't know. But So how did that – just walk us through that because I heard the jump was a uh, real you piece heard of about work. the jump. Yeah, yeah. it's the worst jump I've ever built in my life. <laughs> <laughs> but we were fucking desperate, all right? I was like, I got to at least try this thing. I put it on the deck. I, I told people I'm going to do the first 900, so I got to at least give it a college try. And, yes, yeah, so we built a absolute terrible jump. And, uh, yeah, chuck some carcass. I love it. Wow. All right. So let's rip through um, some Instagram questions here. Um, this one's from Metstomatic on Instagram. Uh, Varmin, can yeah, you talk about bo- boogie boarding? <laughs> <laughs> right. Question, boogie boarding. Yeah, the boogie boarding is a hot topic, and there's a lot of people that think I'm actually a boogie boarder, but um, it actually takes pl- uh, the story takes place with Austin, oddly enough. And uh, we were doing these trips. We were up in Tofino, British Columbia, and Austin was there, Curtis was there, Brian Fox, and then this trail runner kid, Paul Hamilton. And, uh, you know, I'm always, like, laughing about the surfing thing, like, where they're always running into the water, and there's always they're always doing so many stretching and stuff on the beach and just, like, flexing out and whatnot, and then they're running everywhere, and I just always think it's super funny. So then as we were picking up all these boards and whatnot, they're like, oh, you want to take this, like, neon green boogie board? And I was like, yeah, let's do this. We're going to film this, a funny skit, me making fun of this shit. And so the day we chose to go out there was this crazy seas were rough scenario, like storming, just choppy, crappy, crazy water and everything. We're filming this whole thing. I don't have any flippers or anything. I go running off into the ocean. They're like, oh, yeah, Pash, just jump in there. The the um, rip current or what's the – yeah, rip the current. Rip. We'll the take rip you will take you out. Like just get out there. We'll get you in the line and we'll get a catch a couple of ways. I was like, yeah, no fucking problem. Like easy, okay. So I get in there and then all of a sudden I see them all waving at me and I'm like, what are they waving at? And I finally get back to them and they're like, dude, you were getting sucked to sea. Like I was just getting ripped out in the middle of nowhere. And I finally get in and it's kind of crazy and whatnot, just super blowing and whatever. And so I catch one wave and start coming in and it just pushes me back into the rip and I just start getting sucked back to the ocean. And I'm like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. I'm about to die right now. And so I turn and there's this one rogue wave that just like comes up and I'm right near the, like the jetty of Cox Bay and Chesterman's, I think it is in Tofino. And this <laughs> wave takes me up and I go full starfish <laughs> into the rocks, just like, <laughs> and grab onto the rocks and then they just like climb up the rocks. And I'm so beat down and worked at this point. And I'm basically like in direct, like parallel line to all these guys out in the lineup. And all they can see is like me over the rocks, but then this neon green boogie board hanging from my arm, just <laughs> bashing against the rocks. And I just got stood up and walked in. And I don't think I've been in the ocean <laughs> since. <laughs> the guy was looking like a beached whale Dude, out it was there. crazy. <laughs> and so then it just became this huge joke that I have this big boogie boarder. And I'm, obviously I like it. So I go, I've gone along with it. And the best is, is that like, like actual, boogie boarding, that is. Yeah, actual boogie boarders. Because I'll post stuff and whatnot that people send me and everything. And I was like, oh, man, I probably should have just held on to the rail a little longer. And then I have actual people, like, giving me tech tips. Like, oh, oh man, if you just, like, held on there a little bit longer and picked up on the left and pressed down on the left, you'd really pull into that barrel. And I was like, these fucking people think I'm seriously a boogie boarder? <laughs> so, so, yeah, I'm kind of down. Thanks for putting the boogie boarding community on your back. Yeah, yeah. holding it down for me. I appreciate that. Um, this is an uh, interesting one. Q-Tip Tom, he wants to know... Talk about the Dubai Big Air getting canceled. Uh, obviously, I don't know if everybody's seen that on the internet. There was a big air event in Dubai. Saudi Arabia. Yeah, Saudi Arabia. Or, or it says, oh, okay, yeah, Saudi Arabia. My bad. I'm, and it is. Uh, it was a big scaffolding jump, and there was warm temps, and uh, the sand blew everywhere, and they canceled it. It looked like an absolute disaster of an event, and uh, very made ripples through the industry. People are very unhappy about the, yeah. the Big Air. Yeah, I mean, I think there's actually been jokes about Saudi money coming into the into snowboarding and how we we need it as kind of like a like that'll never happen. And when I heard about this event, I was pretty shocked. It seems just like a pretty general lack of planning there. I'm surprised. It must be hard to say no to the government <laughs> there because like I'm sure any normal person would have been like, "So let me get this straight." You want to build a scaffolding jump outdoors in Saudi Arabia when it's 90 degrees out? Like, yeah, no, I'm sure that'll work out great. Like, <laughs> you know, so, I mean, it's a shame. I, yeah, Saudi Arabia, I don't know as much as some of the, I'm sure, internet community about what's going on in Saudi Arabia and, and why there was an uproar about potentially supporting uh, 
you know, that nation in a way, and I'm sure there's validity to that. But um, it's been done in the past, though, like an outdoor, a hot outdoor big air event, you know, so it's not unheard of. I did like where s- at? Like Aaron Style in LA, right? Wasn't that hot? I did one in San Francisco back in 2006. Yeah. It Giant almost, stadium. Uh, it was freaking a scorcher out there. It reminds me, like, back in the day when they talk about, you know, like, in the 90s, there was, like, I was talking to Dirksen the other day on the phone, and he was talking about how big air contests, you know, people would show up, and the, it would be the shittiest jump you've ever seen. And Remember that? Yeah, the X Games summer. There was a summer X Games big air, like, in the streets of San Francisco. Ben Hinckley, I think, yeah. won with a probably a double fronty. Um, maybe single fronty. Hard to say if you don't know. Yeah. There's a sick photo of that, like Golden Gate Bridge behind him, or Bay Bridge maybe. But I think the ski event is still on. Is that true? I think the skiers hit it, yeah. I'm not sure. I don't have too much more intel on that. Um, I know that, like, Sven, like, I think Sven was the only rider to even try. To, and he didn't even go off the lit, but he, like, slid down. But, yeah, if you – I don't know if we can, like, add photos to this, but their photos, like – are insane. Like, s- literally, like, six inches of sna- sand blew in on the whole oh. thing. Oh, crazy. Yeah. Me and Grindy's were uh, snowmobiling right before it, and we saw Tanner Hall in the parking lot randomly, and he was, like, leaving early, and he was like, I'm on my way to, I gotta head over to Saudi Arabia to have announce some big air. I'm getting paid to show up. I don't know if he, he wants to know his, yeah. uh, <laughs> his, uh, his announcing fee, but, uh, yeah, hopefully he still got paid. Seems like a good opportunity to s- Photoshop Sam Taxwood onto that jump. Though. Oh, wow. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that's Yeah, that's consider that done. Um, was it right. working before the sand blew in, though? Like, was, I don't do think, they have snow? I think they had a chance to hit it before that. Yeah, I don't think, so. I don't think anyone got that far. Yep. So, uh, all right, this is a, n- a good question um, from Tyler Cotts. Who are the upcoming youth and how do the next generation of riders get their name? Go ahead. <laughs> um, I was just on a trip with Rube Goldberg, who's like kind of the mayor of uh, the mayor of Whistler. You got to hit the ledge. Yeah, you got to hit that. And he was like, uh, I've never seen him so excited about a youth before. He's he's an old head for sure, but he was really selling truth. truth oh yeah, Smith. he's a ripper. Truth, truth is Smith. a ripper. Yep. Mm. So I don't know. Rube says truth. Mm-hmm. I like that kid Oyvind as well. Oh, he's yeah. Like, he's got some chops. He was uh, doing double backflips on skis I saw on Instagram, too. Sorry, continue. Oyvind, bro. <laughs> I think Stop. That's a, that's a flex. <laughs> I like that. Uh, Joey Fava was just on a tear at Red Bull Heavy Metal. Backflip. He's he's on the come up heavy. I mean, Austin Viz, they're already here. I don't know if they're up and coming, but uh, those. All the rail girls, too, like Iris, Egan, Jalen. Yeah, yeah, Iris is crazy. Like, man. that side of it's going off. Yeah. Egan on a tear, Jalen's rail skills, bar none. Then you got, yeah, um, uh, who'd you say? Iris Fam. Yeah, Iris. Yeah. All of them have such yeah. good style, Hundy too. Hundy as well. Hundy's. Yeah, Hundy. I love, I love her part. I have a new answer. Yep. Because um, I got to support my Ben boys. But there's, like, really, like, not many youth that are, like, getting into snowmobiling and learning that whole side of things. Like, there's a lot of rail kids and park kids, but there's not many, like, up and coming backcountry kids, and there's these three out of bend: um, Kai Huggin, his homie Griff, and then Hayden McAllister, who's Jason McAllister's son. But it's just sweet to see them. They like go to the mountain, and then after the mountain, they go snowmobiling every day just to like learn that skill set. And me and Curtis went out with uh, Kai specifically last year, and he was like so on point, more prepared than me and Curtis were. And uh, it's just cool to see those kids that are just like taking the backcountry side of things seriously at a young age and just uh, owning the sled skills. We'd also be remiss not to at least throw a bad boy Noah. Oh, bad boy Noah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah. I'm the table for he's going nuts out there. Absolutely. But the second part was like, what? What's the second part? Uh, what do the next generation of riders do to get their name? I think it's TikTok dances. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the key. A solid fit, a couple TikTok dances, and a uh, clip cut. And uh, you're on North Face. <laughs> yeah, Pash, you got anything to add to that? What can they do? I mean, God, I hate to say it, but I mean, the social thing is such a big part of it, right? Like, I mean, love it or hate it, it's it's here. It's not going anywhere, I don't think. So I think that's a big piece of the pie. Um, and then it's really, I, I mean, it's, you know, it's such a joke. It's like not who you know or not what you know, it's who you know. And it's just getting your name out there and like getting, you know, put in the right situations and everything like that. And I think, you know, like, they were just mentioning Kai Huggin, but um, 
you know, he ended up on a trip that I was on too. And I was like, oh, wow, like this kid is, and I would never have known who he was, but these guys had like brought him around and I was like, oh man, this kid is really good. So yeah, it's kind of like that sort of scenario, I think. Okay. Snowmobile skills. I want to see the, uh, you talk about a bit like who's the greatest uh, snowboard snowmobiler at times. Yeah. Um, I think there's a big opportunity for the greatest female snowmobiler in the game. And so I think someone should uh, aim for that. And and Curtis Cizik of snowmobiling or of snowboarding? Of snowmobiling for females. Yes. Yeah. Well, and I'm not like sure pretty right who it is right now. I still have a lot to learn. Like you, prefacing that, <laughs> I have so much to learn. But have you seen any if, female goat snowmobilers? Snowboarders? Oh, I got one. Um, Beeman. I haven't ridden, ridden with Beeman, but I've. Amanda Hankinson, she's the one that kind of took me under her wing and taught me. She's like pretty nasty on it. Mm. And then Madison's been ripping too. And, you know, if Skidoo's looking for any girls, <laughs> I'm really looking for the Polaris. Like, no offense, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm really on Team Skidoo. <laughs> um, yeah, I heard, um, I've heard Marie France. Wa- Reference Roy is pretty nasty on it, but honestly, Haley Langland is like a wizard. I bet, and, and I think she weighs like sixty-four yeah. pounds, sopping wet, and but she freaking dominates that snowmobile. Leanne too. I went out with yeah, Leanne Leanne's once. Good too. She was actually, I think she was like six months pregnant, and she was still like just handling biz. And I was like, respect. Sidebar: I think uh, one thing to note about the duels: Jamie Anderson and Leanne, both new moms. Fucking badass, ripping. They got their kids in the mix. They're kissing their baby before they go fuck shit up on, on hill. Love to see it. Um, all right, I'm gonna change gears here into a question that's gonna segue into a snake draft. Uh, this is from Trenchtown B on Instagram. Ben versus Salt Lake Beef. Glory days on Yo Beat. Uh, I think they're still alive. There's still beef happening, right? Would you say Austin's for oh, Ben? Yeah. He could speak on this. <laughs> yeah, I kind of feel guilty. I've been in Salt Lake a bit this year. I'm gonna be losing some street cred from back home. Yeah. Yeah. I like this. Well, I think what we should do is do a snake draft. Do you guys know what a snake draft is? No. I don't really I know. Don't I just really. did my first fantasy football thing. Yep. I well, lost. Well, Pashley's an ultra runner, so he definitely doesn't know what a snake draft is. He's into more of fitness than real sports. So how it would work <laughs> is we all get picks. You can't repeat yourself. So, so, and how it works is if Pashley gets first pick, then Austin would get second. I get third. Stan gets fourth. Okay. And then yeah. uh, Melissa will get fifth, and then Melissa goes again. So she gets five and six, mm. and then it comes back this way. So that way you don't get one and then six. It, it kind of balances the swing of your picks, right? Okay. So we're going to do top three people from Bend, um, just kind of as humans, uh, your favorite people from Bend, Snake Draft, um, Austin's from Bend, so this is going to be awkward for him. Um, why don't, Melissa, why don't, you, why don't you take the reins with P1? Um, let's see. I mean, we can run through some names just to kind of get them out there, too. We got, you know, uh, Jake Price. We got the Ferguson brothers. We got Curtis. We got Austin. Um, we got Dirksen. We got McAllister. You got Travis Yamada. Yamada. Mm-hmm. Pete yeah. Alport. We're going we're gonna to take ownership over Mason. Mason Jar. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, Big Air Jar, I'd say, kind of falls into the category, even though he's from Montana, I believe. Fun fact I learned right, right before I came on the show, Jared, uh, Jared Elston's dad hit me up, and he's like, uh, little fun little thing is uh, Melissa and Jared grew up together, snowboarding for the same shop and riding the same hill we back did. in the day. We ah. did. No way. In Montana? Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, elaborate on that. Yeah. Um, I, it was a shop called Big Sky Board Sports, and... Jared was like a grom. I think he was like eight years old when I was growing up. I can't remember, but I would always see him and his brother Jonah just like skiing and boarding up there. And Simon owned the shop actually, and he was he was awesome. <laughs> like so many good memories from all those guys. He's the warden. He's the best. <laughs> he is the best. He's rad. That is the Elfin big shout out to father. Sean Simon. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Give him an air horn. <laughs> all right. Um, go ahead. I'm, I'm starting with Jared. I mean, Jared, Jared. I grew up with him. First like, round draft right. pick. Wow. Jared he's like, he's just, wow. just best and stuff up back there, too. That's huge. All right, Stan. Uh, easy first pick for me is going to be Jake Bryce. Fuck! He's uh, a <laughs> quad, quadruple threat, penta threat. The guy can drink, he can sled, he can film. It's a no brainer. Yeah, I mean, also, like, maybe just so for the people that know, like, movies he's been a part of to fill in the listener. Um,. I mean, well, it started with December in the what we talked about. I mean, honestly, Austin's probably the best 
to go off on it. I don't want to mess this up. Okay. <laughs> I mean, he, he's filmed for Robot Food yeah. and filmed with Pierre for a ton of stuff. He made uh, 9191, which is one of the most iconic videos. A lot of the Vulcan stuff that we've seen. Uh, Endurance 2. Endurance 2, yep. Not okay. to be forgotten. Yeah. R77. Yeah. Uh, pioneer of snowboard filming and legend. So uh, my, my P1, uh, I'm going to go Curtis Cizek. Uh I know it's unfortunate. Mm. He switched to Polaris. <laughs> I'm heartbroken by it. Um you know, still still processing, but um, his outlook on life, his general uh, vibe, and him as a human is going to be my uh, is why he's P one. Um, I'm going to have to go Drew Brown rigging. Wow. wow. Um, yep. He's arguably the greatest snowboarder in Oregon, and kind of a uh, he's kind of almost like Jed Anderson in a sense, where I think Jed's like too good for his own good. Everything just comes too easily for him, and Drew has that going on for him too, where he's just like, I don't know, I'll just go do like a. 30 foot McTwist off this little natural hip and is it a big deal? Yeah, I did a first try and he's impressive. Okay. I'm going G for Gabe Ferg. Oh, mm. great pick. Yeah. Um, just love Gabe. He's so funny. Like he was, they just did a stint out in Jackson while I was there and these guys all came out and it was just super funny. Like Gabe was just chilling and cruising around with us and following around all the kind of old heads, everybody farting around in the back country and then he'd just be like, all right, maybe I'll, they'd kind of pressure him into hitting it and then he would just go and just do like, some like the best trick of the day type thing, and then he'd just go back and sitting on the snowmobile, <laughs> just like k- kicking it hard. So, yeah, Gabe Ferg. Uh, you gotta go. No, oh, now I go again. Go back to yeah. back snakecraft. Oh, dude, I'm going with the brothers. I'm going Ben Ferg then. Ooh, Straight wow. up. Yeah, I mean, right. Ben. Big pick up right there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Ben with the method. Um, I mean, he's definitely one of my faves for sure. Now, back to me. I'm going uh, up and comer. Her name is Milo. Um, I think she's about six years old right now, seven years old. Uh, Milo Jasinski, and she give her a couple years, and she's going to be the next Mia. Mm. I'm going to go opposite direction with my second pick. I'm going to go Josh Dirksen, um, you know, legend of the game, backside nine pyramid gap, uh, 17 years strong of the Dirksen Derby, uh, countless video parts, uh, man of the people, um, legendary carve, legendary human, Rancho Relaxo, Josh Dirksen. <laughs> A great pick. Um, my second pick's going to go to a, a dark horse, a forgotten son of Ben Bend, and that's going to be Spencer Schubert. Yes. I'm going to take. I'm going to pull Spencer Schubert in in round two. That's a great pick. Be great to be around. Good border. Not a lot of rail representation from Bend. Who else do we have left? I feel well, like it's like a super yeah. easy pick too. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a, it's like a softball. Oh, oh. Uh, um, I'm going to go with Austin. Travis Yamada. You know, <laughs> I was thinking. Uh, second pick, Austin. Mm, <laughs> you know, yeah. I can't leave you on the bench. That's a tough one. He would have been more of a fourth rounder for me, probably, but <laughs> second, he went early, you know? But who knows? Tom Brady went 199, you know? So anything's possible. So that's two. We get what? We get three three picks? You got to go one more three. Yeah, we got to yeah, do so one. You pick your third now? More. Definitely Mason Jar for third. Uh, I'm putting together a team of predominantly not uh, specifically pro snowboarders. Uh, for my third pick, I'm going Pete Alport mm. on this one. Curveball. Yeah, mm. I'm gonna I'm gonna take him in my Ben draft. Just an all around good character, staple uh, individual. Yeah, he he could have been a second rounder. It's surprising to see him go in the third. You know, I'm gonna take a pretty uh, kind of a forgotten. You know, maybe swept under the rug name um you know was a head digger at high cascade for a long time sharpened his teeth there now really uh getting into some mindset coaching really helps scotty james a lot of the red bull Mm. athletes Mm. even helps moto guys tyler bierman get his mind right before he sets the you know gets x games bronze medals in the quarter pipe so i'm going james jackson as easy uh pick number three for me it's gonna be a good uh good one for the whole team yeah keep the whole team's mindset right mental mindset yep exactly um, third round, I'm going combo platter, father-son duo, Jason and Hayden McAllister. Mm. And they come as one. Wow, okay. I got Kai hugging. Got to wow. go with Kai. little weapon out there for sure. All right, that's been a good, pretty good uh, bend, uh, bend snake craft. <laughs> I think that's been bend good. Bend versus Salt Lake. It's crazy that bend versus Salt Lake is like such a battle considering that Salt Lake is the um, hub of like the all the East Coast transplants come here, freaking collects everyone, and then we're just little old Bend in Oregon that uh, we're battling it out with you guys. Why are why are the kids from Bend so good? I don't know. That question always comes up, and people always say the same thing: like it's because the mountain is flat, um, and it just like makes you learn how to work your speed, and just that it's close to town, so it's easy to run up there. And I don't know the mountain rules. Um, Weeds legal. 
Yeah. That too. Um, <laughs> that is a factor. <laughs> and just because there's a good crew of homies. And none of them actually spend any of their winter there? Good take. That is a hot, <laughs> nice take. Maybe that's a part of it. But also from the Salt Lake thing, it's if you were to go truly from Salt Lake, the list gets Windows. drastically yeah. small. You got Sam Taxwood. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Griffin Siebert. You got J.P. Walker. Here, yeah. You got Jeremy Jones. Madison. Blackley. Yeah. Andy Wright. Stevie Bell. We got we got some hitters. Nina Copen. Yep. Brandon uh, Ruff. Timmy Osler. I'm sure there's names we're forgetting. All right, another topic coming up is a great Instagram account, if you haven't checked it out. It's called Slope Humor. Basically where we got all the Saudi Arabia Big Air updates from. Uh, somebody on the inside uh, creating hilarious content, uh, good memes, uh, still anonymous, but... Uh, Fun, but not not in a way where you're like it's really hurting anybody too bad. Uh, Stan, you got a take on this? Yeah, I'm I'm genuinely in, I'm enamored by the witch hunt going on, uh, trying to track down who these meme accounts are that are like you know in a lot of ways, slope humor is delivering snowboard news quicker and faster than any single one of us. <laughs> Absolutely, and. This so, is Stan for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, whoever it is is like deep on the inside. Like they are not mm-hmm. only reporting on things as they're happening, but it's like you'd have to be in the rider's tent. Like it's got to be a rider. And I try and uh, figure out the riders that they really like. That's how I like – that's what I use because like all the accounts like Jimmy is not dead, like loves Fridge, which I think is kind of – uh, out of left field really for like you know he's fridge is kind of an exterior like not necessarily like core rail guy so would you uh, say it's a passion of yours to crack that code the it is and it isn't mostly i just like to hang it's i do have a small like it feels a little cowardly to be hiding behind an instagram you know as someone who's weathered the storm of saying a lot of publicly things as you're watching it come out of my face I, I can't help but be like okay that's cute that that's nice to be anonymous but i i'd be lying if i wasn't entertained like a new one drops and i'm commonly like wow like yeah they, they're LOL. going yeah lol but, yeah uh and I, they spell humor like like a british person i've also noticed but are they trying to throw us off that's the thing maybe it's mia Mm. Somebody, whoever it is, they're witty as hell, a. Eh? But one thing I got to say, I'm gonna, I got to take on burners, okay? Because I think that, yeah, this is an anonymous account, and they're posting funny stuff. But what I think is really cowardly is like somebody that has a burner account with like two followers, and they just go on there to say really fucking mean shit that they would never say, and it is a fucking coward move to comment from a burner account the shit that you like just in the comment boards instead of just who you are. If you are just, just say it as your real person instead of being a fucking coward. That's my take. But I think what this is more harmless as far as like, if you're comparing those two burners, that's yeah, the my mystery take. burners, like change that vape, change that vape. It's that was cheeky. just like good it's fun, and fun. Yeah. good fun of who. Yeah. But that, ru- that ruffled some feathers too. I mean, I have a feeling like you and I, and we're sitting here being like, no, slow hum- humor is fun and it's chill. But like, <laughs> I bet some of the people getting talked about in that do not, True. Feel Not as nice. lighthearted about it as as we do. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they got good takes. It's it's an interesting. You got any Venn diagrams going? You got any, you got a board? Yeah, with I've like got strings. like a Charlie, Connect- like always yeah. sunny thing. I <laughs> come home. I don't even have a bed anymore. I'm just like connecting strings. Uh, you got any names? Got I any thought any- it was Lion Farrell for a while. Um, but I've got it on pretty good authority that it's not. Mm. But I, he's he's smart and witty enough to do it. He's internet savvy to make the green screen meme stuff. But I will say whoever it is also has a shit ton of time on their hands and should look into getting a job. <laughs> <laughs> At a media company. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, to me right now it's like um, – uh, Jibbing's not dead is fucking out. Slope, slope humor's in. That's, I know. That's where and I'm that at. just it's goes latest. to show how quick, you know, the <clears throat> mighty can fall. fall. The rise yeah. and fall of an internet meme company. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if I followed either of those, so. No, I don't. Yeah, you're getting, you're getting some insider trading info here. Jibbing is dead will randomly go on a take that I hate so much. Yeah, That's my thing that. about Jibbing is not dead. It's like sometimes I'm with it and sometimes I'm just like, no. Uh-uh. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. I'm like, they're a little out of touch with certain people. You're like, why, why, why are you dogging on this person? Yeah. Like, they don't see, 
the rest of the history of some of the people that they're hating on. Sometimes I just think it's just not that valid what they're saying. I'm Agree. just like, no, no. But it does get people talking, and they're probably just stoked, like at home in their mom's basement or something, just <laughs> loving it. That's so. still burner too. No one knows who Jibin is not dead. Yeah, we don't know. Could be. All you. right, Pashley, we got a Instagram question from you, and this is from Nick Russell. Shout out Nick Russell. Uh, why does Pashley hate splitboarding, but somehow <laughs> loves ultra running? <laughs> I don't hate splitboarding. I actually probably splitboard. Well, actually, not this season, but um, no, Nick. Um, I give Nick a ton of shit about because he always wants to go on these crazy trips, or he did when I was working with him a lot more. He wanted to always like, go on these crazy trips where you needed all these sharp, spiky objects to uh, accomplish your goal. So you were <laughs> either you either had crampons and ice axes, where I'm like. If I have to use either of these two fucking things, I don't want to be snowboarding down this slope. So I gave him, used to give him a ton of crap about that. But um, yeah, and the ultra running thing is just a weird. For you guys that don't know, uh, Pashley runs hundred mile marathons, uh, which is w- <laughs> off the couch. Yeah, no, what no. is this in one to- sitting? A hundred miles? Oh, yeah, I don't think it's sitting. <laughs> it's like <you're> sitting. <laughs> sitting, running, <laughs> one go. Yeah, weird, weird thing. Yeah, for sure. But what happened to you as a kid? <laughs> That's the first what are you thing. running from? Yeah, everybody asks. <laughs> like, oh my god, they find out about this and know me as like snowboard guy. They're like, what is going on in your life? What's happening? You're There's- running from the boogie board or what's yeah. going on? It's a boogie board trauma. Yeah. <laughs> boogie board How trauma. many hours does that take to run 100 miles? It kind of depends on the race. So it's taken anywhere for, for me, and I'm kind of like middle of the pack person. Anywhere from like 24 hours to 43 was the last one I did. No sleep. No sleep. Wow. Yeah, you kind of just go straight through. What? Yeah, 43 crazy. hours of running. Like, hey guys, I'm gonna go for a run. I'll be back in 43 hours. How long are you dead to the well, world? You're not running I'll be back all that in two too, days. Like. I'll be back in two days. It's Friday. I'll see you on Monday. <laughs> it's all like trail <laughs> stuff. So it's like, you're not really running all of it. Like you're. You know, you're hiking the ups, and you're kind of trying to run the flats and downs. But can some you se- obviously, can you sell me on it? Because I just don't get no. the appeal. Uh, I did. So the, I got into it. My brother was going through some stuff. He um, he had a drinking issue, and he, you know, long and short, he woke up. And my mom uh, was a nurse, and she used to work and run this an aid station at the Leadville 100, which is a big famous race, um, and. So as kids, we were knew about it. My brother, long and short, woke up in the hospital, had to have a stomach pump the whole nine. He's like, I'm done drinking. I'm moving to Leadville, and I'm going to run the Leadville 100. And we're like, yeah, fucking right. And so that's how it starts. And then you have to have pacers because you get lost in the dark and stuff at night, or you don't have to, but technically you do. Bring someone. And uh, so I was like, okay, oh, well, if you're going to do this, I'll support you, and I'll pace you. And so that's how it started. I started, like, pacing different legs of this stuff, and then it got to a point where he was like, you should just try it. And so then I got into it and that was, yeah. And some of it, like there's this race called the hard rock, which is down in Southern Colorado. And it's kind of this, like one of the grand poobahs of it all. And it's 33,000 vert too. So it's like a lot of, um, elevation gain and loss. And it's just kind of a crazy, it's crazy that you can like kind of see that much terrain. And a lot of these now, like I'm going to, because it's places I've spent time in the winter also. So I'm like interested to see like, where the trails and everything link up and whatnot. So that's yeah, kind of a crazy, stupid thing, but it's pretty cool though. Yeah, I do it. What do you think? The more like fall off of listeners from you talking about yeah. Yeah, or, know, or know, Curtis know. talking Is about fishing, still you know, listening. <laughs> yeah, uh, totally. <laughs> sorry. I want to apologize to anybody still listening. I mean, you could go down the whole rabbit hole that we did like this, uh, crazy, uh, we did a hundred hour one five day thing, Austin and I, Oh, and, you guys both did. and Marissa, what? Austin, I didn't know you were a closet closet <laughs> runner. <laughs> adventure it wasn't just race. Running. It was an adventure race. More like a, a adventure race. glamatized scavenger hunt. Yeah. So yeah, what's going on here? Sorry to the listeners, but I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> um, an adventure race. I mean, he was saying that it's like this was actually harder than the marathon things that he does because there is no course. An adventure race, it's like A to B and you have five days to complete it. Um, and it's at a variety of activities. So maybe you're running, jogging, walking, mountain biking, pack rafting, um, rappelling, climbing, um, whatever you need to do to get from A to B. And there's all these like little checkpoints along the way. And yeah, five days later, we finished. 100 hours, six hours of sleeping. Wow. It's like the crunchy Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. Jesus. It's presented by... 
Yeah, granola yeah. and fucking Tevas, basically. Three random snow fools and Austin's brother. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, a lot of yeah people do it because you, like, totally lose your mind. You're, like, hallucinating out there, and, um, yeah, you, you find God out there. Mm. Um, Would you do it again? Found no. something. Yeah, no, we're out. <laughs> no, okay. All right, one and done. All right, again, sorry to the listeners. <laughs> uh, all right, I uh, got a good question. This one comes up. People bring this one up to me a lot. Uh, we've covered it a while ago, so let's just sink our teeth back into this one. This is from Nick Backus14. Uh, putting names in video parts. Love the dust box, but help us out. Uh, a lot of, a, lot of uh, a, a trend to people that have watched the 43 million videos that come out every year. Uh, commonly we're seeing a lot of videos don't have name titles for who the writers are. We're seeing a lot of more montage based stuff and you have no idea who the fuck's on the screen. Um, who's got takes on this? Melissa, you got any takes on this? I think people need to do names. Like it's, there's so many videos coming out right now. Like if there was like a couple really prolific videos, like maybe you should know exactly who the writers are, but there's so many coming out. It's nice to like give the people working so hard, like their moment on the screen, I think. Agreed. Like, yeah. Kind of, I get the art argument, but it's also the people like putting their bodies on the line for this. So I think title. I don't think titles disrupt anything. I think they need to go in. There's a little bit of a cool one though with the new Burton movie with Zoe and Raibu, who kind of shared a part, and they're both like kind of wearing a similar thing. And you're like, <laughs> who's who? I don't know. And it was kind of there's something beautiful with that. Might be some print issues there too, eh, my man? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> Was there a mispublished photo? I did. Yeah. News to me. There might be some <laughs> sort of Zoe Raibu mix up with a caption in one of the magazines that we, <laughs> some one? magazine which, company made. Which one specifically, though? We're talking the front 10, that wasn't her? No, we're talking, uh, we, did a, we did an interview with Zoe, and uh, in, you know, 10 pages, one of the photos is. Actually, Raibu. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I don't know. How, I'll take the I'll take the blame on that. I don't know exactly. You gotta dive on the grenade for that. I'll dive on the grenade for that. Yeah. I mean, I should have I should have probably caught that one. Um, isn't that? Isn't that? Wait, like, let's just be clear. Isn't that Bob Plum's job? I, I mean, I just want to I just want to know who's accountable. Fingers. Yeah, if we're gonna point, he fingers. is the photo editor. Yes. So yeah, yeah there he, it is. You know, he is. But um, yeah, that's a tough one. <laughs> I mean, that was Bob Plum's fault. <laughs> my, my, uh, my thought about the name and the video part thing is, is if you are, if you feel like not putting people's names in a video is essential to the aesthetic, then what I don't want to hear is a complaint that you are not getting enough, like, like money or recognition in snowboarding. Because, like, if you want, you can't have it both ways. You can't just be like, well, I deserve all this sponsorship and all this stuff, but you actually can't really tell who I am in the video. Like, so if you're committed to being like, this is how I want it and that's the way it is, and I'll accept that maybe people just don't know who I am, ipso facto, maybe I won't get better deals. Sure, do what you want, you know, do what makes you happy. But it's just like, as soon as like I start to feel like people are like feeling like they're not getting enough, but then they'll also feel like they don't have to put their name in the video, I'm like, how do you expect us to know? Because it's like, I think a lot of it, you know, snowboarding is constantly in the tailwind of skateboarding and trying to, to be similar to that. And I think in skating, it's maybe more common to not have names. The difference being, it's a person in a t-shirt face uncovered and you can see the person very much better. Snowboarding is a lot of very far off angles. A lot of, especially if you're in a team movie or a lot of your riders are in a movie or on the same project, which most of the videos now, like, you know, are grouped together by brand, meaning a lot of people are actually wearing the same outerwear. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, I get it, it is clunky. Like Haldor and Aki for a while were just putting like letters at the bottom, like an E if it was Aki. And I don't know if that's like the answer, but I mean, I think putting a name in is only gonna help the rider. And that's like the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, if you want a name on everything, then do you have to do it for Instagram videos too and just like outline each shot, who was who and everything? I don't know. Just I think that happens if you're, I think the trend is you try and tag in order of the clips in, mm. the, in the post, you know? like True media guy. No okay. okay, okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> 
No, well, I, I do think it's also like, who are you making the video for, right? When you make a video, I think a lot of the the videos with no titles is like, my homie that's an editor is going to love this. Like, it's kind of core. It's kind of like, yeah, I'm making you know, a video. You know. um, yeah, if you know, you know. Exactly. You're in the know. Oh, I know who that guy is. You don't kind of thing. Or like, this is my homie's video. And, and then like, fuck everybody else. And if that's your vibe, do it. Yeah, like, but I do like what you said too. It's like don't don't expect, you know. I, I want to know when somebody does a banger, and I I'm, I'm like calling somebody to try to figure out who it is because we want to talk about it on the show. It's like wildly inconvenient, you know. Like <laughs> I would like to just be able to watch the clip and know who's who the writer is, you know. Yeah, I mean we. It, the people who are paying like super close attention can use the context clues of their stance or their spot or, or like if you, you know. But you're not always seeing like the base of their board. You're not always seeing like everything. And and the fact that we, even us, that's literally our job to know these people, and we still struggle with it, is like I don't know. That seems like maybe a problem. <laughs> yeah. What do you think about snowboard video apocalypse? Like that that two month window when like <laughs> ninety videos come out, Stan. I mean, it, it sucks for it, – it's all based really off the sales cycle, right? That's, like, why that happens. Um, it's why the magazines come out that this time of year. It's the same thing. It's Everything is built around, I guess, funny going full circle back to Canute's question about what's most important, but it's the brands. Like, we're all catering to what the brands need to happen. So all these videos come out because the brands need that promotional push to sell product. Um, I think that if anyone is able to crack the code on that, they could probably have wild success if they're able to figure out a way to, but people have tried it. Like, I mean, Brandon Davis was putting videos out in real time with over yonder. Man boys are doing it now. Man boys are doing it. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's tough. There's really inevitably stuff's going to fall through the cracks. And I think the people who suffer the most from that are the core like the really core less supported people who don't have the ability to you know have a brand constantly pumping instagrams into the feed to remind you that this video is happening and that you need to go watch it so it's like yeah i don't know it's it's really hard to uh to digest all of that content there's also another concept too that happens where you're i i don't know you know there's so many videos coming out and that you know i talked with austin about this in his fire truck with uh, no heat and no speed belts, and we were basically yelling because it's so loud in the cab driving back from Wyoming. Um, and uh, But it's it's kind of, you can get in the cycle of, you know, you see the you see the Instagram best of moments from the video. You gotta get the cliff notes on Instagram. Yeah. And you're like, do I need to watch the video? I got the, I kind of got the cliff notes. I got the, the cheat sheet, so to yeah. speak. And it kind of, that can take away from the video in some ways too. Yeah, that's a really tough one. I mean, Slush is guilty of that. We're all guilty of it, really. A video comes out because then it turns into a competition, really. Like, oh, you know, for a while it was, like, very faux pas to post an ender on Instagram. And then there was, like, a question, though, of, like, well, if we don't, like, there is a, you know, there's a distinct chance, like, no one's going to see this. So, like, pick your poison. What do you want? Do you want to water down your overall product? Which I do think, like, the video hopefully will always exist even just for like the idea would be that the core continues to drive what the masses ingest so even if big video projects are more core facing it still allows like a trickle effect of what's important but yeah the social media thing is tough but it's definitely like not going anywhere i mean that's like my favorite you know thing it's like it's you'll see like i think it is going somewhere oh yeah where's it going instagram Austin? Yeah, we're all going to do a collective, like, uh, class walkout, and we're all going to collectively just, like, this shit is crazy. Let's all leave together. I mean, it is possible. And then the video is going to come back because then you're just like, yeah, I want some snowboard content. I want to see something. I'm going to go seek out the videos that I want to see rather than just constantly fed all the little tidbits here and there, and then you're just oversaturated. Yeah. But we all have to do it together. So uh, it was my New Year's resolution was to quit Instagram. and How's it going? Yeah, it lasted about six minutes. <laughs> 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 What if there's another take on it? Like, what if you only, like, posted photos from, like, just screw the algorithm, only posted photos so people are like, oh, I want to see what happened instead. There's, like, one in particular that sticks out of my head. It's, like, a photo that ran in Slush a few years ago of Arthur Longo doing this, like, massive gap somewhere, and I'm like, I need to see that yeah. in a video. I like that take. 
I like maybe Austin with the video that's on a film reel that you have to go to in person. Like, I think you're just too, you're, you're like 20 years ahead of your time. Mm. We're going to look, we're going to look back Jake, at 20 he's years a visionary. and yeah. we're going to be like, those guys had it figured out, you know? So that I was a, special yeah. to see in person too. I got to see it and it was really, really cool. There's also an irony. I think that like the discussion about whether or not social media is ruining our lives is largely happening on social media you know like <laughs> everyone's just like is is social media killing the video part like comment on our instagram yeah. <laughs> and tell us what you think it's like <laughs> That's a good point. it's true so we uh, all need to get up and just walk away together i mean honestly though like i have been seeing some stuff about the government kind of like cracking down on Facebook. And I, I think it's possible that there would be some, like, I think there's legitimate science that social media is ruining kids' lives. Like, uh, agree. So yeah, I, I think, think it's possible crazy, they, yeah. there could be some sort of, I don't know, inter, intervention. I got a take with social media. I think that social media is fucking great when used in proper doses. Like, when I'm on a good streak, which is very rare, you know, you delete it off your phone for three days, you hop on it, you're seeing funny memes, you're like, you know, like, when we were, we're making fun of uh, Curtis, roasting Curtis on Instagram about the Polaris, you're like, Worth social, social so media good. is great, like, it's, yeah. it's very fun yeah. place to be, like, it's, it's really good for that, but then the problem is, like, I saw this meme, is like, we used to surf the internet, like, back in the day when the internet first came out, now we just soak in it, and I, and I think that that's the issue, is like, that it's so addictive that you can't, you can't, uh, it's, it's very challenging to regulate your usage of social yeah. media, at least for me. A yeah, big soaking issue around here. Yeah, a lot of soaking, <laughs> especially in Salt Lake. <laughs> yeah, the land yes. of the soak. <laughs> nice one, Pat. Wow. Yeah, hit him with that. <laughs> Any other takes on social media before we move on? I love it. <laughs> I mean, fuck it. I think it's so funny. Like, even just the banter that goes back and forth, you're just like, and on the snowboard content and stuff like that, like, yeah, snowboard video apocalypse and whatnot. I mean, I ate it up. I mean, it's, it is crazy how many are coming out, but I try to watch everything. I'm just like, you know what? I'm going to check everything out. Like, obviously most people know I'm not a big rail guy, but I definitely watched all those like parts and, you know, you definitely start finding other people. Like, I don't think I would have ever known who Seb Picard is. But, I mean, he guy was a weapon. I was like, dude, this guy, I like this guy's style. Like, he is, and I had no clue who he was. A little Junior Bacon Lewis, if you will. Yeah, maybe I am, yeah. Yeah, so would you say you're talent scouting when you're out there? Like, a lot like a football, like, oh, uh, yeah. NFL scout? That's a good question. God, I don't know. I guess maybe subconsciously, probably, okay, yeah. Okay, here's a question. When you sign somebody to a team, you know, you've been team manager. Let's let's go through Dragon, uh, Solomon. Went, I went uh, Solomon, like, Quick Rozzy. Um, Oof. Dragon, Oof. Uh, Smart Wool, North Face. So, okay, you, you've signed a lot of riders over the years. Wh- what, what's the blend? What's the spice? What are you looking for when you're signing somebody? For me, it's kind of all around. Like, I'm not, I'm not super concerned about, like, contest, like, winning. I never was. I'm also kind of maybe a bad example of this because I, I definitely get st- stuck in my ruts for sure. And, like, a couple good examples of that was at Solomon. I was, you know, like, so many of those dogs were, like, pow people. They were all super good in the pow, and they had a great team at the time, and they were just, like, continuing on. But, honestly, I think probably the best thing that happened to Solomon at the time was me leaving. And then, and Hava Fernandez coming in and taking over, because he just, like, rejuvenated that brand with yourself. And, I mean, he can't really take credit for Lou because, like, Lou was already kind of coming on board from Krebs and stuff prior to that, but he can have that if he wants. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but Jed Anderson. But Jed, Cody, yeah, for sure. And, Desiree, and I would have, ne- and, you know, like, I've had that conversation with Hoff. Like, I was like, I never would have done that. You know, like, that was just not my, where I was or where I was going with brands and stuff. And they needed that. And I think it was the best thing for that brand, you know, for with Hoff. And the same thing, honestly, with, like, with Dragon, too, even, like, they, we were so heavy in the POW crew, right? It was like Blair and Vole, and they all become like a lot of my friends too, right? And Gigi and everybody like that. And then Kyle Martin came on board after that. Sure. And that's when like Gesme and Spencer and, you know, Blake, Blake was already on. He was one of my guys, but like, but yeah, I'm going to, uh. I'm, I'm taking Blake. <laughs> <laughs> But, but that crew too, Cole and everybody like that, like that, it was just people that I would never would have done, you know, or, and Dylan and everything like that, like they wouldn't have been my crew. And so 
I thought that was a great thing too. And so I think it's just like the changing of the guard. But for me, it was really for me, it's like building a program that everybody kind of gets along and we can kind of do stuff as like a team. And so that's where I try to go with the brands. I'm like, okay, how can we build like a team camaraderie where we're all working towards the same kind of goal? And at the end of the day, you know, we're all fucking around. We're sliding around. Like we're not curing cancer, right? Like we're all like sliding around on pieces of wood basically. And so whether you're skiing or snowboarding, I could care less. And so as long as we can go do it together and create a team atmosphere, like that's really what I'm after for. Fucking nice, wow. nice wise words wow. dropped from Pash. I love uh, the Bud Keen <laughs> quote when he's talking about like I was like, what are you looking for when you're looking at coach a rider? He's like, I don't know what I'm looking for, but I'll know it when I see it. <laughs> <laughs> totally. It's like kind of yeah. that, right? It doesn't always make yeah. sense too, but I love those are some wide wor- wise words about the team. I love that. Now, Melissa, I saw you out filming earlier this winter. Uh, where's your footage going? What are you working on? Um, I'm working on a little project. I was going to release it this winter, but I'm maybe rethinking it just because of how it's kind of structuring out. But I took a lot of inspiration from a surf series called Weird Waves. Like Dylan Graves did this really fun thing where he had like a few dioramas and like kind of a mix between like talking of how it's how it all works, the process of it, and then having clips in there as well. So I, I love the whole aspect of storytelling so I really wanted to, like, incorporate that in something I was doing. Um, but, yeah, the way it's kind of panning out, the first episode kind of talks about, like, going up to Bald Face and doing the whole risk maturity thing and getting knowledge with, like, first aid and avalanche safety so people kind of can more grasp being like, okay, people aren't just going out and doing this. They're putting a lot of work and thought into before they, like, venture out and ride this line or ride wherever they're going. But I think, yeah, I was going to do it this year, but I think I'm going to, it makes more sense to put it at the beginning of next year. Kind it's going to be multiple episodes? Yeah, I kind of want to do it episode style. Just every episode is going to have kind of like a learning component, like of just my own personal journey, not like how you should do it, but this is just how I've done it and how I've gone about it. And you're riding K2 boards. What board are you riding these days? Um, I've been loving the Passport. It's a really great board. It's like non-gender board, like... I'd ride the same board as like Tim Eddy, and he's like six feet tall. So I, that one's been a huge favorite of mine. Is it an all mountain situation? Um, all mountain powder board. Yeah, I like that one a lot. Nice, Stan. What are you on these days? I'm on the uh, Craig Kelly re-release mm. right now. What size? So I have two. I got a 58, and I got a 68. Ooh, 60. 68. Yeah. Did the board come with the book? That's a lot. Of it handle. did. I wish it did. Um, I actually bought the 68 at. Zombie board shop at Heavy Metal. Mm. I walked in there and I saw it, and I had wanted the '68, and I just dropped in. Is that what you're jibbing on at Buck Hill? I was on the '58. Mm. That'd be a bit of a flex. Mm-hmm. Yeah, something I think is uh, bigger boards, or we're, we're we're headed towards a era of bigger boards. Mm-hmm. We're trending that way. We're trending that way. Why you know, you the fact that, that like I was out with uh, Bodie, not the skier, but uh, Bodie and Mikey. The other day, there's maybe, like, what, a two-foot difference between the two of those? And they ride, like, 15-centimeter difference. Um, Bodie's on a 64, and Mikey's on a 151. And I'm just like, I feel like Bodie should be on a freaking 189. Mm-hmm. Is the same proportion to Mikey's 151. Yeah, what do you think about, uh, like, volume displacement with the wider boards instead of going longer? Yeah, that's also an argument, just like how, and just contact length, like one uh, 52 and a 62, the 52 can actually ride bigger than the 62, um, but people just get too stuck in their ways, like people get stuck like, oh, I ride a 56, and like, whoa, a 58, that's freaking massive, and you're like, yeah, that big, my man, <laughs> that big, um, so I think people just get a little stuck on their numbers, and are like afraid to venture out of like, that first demo board that they ever had that the shop set them up on. They gave them like a 15 minus 15 stance and it was a 156. And they're like, that's my board for the rest of my life. And that's my stance. So yeah, don't be afraid to try the, uh, 65 or the 45. Uh, what Pash, what, uh, what stick are you on? I've been riding two right now, like kind of swapping in and out, um, a season. Uh, am I on the arrow or Nexus? You're on the arrow. One fifty seven. Yep, it's uh, basically a six stick knockoff. <laughs> um, but <laughs> <laughs> I gotta know my audience if I want to get them on one, you know. Yep. So I've been riding that kind of all mountain, and then um, I really like uh, this company High Tide out of Pemberton, BC. It's like Gabe Lingwall and Kasha, and they make this. Uh, it's a fifty four, which is a draft dodger, and I kind of ride that in um, if I'm like 
carrying around a camera pack and stuff like that, it's a little shorter and easier to get around in deep snow. Short fat. Short fat, yeah. Uh, well, might as well get Silk D in on this. Silk D, what plank are you ripping? Right now, Capita Mercury 156 wide. Ooh. Gets the job done. Yeah. Not too many days on it, but I think it's working. Yeah, follow cams are looking good. I don't know if you've seen that. Buttery yeah. smooth. Yeah, check it out. <laughs> also, people seem to be too afraid of the uh, wide boards. Yeah. Yeah, well, I need one. What size hoof you got over there? In, in the snowboard boots, an 11 or 11 and a half. Big dog. Yeah. yeah. Wait, I want to talk more about this wide thing because I actually – for a second was riding wide boards and then I realized that I hate it. I think I hate it. And that I think wide boards is actually, I don't like it. You, it. You th- you're you down? I'm on not, I don't like wide boards either. Yeah. I've tried. You kind of get lazy for sure. Like I feel like I was riding all these like short fat boards for a long time, just like riding pow and just, and then when I went back to trying to ride like a regular board, I was like, oh wow, like there's a, and, or riding like the short fat on like groomers and stuff. I was like, oh, it's, it's way slower edge to edge for sure. Yeah, so but I don't think it's I don't board. think it's a wide board like what Silk D's on. It's like it's not wide proportionally to his foot. It's like whatever's yeah. proportional to your foot. And so while yeah. he has a size seven and a half foot, excuse me, yeah, something <laughs> like that. Uh, but just like finding the right proportional, like so many people, a lot of the pro snowboarders, Jake Blava, like there's a lot of pro snowboarders with size eight feet, and all all these other people want to emulate their riding style, and so they want to ride their board while they have a size eleven foot. It's just like yeah. Find the width that is proportional to your foot. I think for a ten and a half, two hundred and sixty mil waist width is like the perfect amount of width where you're not getting toe and heel drag. Toe and heel drag unanimously sucks. Yeah. Agreed yeah. on that. You know what trips me out? I was watching that Travis Rice line where he goes he does cab three or no back rodeo, cab three, cab nine, I think it's in sequencer. And if you look, he's riding switch, he's got like no nose. He's on this like it looks like a small board. And orca. He's, the orca, and he's like floating really well, switch on a directional board. I, that blew my mind. You're like that. I always really thought directional, you'd, you'd really suffer switch, but you can ride switch on a directional board if you're Travis Rice, I guess. What size foot you got over there, Stan? I'm a ten and a half as well. And that, I yeah, I had convinced myself I needed wide for like three years. I was riding a wide board. In that Craig board, that 58 is actually really fun. I've ridden that a handful yeah. of times too as like an all mountain. But is that the board you were riding in ball face too? Yeah. The 58? Yeah. Yeah. And there's also a wide variety of what one brand will call a wide board and what another brand mm. isn't a wide board. Like yeah. there's no real right. definition there's of mid-wide. what's wide. Um, so it's a lot of gray area, but I think it's just like finding the proportional to your foot, whether it's wide or not, just find the one that's proportional. Also, the, there's factors that play into the width from going into edge to edge, like the side cut plays a factor in getting your board edge to edge, even if it's wide. Correct? I've had Dirksen explain that to me, where he's like, you can ride a wide board and it still transfers edge to edge well. Yeah, tight side cut. I mean, that's like all the short fats. It's like short fat, super tight side cut, and it helps you wiggle back and forth. And also like a tight side cut, well, it might be narrow in the middle if it's a real, if it's a six mil side cut, it's going to freaking ramp out quite a bit and pretty quick, and so then it's actually pretty wide for a bigger foot by the time it gets to your feet versus like a pipe board that has a 12 mil, a 12 meter side cut. Mm-hmm. What size, Melissa, do you go, what size board do you ride normally? Um, I've been on the 149, but I think I want to size up. I feel like I've been maxing it out a little. Is that where you're riding in Pow? 49? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. The, we get messages so much. I get some so many messages. What board should I get? What should I do this, that? And, and it's like unanimously my answer is always going to say go demo a board because it doesn't matter what brand it is over the years. I've gotten boards where I'm like this is going to be my board. I, I'm looking at the specs. I'm looking at it, and it's for it says it's for me with all the description of it, and you fucking put your bindings on the thing, and you're like – this ain't it, you know? Yeah. And But then you demo a board, and the one that you were like, ah, I'm not so sure about that one, you're like, this is it, you know? So I, I can't say enough for people to demo boards. Austin? And that's why you're now on Never Summer? Yes. No, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Capita Pathfinder 164 in the POW. <laughs> or uh, not Pathfinder, Navigator, rather. Oh, Navigator. Yeah. That yeah. can be edited. Yeah. Well, can edit keep that. it in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll keep it in. All right, we're going to cut to a quick interview with the boys at uh, Ten Barrel up at the um, and Pub Beer up at the Ten Barrel Lodge, and they're having a good time up in Idaho, and we got to catch up with them while they are in uh, Powder Prison, so to speak. Here we go. All right, we're here with the crew from the Ten Barrel Beer Lodge. 
How's it going out there? Where are you guys at? Get, paint a picture of the scene that you guys are in right now for the listeners. We're in the lodge. We're downstairs. We got an indoor pool over there, mm-hmm. pool table, bar. This place is crazy. Um, it's been snowing nonstop. We just came off of like a four day sunny window. And now it snowed yesterday and the day before. And so we're just kind of shells of humans right now. <clears throat> are you guys landing any tricks or just de- deleting uh, ice cold pub beers? What's happening over there? I would say both. Yeah, I would say definitely both. say both. Yeah, we just a combination of both. Pretty good, productive couple of days before the storm hit. No, we, we mean biz. We're, you know, getting up early and dark to dark days. And you yep. guys, you guys are making a video, right? Is that correct? Are we? I don't know what's going on. I don't either. <laughs> they kind of just got us the house, and we're just kind of hanging. It's pretty rad. Like it's been snowing. Calls awesome. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one thing we forgot to do. Also, we should have probably introduce who's in the studio so the listeners know who's here. You want me to go first? Yeah. yeah go yeah, ahead. Curtis, go first. Curtis Dick from Bend, Oregon. You remember his Bob Hole? Top ten. <laughs> uh, Eric Jackson. Lucas Walks, sorry. Yeah. yeah. I'm Carson Storch from Bend, Oregon. And I'm Ben Ferguson from Bend, Oregon. Love that. Now yeah, you- a lot of big, big people here. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Kind of. Uh-huh. Yeah, that, yeah, that's okay. a little bit unfortunate. That's a little bit unfortunate. Now, what I'm wondering is you guys got snowmobiles going. <laughs> uh, not, not, uh, there's some proficient snowmobilers and probably some non-proficient snowmobilers. Who's been, I'm not concerned with who's been doing well on the snowmobile. Who's been just grenading out there? Actually, everybody in this group has been crushing it. I was doubling no. Connor. Oh, yeah, Connor. Yeah, definitely Connor. Yeah, yeah Connor's going to get stuck the most Absolutely. for sure. Our filmer. Should we get Connor? Legend of a human. Um, I was doubling Lucas, what, two days ago? We clipped a stump under the snow, and I just went full eject over the bars. He caught bars to thigh. Full dead leg, you know. It felt great. Ah. <laughs> yeah. It's great. Love I actually that. don't think anybody, anybody's got stuck. Not really. Kind of like, hero style out there. It is yeah. pretty hero style. Yeah. It's kind of like perfect depth for getting around on the sled, and you don't really feel the bottom snowboarding. It's been it's been pretty awesome. Yeah. Now, how's Storch doing out there? Homie's not. <laughs> homie's a hard pack dirt dirt guy. Kind of dirt guy. <laughs> He's I, been handling. I don't ride sleds that much, but I've ridden a bunch with him over the years, and uh, yeah, I kept up and just kind of watched him do their thing, and I got a nice uh, Pouser flying and stuck on that and. Yeah, that yeah. Was just, yeah, I can't really strap a snowboard on. My ankle's a little dinged up, but it's fun to go watch the boys and see their program. I saw that yeah, bail that bail that you took the other day, Carson. That looked insane. What happened there? Um, I followed a British person off a really big jump. And he just, <laughs> <laughs> something you don't do as an American, you know? <laughs> it's a classic scenario. Don't follow a British guy. <laughs> Lesson learned. just any jump. The biggest jump ever built for mountain bikes. And yeah, so... Stoked I'm alive, really. He's honestly fine. He's been like romping around on the sled. Yeah. If I would have bailed like that, I think I'd be chilling for a yeah, yeah. yeah. So a little yeah. bit longer anyway. <laughs> These two guys sent him down like his first power surf run ever, and it was like straight. It was steep, blind rollover entry. I was straight up pretty scared. I've never been on one, but those things work really good. I didn't know why. I was like, this is just going to be embarrassing, but you crushed it. And you just kind of dig the tail in, and I got a couple yeah, turns, and I was hoping for Tommy's. Well, I'm not going to lie. Let's not forget the tomahawk in the sled track. Yeah, 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 you hit track. I just, yeah, I tomahawked a little bit, but yeah, it was mellow. It was fun. Classic. How's the how's the hot tub situation there? It's good, actually. Yeah, we got two. It's really good. Double hot good. tub. Double. I've been hitting a, a morning tub <laughs> and then a evening tub. So I'm like two tub a day kind of guy. And yeah, it's been good. Two Beard hair days. everywhere in that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Filters working overtime. I actually <laughs> the first time I was in there, I was like, oh, dude, there's gonna be so much hair in here. And so I was like trying to pick them out. <laughs> it's not that bad. I know it's not that bad. RIP to the filter. That yeah, that thing's in rough shape. That thing's seen better days. Yeah, that beard's looking good, E Jack. What's going on? How long have you been growing that sucker? You know, man, I'm a once I'm a one shave a year kind of guy. So I don't know, I shaved in like May or June last year, you just go, yeah, straight razor shave and let her grow, and then I'll shave again after the season. Yeah, that's insane. It's a bad day to be a hot tub filter. That's definitely certain. 
<laughs> really, just really everywhere. There's like if you really started looking around, there's probably beer everywhere. But I have been uh, I stick home it out a lot, so you try to get rid of the stragglers, you know. Amazing. So, uh, what's been going on in the snowboard scene out there? You guys iPhoning, big camera, any actual clips, anything notable, or just recreational good times? <laughs> we got we got Connor on the big camera. He's flying drone. Yeah, We've been riding a lot of like natural stuff, mm-hmm. mainly like top to bottom lines. Shovels then, have not come out mm-hmm. for snowmobiles or kickers, which has been nice. Yeah. Lucas has a dad cam rolling. I'm seeing him snagging some clips. We got dad cams, drones. I think there's a red camera floating around. I guess we did hit a couple pat downs, snowshoes, some nice. shoe pack outs, iPhones. Yeah. And you guys sled right out the back door. Or you got to load up. Uh, we got to load up and drive like what ten minutes. Yeah, it's pretty easy. Yeah, super easy. That ain't bad. Who's MVP so far? Who would you guys say? Probably for boarding. Well, let's say partying and board. Let's do two. We got uh, partying MVP, snowboarding MVP, and maybe an overall uh, combination platter. I think Carson might take the party MVP right here. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and, or maybe some of the general employees. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> out of us. Out of, oh, yeah, out of actually, us. Actually, uh, <laughs> Brennan or Corey. Yeah. <laughs> Brennan or Corey. I don't know. Chad, Chad could take it too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> some serious contenders there. Tim Barrel actually just rented a house so they could, you know, come party here. <laughs> I lost a lot of pool games last night, which involved shotgunning beers afterwards. That sucked. Nice. <laughs> just a bunch of bloated shells of humans just love that exactly. just swollen that's how i feel right now <laughs> little slits where my eyes used to be <laughs> <laughs> so so what about snowboarding who's been putting it down anybody doing anything good or just kind of just mulling about i think we've all everybody's got shots we're just kind of cruising you got a couple couple things ben's only been out with us a couple days um ben was in japan Drove through the night, got like three hours of sleep, got up at six in the morning and came out with us. He's like, I feel crazy. (laughs) Jet lag. (laughs) Felt high. (laughs) First day on the sled. New piece. I was babying it. Yeah, forgot to gas up. Didn't gas up. (laughs) I had a couple of gas. New Turby? Yeah, brand new Turbo. Who's on Turbos out there? Raise your hand. Uh, No, I'm not. Connor, Ben and I. Mm. I was on Gabe. Oh, yeah. Ferguson Turbo on the turb. And we I got Gabe that just led. I think I'm the only one without a turbo. I've never had a turbo. You don't have a turbo. We had, we had four four whistle pigs in the group. Uh, I feel <laughs> thoughts and prayers to the thoughts and prayers to the naturally aspirated out there. I feel uh, hopefully they're doing all right. <laughs> <laughs> At least it's a Gen 5. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Beach. Each time I pull my sled and it starts, it's a gift. Mm, oh yeah, let's talk about that. Are you still running the sled that you were attempting to sell? How, how's that being? How's the sale been going for you? Yes, I am. Um, Ashley and uh, your show kind of ruined my sale on that. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> did you pull it down off Facebook Marketplace? Uh, no, I'm still getting messages, and I'm like, I can't trust it. I can't trust it. It's still up there. <laughs> I want to buy it. <laughs> yeah, Carson wants I to really buy it. Like his I, don't, I don't want to sell it to him. I don't care. I don't want to <laughs> blow it up. <laughs> yeah. We still have another year of engine warranty, so I, mm. I hope it pops. Wait, so Carson said he he wants to buy it. To be clear, did you listen to? Did you hear any of the stories? Is, have you heard any? <laughs> <of them? laughs> I don't care. Yeah. It, ha- it has caught on fire, Carson. Just so you know. Yeah, it's <laughs> minor, minor. Actually, I wasn't there. So eighty five hundred now. Yeah, you're really <laughs> you're ruining my sale right now again. <laughs> That's amazing. Anything over a 540 happening out there? Or just you guys just going uh, Craig Kelly be the ball scenario? I don't think so. Yeah, we're keeping it under. I don't even know if a 540 has been. A lot of 360s have gone down. 360? <laughs> Brought one. one went in. Nah, that was, wow. That yeah. was a one. Respect. Yeah. Yeah, what zone? No, I mean, are you yeah. guys in McCall? Really, yeah, we're in McCall. Yeah. Nice. I've never been out there. We're really old. Ooh, sunny days. It is yeah. epic out here. This place is sick. Does it hit? I was like getting like it's workable for sure. Yeah, it snows good, real good. Wasn't it trash kind of up until a few weeks ago? Like it didn't really turn on for a while. Yeah, it was absolutely terrible until like a week ago. And I mean, it's still super low tide. 
but it's kind of cool. Like things are, you know, the normal things that you're looking at are rocky and the, starting to fill in. There's there's some stuff starting to fill in, but like there's other things that normally are like flat and like cool little transitions and stuff. So it's kind of just like, you know, using your eye a little different. Yeah, everything looks a little different. It's kind of opened up some new features for Spear Red. Would you say it's a bit of a Gordon Lightfoot situation out there? <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Come here. Yeah. Come here. I Gordon. think we've all uh, tapped a stump or a rock at mm. some point. Snowmobiling's pretty scary. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. Just you want the skis to. Be, you want the skis in deep. You want a lot of weight on the front end, is what you're telling me. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. A arms. It is a arm season. Yeah. What about snowmobile wrecks? Any anything broken? No a arms. Uh, we didn't have any damage yet. One of my <laughs> buddies that lives here, he told his sled two days ago. Hmm. It's happening. Okay, just was, uh, good to know. <laughs> good, good to know. We got to get you up here. <laughs> I know I was supposed to. I had to fly back east, but uh, yeah, I'm actually linking up to with Austin to go snowmobile around Logan. If you guys uh, want to migrate down south a little bit, or I don't know if it is south, south east. That would be nice. I don't know. I try to stay out of Utah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with a lot of a lot of the bend uh, bendites in there. What's the general consensus about Utah? It seems like there's a little bit of bad blood happening. Ben, what do you think? Uh, no, no bad blood. All jokes. Connor, our filmer's from Utah, so we roast him daily. Yeah. Oh, so Utah's a bit of a punching bag, is what you're saying. <laughs> no. Always has been. Always has been. <laughs> Let me tell you something, Connor, if you can hear this, it's the these these Ben guys, they think they're elite. They think they're better than everybody. They put themselves on a pedestal. <laughs> they're a bunch of fucking elitists, is what I see. That's what I see. <laughs> Wait, it's, you're not far off. <laughs> <laughs> Just to make it clear, I'm not quite a Bendite. I live in the dirty south now, uh, a little south of Bend, so I'm kind of out of that scene personally. So you you don't you, associate. Why? Yeah, dude. Whoa, dude. Dude, I don't like Bend. I like, <laughs> Bend. I like being like 30 minutes south of Bend. It's like the greater Idaho. Awesome. <laughs> Benedict Arnold over right here. Yeah. Greater Idaho territory. <laughs> it is. So what do you guys got on the docket for today for this down day? Uh, we're going to go hot spring after this and then hit the little ski hill in town. Do some night riding. Amazing. And then, so you don't unconfirmed if there's an edit coming out, mainly just a good times boarding situation. The footage is all going somewhere. We're definitely going to make some sort of edit for like all the brew pubs and stuff. And then I'm sure it'll go online. Now, aren't you guys making a video, Kurt, Doug? Like not from this, but this year, you and Eric, or what's the, what's your vid? I don't know. I might be putting all my footage with the, Gabe and Nick and all those guys for like a Corbett thing. What about oh, you're me? What's, well, no, a, <laughs> what's everybody getting footage for this this winter? I'm filming with Burton so far. Just on one trip to Japan, was there for like a month and a half. One trip, <laughs> pretty epic trip. Honestly, got a bunch of really good snow. Super fun. A couple different dudes out there hanging with us. It was awesome. Amazing. Uh, but yeah, I think Burton's making a video with Nigro's being pretty vague. He's just kind of like. Got some money and told us what to do, basically. <laughs> Classic yeah. burn some budge situation. Yeah, let's burn it. I love uh, it. But it's sweet. It's nice. <laughs> it's nice having like someone to tell you what to do and like you know have something to put energy into. So it's been cool. Um, yeah. Then I just got here like a day ago, and day or two ago, still jet lagged. Can't fall asleep. Um, can't wake up. Uh, yeah, it's been sweet though. The snow is good. It's going to turn on here. Mm. We're going to start stacking. Mm-hmm. I'm staying. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to Utah. Mm. <laughs> this is where we live now. Mm. Have, uh, Ben, have mm. you tried drinking 18 pub beers and then trying to go to sleep? Yeah, that didn't work last night. <laughs> <laughs> nice. We were playing lots of pool last night. The pool was fun last night. We were playing. Have you played that game crud up at bald face yet? It's the one where you're like, Tossing the ball back and forth, running around the table. Yep, with the ping like pong a, paddle, or no? No, kind of like that game, but it's on the pool table. Okay, copy. Hitting, I this guy, it. this guy gets real competitive. Dude. He's racking us up. <clears throat> it's intense. not letting anybody go to bed. I no, love- I went to bed. And you guys stayed <laughs> up and played pool. Has uh, uh, E Jack been trying to like hike up in any tree stands and like shoot any animals while you guys are there, or just been keeping it pretty chill? <laughs> He has been hyped on the elk in Idaho. Mm-hmm. What are you even seeing? Deer. Some wildlife? Yeah, I touched a deer the other night. Oh wow! Had him a stump. Came right up to me. 
You touch him in the in the crotch, or where'd you touch? Where'd where you touch him? Is that like ear molesting? No, it was a, we were at sushi and um, he was in the trash. And I'd like, to, it, yeah, it's domesticated dealer here, you know. I just picked up a snowball. He thought I had food. He came right up to me. I was, hey, little buddy. Mm. Uh, I little buck. Then he suplexed it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Boys, we got dinner. It had a bit of a MMA cage match. I like that. Yeah. Any other wildlife Absolutely. sightings? Yeah, we got some wildlife sightings. I actually have an elk tag, like basically, I mean, basically here, just, uh, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes down the road. I got an elk tag for uh, next September. So I actually, on my drive here, I was driving around and going up some roads and kind of scoping access because I've never been here before. So. Mm. That'll be sick. We interviewed a guy, Ejek, uh, a little a couple of weeks ago. They got attacked by a mountain lion, uh, and he fought the thing off with his snowboard. Did you see this shit? Have you heard about that? Oh. Yeah. What? Gnarly. Yeah, that's insane. I feel like Ejek. Where was that? What's that? Logan. It's actually uh, Beaver Mountain, which is right by the Logan Snowmobiling Trailhead. I feel like, Ejek, you would thrive in a scenario like that. I mean, I, yeah, if you're just... The only weapon you got is your board. You might as well start chopping. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, my board is called the Ejac knife. So, it's... <laughs> absolutely, yeah. I, I interviewed this guy. I thought it was gonna be kind of funny. Like, oh, this guy got attacked by a mountain lion. He fought the thing off with the snowboard. Like, turns out he almost lost his life. And it was like actually not a funny interview. It was like rather. It was pretty serious. <laughs> <laughs> He's having like PTSD when you're asking him questions. Totally. totally. <laughs> what? What kind of interest did he have? What kind of what? Injuries did he have? Oh, they the thing jumped on his neck and it tried to get at his neck, but it scratched his whole jacket and everything. So he had some scratches on his neck. But then I said something to him. I was like. I've had a couple of close encounters with cougars, not in wildlife settings, mainly at the bars uh, in affluent areas, and I barely got out alive. And he's like, yeah, man, I, it's crazy. I can't believe it happened to me, man. I just don't even, like, totally over his head. Like, he didn't. <laughs> uh, that is good. Good shit. All right. Hey, great, great catching up with you guys. Uh, appreciate you guys coming on, and I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your journey in McCall. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, bro. Thanks, Chris. One on the road. Hey, appreciate you guys. Oh, yes. Oh, oh, bye, Chris. Right. <laughs> Later, guys. Later. Yeah. All right. Great chat with the gang over at the Ten Barrel Lodge. Um, again, thoughts and prayers out to Curtis on his new Polaris. Um, you know, keep him in your thoughts. Hope he's okay. Uh, but, um, it's brain, what is it? Brain injury awareness, awareness month. Yeah. Um, all of March, all of March is brain injury awareness month. And, um, it's a really important month. I help Kelsey out with save a brain, like handle all the forward facing content or most of it, but we're kind of doing something cool this month. We're doing like our own little prize giveaway for people who are fundraising for us, like first, second, third, all the way down to fifth. Um, if you raise money, you get prizes. I think first place is like a Gosney and then some nicks and watches and then seconds, like a bunch of North face stuff. Never stop exploring. Wow. <laughs> uh, oh. we have a lot of good stuff going on. So if anybody wants like to get involved with a good cause, like, um, we have a bunch of cool future goals, like sending more people to treatment that have had brain injuries. Like we have a lot of big goals with that. So that's kind of where the money is going to is like our new programming with that. Cool. And where can people find all this information? Um, you can go to the Instagram, like Save a Brain, or you can go to saveabraining.com and just start your own fundraiser. Or if you just want to learn more about your brain, like it's a great place to start. Or if you had a buddy that got a concussion, we have resources there too to like kind of go through. Cool. Would you have any? Would you have any tips for uh, someone that's maybe hit their head a lot and has some <laughs> brain issues? Any quick tips? Um, not quick tips, but <laughs> I think. Um, what we've been kind of learning is, like, it's such a good idea for all of us that do this to, like, kind of see where your brain baseline is. Like, you can get baseline testing. Um, that's a really great place to start. I um, did that. It was very bad. Yeah. Mm. The baseline test. Yeah. There's um, there's so many different avenues to go to heal your brain after. Like, we've seen, like, MERT. That's another big one or one big one that we've seen some surfers get into. Um, what's, that? what's that? What's MERT? Um, I don't know how to explain it. They like kind of, 
they can like make your brain healing faster with all these waves that they send to your brain. It's a little pricey and that's why we're trying to get into like helping people to be able to afford this. It's like 10 grand, so it's definitely expensive. Um, other avenues, like there's lots of different brain rehab places you can go to. There's like the Kutcher Clinic in Park City, there's Happy Brain, but they kind of take you through a series of exercises that makes you feel like you're in first grade again, basically. <laughs> there's... Um, Cognitive FX? Yeah, cognitive FX. Like, I I can't speak to a lot of these therapies because I haven't personally done them. I've seen Kelsey go through a few. Um, but one that I've personally gone through is, like, vision therapy. It's um, We did a lot of, like, working on peripheral, um, getting my peripheral vision back and, like, depth perception. But it's a lot of games, honestly. Like, so playing games like Bananagram is actually really good for your brain. But just going somewhere that they kind of integrate sports and neurology is a really, really good place to start. So they're not erring on the side of being too cautious. There's a lot of new science coming out, and it's it's honestly really confusing, even like working on this side of things, figuring out what the right answer is to do. I've been trying the uh, Daily Mini and uh, oh, the what's that? Uh, New York Times crossword. Oh, <laughs> and yeah. And then uh, Wordle, okay. those are my brain games each morning. Those are good. That's my uh, practice. Yeah, those are really good. But yeah, getting somewhere that could help you get further if you're experiencing anything going on after concussions is really, really good. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Have you ever done any, uh, I've been doing hyperbaric oxygen therapy. You That's know, like go really in this good. big tube and just get pumped with oxygen and supposed to increase blood flow to your brain. I've been doing that a bunch. And What about cold water stuff? Is, is that helpful? Just curious. I don't know. Seems like it should be. Unknown, honestly. Throw it against the wall and see what sticks. Yeah. I like, I'm a big, like, I'm, I'm not a data guy. I'm a feel guy. Like you do, do something and you feel good after I'm, I'm going to do that again. I don't need the data. Some people are lazy. Slippery slope, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good point. Well, that, <laughs> this heroin feels incredible. <laughs> well, that's why I can't do a lot of things. That's why I have to just X the booze and the drugs out of my system because those, yeah, but now with a healthy version of that, you know, sauna. Whew, you get out of that and you're like, I'm fucking driving to work like Gandhi, dude. Nothing can change. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like that's why Pashley runs el- ultra marathons. You know? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. He's Same got thing. to feel like a shell of a human after that. <laughs> He's got to deal with Austin. This is a handful. That is a handful. Actually, the most chill human I've probably ever gone on a trip with. It's and that's all the head injuries. Yeah. <laughs> Dude. Just kind of flatline. Hollow. He pulls anywhere you go with this thing. It's an inconvenience. The truck's like 40 feet long. He's got <laughs> two snowmobiles. 23 feet long. He's got two snowmobiles in the back. I'm like, oh, where's the ramp? Oh, no ramp. Okay, so <laughs> how are we going to load and unload these machines? Oh, let me just back up to a snowmobile, snowbank in the lot. Oh, okay, that's great. Back up to the snowbank in the lot. There's three trucks with enclosed trailers that are waiting to get in there and frothing to unload their snowmobiles. Austin's just calm as a cucumber, just unloading these sleds. I'm breathing into a brown paper bag. I'm like, so I'm like, all right, this is a lesson on how to be chill. I'm like, okay. Just try to we're be all like, getting out to come talk and have, have they had some questions about the truck anyways. Yeah, that's a good point. Everywhere you go, what oh motor God. you got in that? Oh, it's a 12 liter. 12 valve, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and then Austin's like, you know, likes to kind of take credit like you built the thing. Yeah, exactly. Himself. And then I get busted and they're like, mm, he knows nothing. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> This micro puff's throwing me off right now. This North Bay, he's not wearing a he's not wearing a flannel and yeah. baggy fleece pants with yeah. a shotgun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's actually who rebuilt this motor. I think. <laughs> good stuff. All right, I think it's been a good show, guys. Cool. I've fucking been talking for goddamn three hours or something. It's been a minute. What do we do to sign off? Yeah. What do you guys want to do? Silk, you got any ideas? You guys like Silk's influencer light? Look at the ring light he's got. Yeah, I hope it looks good. Yeah, that is nice. Yeah. Good to see. Is that a new addition? Yes. Yeah. First time I'm using it. Yeah, oh. Jules was a little concerned that there was no lighting on the... She was standing in for Silk. So we had to get... We didn't want to get real lights. We wanted to get a, an influencer light. So it has the this phone... better. The phone mount in the middle if you want to do say, like... what is the yeah. middle? Yeah, phone mount. I didn't mount. Even notice that. Yep. Yeah. A lot of people... A good angle. Yeah, it's, it's good. Okay, uh, this thing's really uh, like a plane that's crashed into the Andes, so I think it's a good time to sign off. Uh, Melissa, Stan, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thank you. Austin, Pash. Mm-hmm. Good to um, see you. Godspeed on that uh, piece of shit Polaris you got. We'll Pash. see. We'll see, my man. Everyone's coming. Everyone's coming. Silk, uh, congrats on getting engaged. Uh, the Thank kit you. is pure flame, quite Thank literally. You. Mm. 
Very and nice. Everybody that's still listening, uh, A, I'm sorry, and B, thank you. We got another <laughs> episode coming at you next Wednesday. <laughs>